sorry, that is no longer allowed. And uh, when called upon, you should just jump right into whatever question you have and try to make sure you're not uh, giving lectures or, or um, your own personal opinion, especially during the hearing process. And uh, the, um, the, the meetings will go by much faster if we uh, try to adhere to that. Okay, so we're going to hear first HB 1026. And uh, Representative Piamonte, you're going to introduce the bill? Thank you, Mr. Chief. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for the reminder. Please stand and join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Well, continue, Mr. Uh, Representative Piemonte, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the bill I'm go uh, talking about today, I'm introducing House Bill 1026. I'm the main sponsor on that. It's relative to the budget information provided to a budget committee. Um, and I'm going to read you the analysis. Uh, it's very easy, very simple bill. The bill provides that a municipal budget committee may require that the governing body provide actions in full line item detail in active spreadsheet form. Um, some of you uh, know uh, from past with me on this bill, I had House, 14, House Bill 1460, and um, that uh, went down in flames in the Senate because they tabled it. We did uh, come to an agreement. Uh, uh, the chair at the time was uh, uh, Chair Carson, and between him, I, and uh, Cordell Johnson, we came up with a solution to my bill because it was a little confusing and it was a simple uh, bill and that's a simple solution and that is what you have in front of you today. Okay, So in committee that bill was ITL and uh, with the help of uh, Representative Mambuquet, um, like I say, all right. Chair Carson and Cordell Johnson, we came up with a one sentence, and that is what the analysis basically says. And if you look on the back, that uh, budget committee may require a governing body to provide its budget recommendations in full line item detail and active spreadsheet form to the members of the budget committee. And that allows instant decision. If someone at the budget committee comes in with a motion, well, I'd like to say uh, maybe we'll um, add $2,000 to this bill, uh, to this line. And if they had what the line uh, covers, say it was maintenance and repair uh, for vehicles, uh, it would also show, um, say, tires, you know, uh, tune-ups or whatever maintenance they may need to the bill governing vehicles or tires for that matter. So they can put that figure in their computer on, on their des desktop right at the meeting, help school board committees. Come to a, uh, um, a, a very solid decision as whether it would be good or bad. Uh, we did uh, in the House session on that House Bill 1460, we amended that, and we overturned the ITL. Uh, I believe it was 283 to 8. So it was a, a partisan bill, and uh, both sides agreed to it. And uh, unfortunately, it was tabled in the Senate. Uh, first time around, I changed it a little bit, and they did make some uh, recommendations to do that, but they only went down a couple of lines uh, in our first session, and I thought that I felt that this part here was necessary for the people in the in committee to actually do their job, and, and it would be more kind of beneficial, and they would learn more about their budget processing. And that's pretty much it. And I'll take uh, some questions. Yes, uh, questions from the committee, yes. uh, Representative Brown. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Representative, for taking my question. I'm curious. Um, 
Is there anything that prevents a governing body from doing this already? Um, in a lot of cases, not a lot, I should say a lot, I've seen many cases that uh, they would have to take a vote in order to, to do this. And um, a budget committee uh, in most places will go over each individual lines, but some don't. Some come in and they say, well, this is our budget. Um, go through it, you know, and stack a paper. And there's no, uh, no uh, real uh, digging into the budget itself. And they take a vote, and if the vote is not in favor of doing this, it goes back to uh, their standard way of, of, of developing the program. So it will help in that respect. So. Okay. Follow-up? Follow-up for uh, do you know of any governing bodies that already do this that can be used as a best case practice? Sandown does it, actually. Okay. Okay. Um, I had uh, one individual, he was on there a couple of years ago, he used to take his computer all the time, and he went to the, to the office and he said, I need to download the budget to my computer. And he gave him a uh, uh, thumb drive, they put it on the thumb drive, and they, they gave it to him. He, he, worked it. he worked that, and that was part of the reason why I started this process two sessions ago. So, um, but like I say, some, some, budget, some governing bodies are very <coughs> amenable to uh, this procedure and they'll do that. Others don't want to be bothered. And, you know, it, you know, it all goes downhill. If you have uh, a high budget, and you, you know, sometimes we, we've heard testimony on different things pertaining to the budget so far. So it's just one way of giving an, an opportunity to not only the budget committee to, to learn more about it, but also project that to the people listening and, and, and coming to the meetings. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Representative Power. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative, for taking my question. So I understand what the intent of this um, bill is, but I'm a little bit concerned with the language because um, line three, the wording is may require to provide. So that means what that's saying to me is that the budget committee, they might or might not ask um, this information from the governing body. And additionally, is there anything that compels or um, forces the governing body in response to, to actually provide the information? I don't see um, a, a sh shall um, provide coming from the governing body. So uh, while I understand the intent, uh, okay. do you share, do you, do you see what I'm saying? And I, I understand. I can have a, uh, an amendment uh, made to change may to shall. I just wanted to go easy on everybody first, you know. Okay. Yes, uh, Representative Klee. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, microphone, I can't hear you. My apologies. I just wanted to know what the definition in this of governing body and active spreadsheet. Okay. Governing body is any, any uh, school board, any budget committee, school board committee, budget committee, um, and active spreadsheet means the one they're using now to present the budget. Follow up, sir. Yes, go ahead. thank you. Um, but it doesn't have to be the live spreadsheet. In other words, you, you may, it doesn't have to be the live spreadsheet. In other words, you said you would give them a copy with a thumb drive. So it's not something that has to be. They can't edit what exists on on the. Um, they for, I'm sorry. No. I, I know I'm not being clear. So, for instance, if I make a change to it just because I want to diddle here to, to see how I could change the budget for a better, it's not going to change it on the, the city, the municipal system, correct? That is correct. The, okay. the, 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 the town, city, or um, governing the uh, person, the, the people that generate the budget will have a master copy. That will not change, and okay. those will... Uh, per effect. Perfect. Thank you very much. Representative Lascelles. Thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Um, so that line number three, the Budget Committee may require a governing body to provide its budget 
recommendations in full line item detail and active spreadsheet format. Mm -hmm. So when you say the budget committee uh, may require, so all this takes is a majority vote of the budget committee to require this to happen. Is that correct? Yes, but uh, Representative Power asked me to change that may to shall, and if they ask for it, they, they will get it in, under those conditions. But it is, I'm sorry, follow up? Yes, go ahead. It is enabling. The budget committee doesn't have to do this. The, at this point, with that may in there, that is correct, and I, and I probably should uh, change that. I agree with that, because well, if somebody does request a copy of it, they should be, and they're on those committees, they should be able to see the full budget. Okay, thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm following up on Representative Clee's question about the spreadsheet format, because in the on line four, it says full line item deta detail in active spreadsheet format. Mm -hmm. So an active spreadsheet, is it not editable? Yes, of course it is. And that will be edited by the budget committee only, or budget committee member only, um, and that would not affect the original budget at all. They could make those decisions from the results of uh, a person questioning, um, I would like to increase or decrease this particular line, and this is the results that I have. This is what would happen if I did that. Okay, so you can, at your meeting, at your budget committee meeting, you could say, well, this is a good idea or a bad idea. Uh, you know, and, and it gives them more insight, based, basically, in operating that budget. So. Follow up, Mr. Chair? Yes, go ahead. Um, do you have any concern about the edited piece of the uh, Budget Committee has made their search and found that this is a line item that can be changed? Do you have any concerns that that can then be like a screenshot and posted on, on social <coughs> media as this is what it should be? And and uh, and then there's uh, misinterpretation of what is actually the budget. No, I I believe the budget committee members are completely responsible for their actions. Okay, and those will be the only ones that'll see this. It isn't posted to the public. It isn't posted on um, any Facebook page or anything like that. The budget committee individual has that on his computer, so he can do his job more effectively in the budget process. Thank you. Yes, Representative Majapuri. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Um, there's a big difference between uh, the word may and shall. Shall is more deter, you know. Um, Representative, uh, uh, question? Yeah. So would you believe that this would be too stringent changing the word may to shall. Not at all. It only applies to the budget committee people, and uh, it, it gives them the opportunity. If they want to do it, they don't have to do it. I know on my uh, budget committee board for Sandown, we had one person request this, and any questions were diverted by the chair uh, to the uh, person. Can you look up on the computer and say what that would affect, how that would affect this budget? It's plain follow. and simple. A quick follow-up, Mr. Chair. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, how would this impact right to know law? It has nothing to do with the right to know law. Budget committees are all public. Okay, any other questions for the representative before we go to the public? Yes, uh, Representative Powell. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question. I'm noticing in the analysis that it states that the bill provides that a municipal budget committee and um, the language of the bill itself, it, it only references a budget committee. So my question is, based on the language of the bill and not the analysis, this bill covers school district budget committees because some municipalities, the, 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 
their school district is not under municipal budget. Correct, and that it's a school that district. Does cover the school budgets by requiring a governing body to provide. I think. Any Ms. further questions? Does Mr. Majuri have one? Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank, you. thank you, Representative. We're okay. going to go to the public. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, for those of you in the audience who have questions about House Bill 1026, uh, please uh, come up to the microphone. Yeah, we're very clean here. Yes. Good morning, Chairman Dolman and committee members. My name is Catherine Heck from the New Hampshire Municipal Association. And originally, we did not intend on speaking on this bill as it was written, as the amendment um, has compelled me, though, to want to just make some comments as to changing the may to shall. Um, it would be best practice that a municipal budget committee, which would cover school districts, they're all under municipal budget law, or towns, to be able to have access to a line item detail when they are preparing their budgets. Um, when you change may to shall, it will now be a requirement. It wouldn't be a request any longer that each individual committee could make. It would have to be required that this information be passed in this way in active spreadsheet format. The concerns that I have is in best practice and in the way most of our municipal governments, and I can't speak to all schools, but several schools, there is, of course, access to this information. And typically, there is someone, especially when we're getting into four and, four and 500 page documents of line items, someone within the um, office staff that kind of manages these versions because when you start to manipulate one line on page 280, that could get missed in the, in the final budget. So in many cases, there's an individual that attends all these meetings that makes sure that all of these changes are made and recorded. And it certainly doesn't preclude any committee member, the budget committee member, from having access to this information. But in the effort to make sure that someone's not at home changing the spreadsheet and then that change isn't properly discussed at a meeting and then transposed into the final budget, those are the concerns that we would have. So we do prefer the language of May, so it stays a local option. And again, in practice, this should already be occurring so that the budget committee can do its work. Um, and I can take any questions that you Thank might you. have. Uh, are there any questions for the NHMA? Yes, Representative Klee. Uh, thank you, Ms. Heck. Um, just, just a quick one. Um, having this document um, in, in a public forum, in an electronic version, does that subject it to right to know by the public to get a copy of this active spreadsheet as well? I, I would imagine that it would. Once a majority of, of the committee would have something, it would become a public record. In electronic format? I'm not talking printed. In electronic format? Um, I don't know that that would be shared in Excel format with the public, but certainly in PDF format, which they can already request, of right. course, at any time. I, I just want to know about the electronic. Thank you. Uh, yes, Representative Power. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question. Um, is there anything in this bill that um, prevents the active, I guess, I just need some clarification. Active spreadsheet means um, editable. So my question was um, the wording of this bill. Is it possible to um, provide an uneditable? I mean, certainly the the purpose of the bill is to provide the information, but if there's concern about things being changed, then the solution would be to have it not be editable. And, well, typically, um, uh, whether it's a hard copy or a PDF format, that is what would be provided to a committee. And again, some committees do have access to an editable spreadsheet 
and, and usually there's one individual in charge of be making sure that that version is done with fidelity and is then reported as such moving forward through this budget process. So then it gets to the time of the deliberative session or the town meeting. It is the accurate and correct document. Too many people accessing one document could lead to just honest mistakes. Any other? Uh, yes, uh, Representative um, Manjaputi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you uh, for taking my question. Um, you kind of answered part of it. So the budget, isn't it true that the budget is a working document? And it is to be edited or modified in consensus as a team because it's an important numbers game that we're playing. So this would allow individuals, like you said, you know, and wouldn't that create more of a bookkeeping nightmare? Potentially, Representative. Any other questions? Yes, uh, Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Ms. Heck, for taking my question. Do you see any issue, um, whether this be shall or may, aside, do you see any issue between having an advisory bud budget committee and a, and a budget committee that uh, is going to make final decisions about the budget if, if there's a request for an active spreadsheet. Do you see any issue there just on that one piece? Uh, my understanding with that this would be um, required for the um, official budget committees, but again, even advisory committees should have access to the line item detail that they need to be even advisory in nature. So um, the active spreadsheet format is just a concern due to the multiple versions that can start to be created and then not properly transposed over time because it's usually a six month process to do the budget. So that would be the concern that we have with the active spreadsheet. But someone, I think, uh, well, I'm clear that a law was passed last year to ensure that the public can have access to the full line item detail now as well. So certainly, um, it's important that everyone have the access that they need to make proper decisions and deliberate the budget accurately and properly. And I think that is already occurring in most situations. If there's exceptions to that, um, certainly the may versus the shall should alleviate that in some communities if that's not the case. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Ms. Heck. Thank you very much. Any other, any other uh, people wishing to testify on this bill that are here? If you are looking to testify on this or a future bill, make sure you fill out one of these pink cards, which is over there by the clock, so we have a record of who's testifying and who's not. Thank you. This closes the hearing on HB 1026. We'll start the next hearing in three minutes. Yeah, next, next Tuesday. 
Yes. Oh, no, no. All right, let's begin uh, testimony on House Bill 1068. Is there someone here to introduce the bill? A, re a representative or? A okay. Thank you, Representative Majori. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, honorable members of municipal and county government. For the record, my name is Jim Majori, representing Rockingham District 22, the town of Northampton. And I'm here to introduce House Bill 1068, the Tiny Bills Home, and make the request immediately that we go to ITL on this bill. Um, after consultation with many industry experts about this bill, uh, in spite of the fact or recognizing the fact that uh, I have been invested in this since it first came to municipal and county government a couple, number of years ago. There is legislation, there are updates, there is progress being made across the country that will address many of the issues that are not addressed in this bill right now to make it a much better bill. If we try to p pass this bill as it is right now, this will not be effective. It will not solve any problems. In fact, it may cause more problems because it doesn't resolve the issue of tiny homes on wheels. And that is the real issue where we're trying to uh, find the codes, find the standards, find the regulations that will make this an effective piece of legislation. So with that said, Mr. Chair, I ask, I respectfully ask that the committee maybe even consider executive session now on this bill to go to ITL. I do also want to say that there have been uh, multiple attempts to reach out to the prime sponsor on this, Representative Dave Testerman. Um, we haven't heard back, so I, I, uh, there, there have been many attempts to do that, and I just want to make that clear. With that, I will certainly take any questions. Thank you, uh, Representative. Is there any objection uh, if we took this to executive session right now? Yes. Mr. Chairman, um, may I ask a question of the sponsor? Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, Representative. Uh, a question. Some of the current concerns you have about this bill, can they be addressed through amendment? Thank you, Representative, for the question. Um, they could not because it would take a, a re it would require a rewrite of almost everything that is in this bill. Um, it would not be something that we could merely amend, um, possibly. I, I shouldn't say that. It possibly could be amended. However, based on the advice that I have been giving, again, from ind industry experts, we might be able to just cut and paste something coming out of Colorado right now that will fix this. It would just take a few months. Better to do that and get it right than pass something now that is going to have to be, that's going to hemorrhage, that we're going to have to rework better to take some time to do it right once than half right twice. Does that make any sense? Yes, thank you. And Ms. Oh, sorry, oh, you have a no. uh, Yes, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not opposed to going into executive session. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Representative Van. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Representative Maggiore. Am I correct in understanding that the um, International Building Code Council is actually working on this right now? and that New Hampshire is looking at building code updates that have to do with tiny houses? Thank you, Representative, for the question. You are correct. Uh, and to build upon that right now, tiny homes, 
a tiny home could be built in the state of New Hampshire on a foundation. Appendix Q was adopted, which sets the standards for a tiny home. We're really trying to get to that piece about the on wheels. You're absolutely correct. We're halfway there. We just need a little more time to get all the way there. Representative Manjapudi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, thank you, Representative, for taking my question. You answered part of my que question to the previous uh, question. What other bills that you alluded to, other bills that are enabling tiny homes, what other that are currently law or cu currently modified uh, that can uh, facilitate tiny homes? Thank you, Representative. If I understand correctly, are, are, do you mean what, what uh, existing legislation or standards exist? So again, Appendix Q will sets the definitions for what a tiny home is. A tiny home is a very specific structure. Um, we can talk about a small home, that's different. A tiny home is a specific structure, which is already set forth in Appendix Q, which those standards were adopted the end of last year, as I recall. So again, a tiny home can be built on a piece of property as long as your community allows that. Okay. Someone have a question? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Representative Tripp. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And it's thank you for the way. <laughs> I, I know nobody can see me. I must be the invisible man. Uh, uh, you mentioned uh, Appendix Q. Is that the, uh, uh, from some uh, specification? Thank you, Representative, for taking the question. I apologize. The speaker is directly in the way, so I'll, I'll stand over, I'll sit over here. Um, I will get you the information. I will make sure the entire committee has Appendix Q so you can review it and where it comes from. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Uh, seeing no further questions from the committee, uh, I'll open it to the public. If you want to, you want to ask any questions, please come on up. Oh my God! I think I made this. Mistake. There we go. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, thank you for uh, taking public comment on this issue today. Um, I'm a little curious to the, to the excuse last... Excuse me, can, you, can I get your name? Yes, or... sure thing. I, I put in a card there. My name is Stephen Daves. I live in Manchester, New Hampshire. Got it. Um, I had recently purchased some land in Manchester. I had contacted the zoning department about building a tiny home, and they had told me if it's under 320 square foot, it is not legal to build. Um, so I don't know if that's what Appendix Q references that you were talking about, but it seems contrary to my personal experience. Um, I did have some written comments, but I just wanted to address that first because that was a little puzzling to me. It looks like uh, there's a representative over yes, here. Yes, Representative Van. Uh, Mr. Daves, um, I believe you will find... I know the answer to his question, but... <laughs> um, I'll, there's no way to formulate it as a question, so I'll pass. Okay, uh, any other questions? Well, the... yeah, I just wanted to say that New Hampshire is facing the worst housing shortage that we've had in our recorded history, as far as I can see. In January, I checked the MLS, and there were less than 1,000 houses for sale in the entire state. Uh, this problem has essentially been created by restrictive local ordinances that forbid building and living in smaller homes uh, and lot utilization rules. Uh, according to the New Hampshire Coalition to End Homelessness, there were 4,451 people who experienced homelessness in 2021, and 1,577 of those were families that experienced homelessness. Uh, you couldn't even buy every home and give them to the homeless people. There's not enough homes as it stands. Allowing tiny home communities, as listed in the bill, offers a legal and voluntary solution for philanthropists to create real solutions right now to house the homeless that are outside as we speak. Uh, please take a moment and imagine sleeping outdoors 
in this winter. I don't know if anyone here has thought about that and what that's like. Uh, most of us have warm homes to go to. If you oppose this bill, you're stopping an actual solution to help 1,577 families from freezing to death in the cold. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that any reps have. Yes, uh, Representative Gallagher. Yeah, um, could I just get um, the spelling of your name for note-taking purposes? Like, is it a V or PH or? Yeah, I did fill out a card and submitted it. It's PH. Uh, and last name? Daves, D-A-V-E-S. -D like I said, it is on the card. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, seeing no further questions. Actually, there's one over here. Oh. Yes, Representative Manjapudi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking my question. You said uh, you, have, you purchased a piece of land. Was it part of a you know, tiny home community building, or is it a regular plot of land that you bought? So it's a regular plot of land. The most common plot of land available in Manchester is R1A. It is the standard piece of land that is actually the specific type of land that this bill references. Um, so that's why I felt that it was relevant. Any further questions for this witness? Tony? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question. Um, has the homelessness increased dramatically um, since um, two year, in the last year or two? because uh, you stated that um, this would help the housing shortage in New Hampshire. And Cordell Johnson from the New Hampshire Municipal Association said this is not a solution to the housing sh shortage in New Hampshire. Okay, well currently this would, according to the bill, this would allow four tiny homes to be put on a lot of land as I read it. I'm not a land use lawyer, but that seems to be the plain language in the law. Um, I believe last year, just from my reading from the New Hampshire Coalition to End Homelessness, there were 35 encampments that required the police to go in and remove the homeless people that had set up encampments. So does that mean that if 35 pieces of land were set up to create homeless, uh, tiny home communities, that it would be an availability? I'm not sure, I don't have all the answers, but I don't think that preventing a solution that could create more houses is a very, um, let's say, heartfelt position for a legislator to say when they themselves have warm homes to go to at night. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Natch Grays, you had some comments you wanted to give? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't really have anything to add. I'm happy to answer any questions the community may have. Um, I support the sponsor's recommendation of ITL. Anybody have any questions for the NHMA? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Grace. Thank you. Next, we have testimony from Mary Smith. Are you here, Mary? Hello? Uh, thank you. Um, as part of the uh, portion of my testimony that is actually written out, uh, this bill takes tiny houses out of the statewide legal gray area and makes them explicitly lawful while requiring them to meet life safety codes and allow municipalities some limited zoning control over them. It prevents municipalities from banning tiny homes in single-family zones, and it allows tiny homes on existing residential lots wherever detached accessory dwelling units are allowed by zoning. Um, I guess this bill is a lame duck now that the uh, prime sponsor isn't here and the co-sponsor is suggesting ITL. That's a real shame because... Um, uh, 
aside from the comments from uh, the New Hampshire Municipal Association, uh, any additional housing that we can help uh, allow or create in the state is going to mean that there is less homelessness and lower rent and lower prices for everyone else in the state. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure um, what his analysis includes. It would be interesting if uh, the Municipal Association was here to make that case. Um, but unfortunately, it uh, doesn't seem to uh, coincide with common sense that any opportunity we have to make cheaper, more affordable housing in the state means there will be fewer homeless in our state. So. Is there any other questions for Ms. Smith? Okay, thank you very much. Yes. I passed in a pink slip, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the Municipal and County Assist, uh, Committee, I don't know where I am this morning. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what I think is part of the confusion that's happening this morning. Um, right now, under International Building Code, the IBC, there is an addendum which was adopted, I think, at the end of last year. Uh, which is called Appendix Q. Appendix Q lays out the requirements for a tiny house. It talks about uh, cooking facilities, sanitary facilities, adequate ventilation, all of those things. And those refer to tiny houses that sit on the ground. So right now, um, you can build a tiny house in New Hampshire unless the municipality in which you are trying to build it has a minimum square footage requirement. Many jurisdictions have a minimum square footage requirement of between three and 600 square feet. Some of them are higher than that. So if your jurisdiction, for example, Peterborough, New Hampshire, where I serve on the planning board, um, Right now, we have an amendment going forward in our code that removes the minimum square footage allowance. We used to have a minimum square footage of 400 square feet for a studio, 600 square feet for a one bedroom. I recommended to the planning board that we amend that and remove the minimum because that's controlled by the International Building Code. The International Building Code makes clear how big the build, the a, a safe dwelling shall be. And that's, for tiny houses, that information's in Appendix Q for anything that's not considered tiny. It's in the regular International Building Code. Actually, it, if it's a single standalone building, it's in the International Residential Code, to be precise. So when people are having trouble building a tiny house, at this point in New Hampshire, if it's a tiny house not on wheels, then what they are likely bumping up against is their local zoning code and the minimum square foot requirement that is in that code. I just want to make that clear that that's, it works at cross purposes to what the state has done with their building code. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Representative Power. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question. I'd like to understand can a tiny home on wheels, can, is that permitted in a trailer park in New Hampshire? I don't know the answer to that question. That's, uh, I, I don't know. Representative Manjapudi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Um, how does that apply to micro or mini condos or uh, structure on a complex? Same thing. 
Um, if your local code says that the minimum square footage for a dwelling unit is 400 square feet, it doesn't matter where, whether it's a single standalone cottage or part of a 400 unit apartment um, complex, it has to be at least 400 square feet. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Powell, a follow up? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question. So I understand that with regard to the Appendix Q and the international building codes, um, in, in terms of, um, I guess, safety, that they um, put forward minimum um, square footage requirements, as you've explained. So my question is, is with regard to a tiny home, so long as uh, the tiny home meets that building code, is there anything that prohibits a certain number of people from domiciling or living in that space? Could you have five people or, you know, four people living in a tiny home? That would be up to the local health officer in terms of how much there are minimum square footages, but that's administered in a different place. The IBC has to do with the construction of how it's used after it's constructed falls into a different, under a different uh, uh, supervision. Okay. Uh, seeing no further questions, uh, thank you, Representative. Okay, the, the, uh, the pre-hearing um, count on this particular bill, 12, uh, 1068, was 9 for and 9 against. You, you have a, another pink card coming in? Robert Tardiff, are you here in the room? Would you like to speak on this bill? You have two minutes, Mr. Tardiff. Welcome. Thank you. I can be less than two minutes if you'd like. Uh, thank you. My name is Rob Tardiff. I'm the administrator of the Subsurface Systems Bureau in the Department of Environmental Services. Um, we regulate on-site wastewater, septic systems, uh, we also do subdivision of land. Uh, our only concerns really are about wastewater and wastewater disposal. Uh, there's a line in the bill that says, uh, alternatively, there can be essentially uh, holding tanks in these tiny homes, whether it be for water supply or wastewater. Uh, currently, state law and our rules in the ENV WQ 1000 prohibit holding tanks. Well. 45A32 says nobody shall construct a building that doesn't have a, an approved wastewater system from the department. Our rules um, say that we don't allow holding tanks except for in three uh, separate scenarios. One is if you have a failed system and there is no other means for uh, a compliant on-site wastewater system. If you're about the second is if you're about to be connected to a municipal sewer within one year, and the third is for infrequent commercial use. So, to uh, have holding tanks in a tiny home contradicts state law and state rule. Uh, so we we're, we're not opposed to the bill. We would support the bill with an amendment to remove that statement about alternatively. Self-contained, I believe is the language in the bill, self-contained water and wastewater. Uh, then the other comment we have in our letter of testimony is regarding tiny home parks. And we would like to see some language added to that part of the bill to basically go along with our language regarding mobile home parks uh, with a minimum lot size per, per unit. Uh, That's your timer. I mean, that, that was... Uh, pretty succinct, I think, on, on what the department's position is. I'd be happy to take some questions. Any or... questions for 
Mr. Tar Mr. Tartar from DES. Yes, Representative Rahm. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Tartar, for taking my question. Um, would a, a, assuming a tiny home might house one or two people, mm -hmm. and suppose the state changed their rules to allow holding tanks, how large a holding tank would one need to um, service the waste coming from that tiny home from one or two occupants? Currently, our minimum holding tank size is 2,000 gallons, which is a pretty significant size volume, a pretty large tank. Okay. Uh, so if, if this bill, oh, yes, follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So if this bill, you know, maybe not this particular bill, but one that addresses the whole chassis and wheel issue better, if it were to move forward, would the uh, DES be amenable to discussions to allow a holding tank for tiny homes if it was large enough to service one or two people in that tiny home for a year or two before it would need to be pumped out? Uh, I, I would say never say never kind of okay. answer. Uh, what, one of the main concerns about holding tanks, and I'll try to be brief again, is the expense that, it, that, that people incur when it comes to actually having these holding tanks pumped and having the wastewater disposed. What we find happens is either holes mysteriously get punched in these holding tanks or the material is removed and disposed in other maybe illegal methods. So those are, those are the main reasons why we try to discourage the use of holding tanks. So it's, it's, it's not a matter of, you know, if the holding tank is working, you know, and, it, and it's structurally sound and watertight, it's not really an environmental issue. It's more of the reality of the costs and what happens to, as a result of the cost to disposal of the, of the waste. Just one more follow-up. One more follow-up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Those issues you described about holding tanks, would they not be true of also septic tanks? Uh, not necessarily because with a septic tank, the effluent is leaving the tank. Uh, mm -hmm. So when you get a tank pumped, you can get a tank pumped, you know, every, uh, again, depending on use, but uh, every two, three years because the effluent's being disposed of in a wastewater, in a, in a leach field, right? And that wastewater is being treated by the soil and, okay. and that right. kind of thing. So Thank you. Okay, seeing no further questions for Mr. Tardiff, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you very much for, for your time. Okay, at this point in time, I've been encouraged by those around me to uh, take this particular bill to the next step, which will be uh, ex executive session. So during executive session, we, we change a little bit how we operate. Uh, there'll, be, there'll be no input from the public. And the committee members will discuss the bill uh, among themselves, and, uh, and then we will take a vote on the bill. So, uh, I'll close the bill, uh, I'll close HB 1068, the hearing of it, but uh, specifically, and we're now opening 1068 for executive. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, yeah. uh, should it please the committee, I would move ITL for House Bill 1068, and if there is a second, I'd be happy to speak to my motion. Is there a second? Motion's been made and seconded. Is, it, is there any further discussion on the bill? Yes, Representative Rung? I just want to state that um, my support of the ITL doesn't reflect um, uh, my position on tiny homes. I think tiny homes are a great thing, um, not just do they address the housing issue, the housing needs of people that are lower income, but it provides a way for people that just want to live a more simply, a simple life with less consumption to be able to have their, their housing reflect that. Thank you. Any other? Yes, Representative Manchapudi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I see uh, why the prime sponsor is, uh, or co-sponsor, is asking for an ITL. We had this last term, too. But there is a place for the tiny homes, and I'm encouraged with the fact that there is Appendix Q that can give some, somewhat, you know, not 300 square foot, but at least a 400 square foot, which can 
provide that uh, smaller than, you know, smaller tiny home opportunity or mini condos. So I'm hoping that we can offer those opportunities for folks that need in our state. Representative Gilman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, while I <clears throat> fully endorse the idea of the tiny home, um, I think as the co-sponsor said, it, this isn't ready for prime time. And one of my concerns is that, is the wheels problem, because um, we, uh, in the last couple of years, we passed some legislation about taxation of, of year-round camp, campers in campgrounds that are now being taxed for uh, structures that are affixed to them. And doing this on wheels brings to me, brings up to me the same question, how would it be taxed? Okay, uh, yes, Representative uh, Gallagher. So um, I'd just like to echo the previous speaker's comments um, and would just like to raise a point about procedure. Um, since this is the second year of a two-year legislative term. Um, well, in previous years, if we had concerns about, or in the previous half of this term, if we had concerns about a bill, we might have voted to retain it or refer it to interim study or something. But since we're in the second year of the term, that means we won't have time to do either of those. So, uh, um, yeah, if if we... If this had been a year earlier, I would have voted to retain our interim study, but since we're running out of time, um, the only way to postpone it at this point is, would be ITL. Representative Van. Thank you. Uh, full disclosure, I just told uh, Representative Maggiore this. My oldest child lived in a 240-square-foot tiny house built inside of a 1995 school bus for four years in Vermont. Thank he you had, for that disclosure. Oh, <laughs> But what I want to say is I hope that I made clear in my testimony that the issue now for tiny homes not on wheels is primarily local zoning ordinance. Um, Representative Maggiore just told me that in Northampton, the minimum square footage for, for a house or a dwelling unit is 725 square feet. That is unconscionable. People need to attack. This is a thing that can be done at the local level. Go in, talk to your planning board, ask them to lift the minimum. You don't need a minimum square foot. All of those health and safety issues are dealt with by the International Building Code and Appendix Q. Just get rid of that minimum, and then people can build tiny houses. Any further comments or questions? OK, seeing none, uh, at this point, we're going to take a vote. So. Would you, uh, let me review, the, a motion has been made to ITL this bill, uh, and it's been seconded. So now uh, we're going to take a vote. We're going to ask the, the uh, committee clerk to take a roll call vote, and then we'll disposition the bill. Okay, uh, ITL on HB 1068. Representative Piemonte. Yes. Clerk votes yes. Representative Tripp? Yes. Representative Guthrie? Yes. Representative Lasalas? Yes. Okay. Uh, Representative McBride, Representative Melvin? Yes. Representative Ayer, uh, Representative Power? Yes. Representative Trey Levin, Representative Gilman? Yes. Representative Majori? Yes. Representative Stavis, uh, Representative Magaputi? Yes. Representative Van? Yes. Uh, Representative Klee? Yes. Representative Gallagher? Yes. And Representative Rung? Yes. And Chairman Dolan? Yes. Uh, motion passes 15 to 0. Okay, so with, without objection, I'm, I'll place this bill in the consent calendar going forward. And that closes the, our activity on House Bill 1068. Okay, we're going to move on to House Bill 1238.
Do we have uh, so, uh, an introduction to the bill? Thank you. Representative Vose, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and good morning to all my honorable colleagues. For the record, I'm Representative Michael Vose. I represent Rockingham District 9, the town of Epping. I serve in this house as chair of the House Science, Technology, and Energy Committee. And I also serve on the planning board in my town of Epping. And I'm here this morning to talk to you about affordable housing. I have submitted written testimony about a week ago. I hope all of you have had a chance to take a look at it. The reason I filed this bill is because New Hampshire has a persistent problem with having more jobs then we have people who can accept and take those jobs and work those jobs. Now, part of that might be demographic, but part of it might be because people can't find places to live. So if you can't find a place to live, you can't take a job near, unless you can find a place to live near where that job is located. I've lived in Epping for 14 years. Since I've moved there, I've watched literally hundreds of single-family homes constructed, all of them in the three, four, and five hundred thousand dollar range. Homes that you would probably not consider affordable. And our town Facebook page is frequently populated with messages from people saying, in search of or in need of an apartment, a two-bedroom apartment for twelve or thirteen hundred dollars. Well, there are very few apartments in Epping, and in fact, in Rockingham County, the average rental for a two-bedroom apartment is sixteen hundred and fifty-two dollars, which is the most expensive average rental in the entire state of New Hampshire. Rockingham County is the most expensive place in the state to live both for single-family homes and for affordable homes. So what's really the definition of affordable housing? It's housing that you can afford to move into if you make 60% of the average median income in the area where you live. So in Rockingham County, the average median income is significantly high compared to other parts of the state. And that's what drives up the cost of apartment dwelling to over $1,600 a month. And that pushes it out of the affordable range. The other thing that distinguishes affordable housing from other kinds of housing is it typically is multifamily dwelling units. It's not single family dwelling units, it's multifamily apartment buildings or houses that have been uh, converted to apartments. In Dover, if you ride through Dover, you'll see many of these great big huge houses that were built 100, 150 years ago when people had big families. But now, many if not most of those buildings have been converted to apartment buildings. They contain two, three, four, five apartments. And those units are more affordable for a person to live in than buying a single family home. In fact, in Dover, single family homes are, the median price now is over $500,000 for a single family home in Dover. Now in my written testimony, I provided a link to a study that was done by St. Anselm's University recently to try to uncover the causes of 
unaffordable housing in New Hampshire. And if you read that study or took a quick look at that study, one of the, thing, one of the things it reveals is that heavy duty land use regulation is one of the causes of our lack of affordable housing in this state. We have driven up through land use regulations the cost of housing all across the state, but especially in the most populated counties like Rockingham and Hillsborough. So I have filed this bill in an attempt to chip away at some of the regulation that is inhibiting the development of affordable housing. Now the bill I submitted initially, or the bill as introduced, I will concede is somewhat vague and possibly even toothless. What it does is it amends the uh, workforce housing general provisions for planning and zoning declaration of purpose to say that you can't prohibit workforce housing in any defined zone. Well, that's kind of vague, I admit. So I have prepared an amendment that addresses this issue. It um, clarifies exactly what I mean and would like to accomplish. And I'm going to pass out uh, this amendment so you can all take a look at it. And I would like to discuss it, discuss it if that's OK with uh, the chairman. Yes, we can discuss it, but we're not going to take a vote on it until we go to executive session. Understood. Understood. So uh, thank you to Representative Power for passing out the copies of the amendment. And also, thank you to Representative Power, who made a couple of suggestions uh, to me as I was thinking about preparing this amendment. And her suggestions were uh, incredibly helpful. So what I've done in the amendment is I've spelled out, well, what exactly are we talking about when we're talking about affordable housing? So the language now says that it would be, you would be prohibited uh, on the building of, or you would be prevented from putting into your land use zoning requirements prohibitions on the building of multifamily dwelling units in residential or non-residential zones. That spells it out. Spells out what is an affordable unit and where it could or could not go. And by using the language residential or non-residential, that basically means it can go anywhere where it's reasonable to put it. And then to give the, the bill a little teeth, as it were, I've also added a, uh, a similar phrase to the innovative land use control section of statute to provide an incentive for people to actually consider doing this. So this amendment, I think, significantly strengthens the bill, makes it more understandable as well as gives it some teeth to make it implementable. So this bill, HB 1238, is basically a modest expansion of RSA 672. It chips away at a little bit of the heavy duty regulation to which we subject land use here in New Hampshire. And it may be one small step toward helping us provide more affordable energy, uh, affordable housing, rather, in our state. With that, I think I'll, I'll conclude my testimony, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, Representative Vos, do you have already assigned the, uh, the amendment to anyone in particular to, to complete that? We're going to probably exec this bill, uh, I'd say, the middle of next week. Uh, I was hoping that Representative Power would take that on, but I can't speak for her. Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is a process question, and 
due to the fact that Representative Vos has submitted this amendment, I guess prior or during the hearing, does he need another co-sponsor? No. No. Okay. Okay. Uh, questions from the committee? Yes, Representative Van. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Representative Vos, for taking my question. Um, I uh, am curious about this amendment to uh, uh, Section 3E, where you say, not limited to, provided that such units meet all other applicable standards. Um, the issue I am asking about is lots of, and I'm sure Epping is the same way, a great deal of your residential area is zoned single family only. So are you assuming that that's a standard? Because typically, I don't think we would consider that a standard. Thank you for the question. What I was referring to by applicable standards are essentially building codes, uh, zoning ordinances that affect parking lot size, uh, that type of thing not anything having to do with what's applicable to the zone in total, but applicable to building units. Your follow-up? Okay, so can you tell me how much of Epping's residential area is zoned single-family only? I couldn't give you an exact percentage, but I'd say it's close to 70%. One more follow-up. So I'm not sure, can you explain to me how this is going to help if 70% is single family only and this does not address that issue, uh, what's your anticipation here? Well, I think it does address the issue because it gives an incentive to a builder, if he so desires, to build an apartment unit in a residential zone. And it, he could also build an apartment uh, building in a non-residential zone. It's a property rights issue. If someone owns property and they decide they want to sell it to someone who wants to build an apartment building, they should have the right to do that. Hey, uh, Representative Majapudi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Um, my question is, you have added in your amendment the inclusionary zoning, and which some communities have adopted, and it only applies to 15% of a new development that they can um, ask for a multifamily. Still does not address, like my colleague just asked about, zoning in terms of single family homes and the developer can own somebody owning a land to put up the local ordinance, local zoning has to work with the developer just by owning a piece of land. You still have to abide by what's currently in existence. This does not give much change to that. How do you explain that? Well, as I said in my, uh, thank you for the question, Representative. As I said in my uh, original testimony, this is a, a bill that chips away at land use regulation. It's, it's not a huge change, but I'm hopeful that it will prod local communities as they craft future land use regulations to consider the possibility that affordable housing needs to be accommodated in a better way than we do today. I'm not entirely certain exactly what you were asking. Uh, if you could clarify a little bit, maybe I can give you a better answer. Go ahead. Thank you. My question is, this will only enhance a large developer or support a landowner in terms of developing. I just have a single family home with a modest air, you know, it doesn't help somebody if I'm willing to do expand on my single family lot. Doesn't give me a whole lot of um, teeth to do that currently. 
thank you for the clarification. Yes, uh, it is an incentive. It's not a, not a mandate, certainly. It's just an incentive to a developer to be able to, to consider putting an affordable housing unit on a piece of, of property. Now, existing regulations that are in effect would still apply. So for example, if you live in a single family home and there's an empty lot next door to you and somebody buys it and wants to put up a multifamily home, you're in a butter. And so you can still make objections to the planning board or other local uh, planning organization when that site plan is originally offered. And if there are a sufficient number of abutter objections, then the planning board or other organization would have to make a decision about whether to go forward with that or not. That would still be the case, even though we've provided in this, in this legislation an incentive for developers to consider a multifamily multi dwelling unit in a residential or even other zone, industrial commercial, for example. We had a, a case in Epping where we have a, a, a zone that's industrial commercial, and someone came in and proposed a 315-unit apartment building. And there is a federal law that says if 20% of such a, a, a development is workforce housing, then it's allowed in a commercial industrial zone. So this would, this bill would reinforce that federal legislation. Okay, uh, if there are no further questions, I'm going to go to the public. Thank you, Representative. And first we'll have uh, Mr. Pollock. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Ari Pollock. I'm with the law firm of Gallagher, Callahan, and Gartrell, <clears throat> excuse me, here in Concord. I've been a land use lawyer for about 25 years. Still hard to hear myself say that. Um, but I'm also a lobbyist for the New Hampshire Home Builders. And we're here today uh, to support the bill. Um, frankly, we support any well intentioned uh, effort to develop additional housing, and in particular, workforce housing. Uh, our members build housing. It's no surprise we want to build more. Um, but we also rely upon and require uh, a workforce and a labor force. And it's becoming an increasing struggle to find people who are able to work for our members who have those skills, who have the ability to, to live near where they work and afford housing where they work. And so we're not only building for customers, we're building for ourselves, we're building for our workforce, uh, and we're building for the state. Um, we support, therefore, the diversity of housing stock. Not everyone wants, not everyone can afford a single-family home, uh, and workforce housing and multifamily housing uh, serve some of those needs. Uh, this bill helps. It may be a small step, as the sponsor explained, and frankly, I view this from a legal perspective of putting another thumb on the scale when a case involving workforce housing or multifamily housing or inclusionary zoning uh, reaches the courthouse and a judge has to decide whether or not a community has acted fairly, reviewed things fairly, whether they're rejecting a proposal because of the merits of the proposal or whether they're rejecting a proposal because of the population served by the proposal. Um, I think those are critical uh, distinctions to be made uh, when housing projects come through uh, the process. Uh, and so we're just looking at the amendment to the bill this morning like the rest of you. Um, but it all appears to be a well-intentioned effort to op open up more opportunity for housing in New Hampshire. Um, it's amending a statute that's already on the books, a statement of purpose that's already on the books, um, and a statement of purpose that's already been tested in court on multiple occasions, and frankly can use all the support that it can get. Um, so we're here to briefly explain our support uh, for the concept behind the bill and to thank the sponsor for, for putting it forward. Any thank you. Any questions for Mr. Pollock? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking my question. Um, how would you characterize this is, like I asked the, pre the prime sponsor, does this only support, 
support landowners and the developers, or is there a counter that can also facilitate small, independent, single-family homeowners that can create multi-dwelling units on the currently existing? It's a difficult question to answer based on the language I see in the bill as introduced and in the amendment. I think certainly the intention is to provide support for both of those scenarios. Uh, and I know uh, in the inclusionary zoning portion, for example, in 674.21, that's enabling language that the state is providing to municipalities to enact those types of ordinances. It could only help in those circumstances, so I think it would be both. Yes, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, is my understanding correct that it's enabling currently focused on multiple, you know, the large developer, but not independent, except for the inclusionary zone that we see in our um, amendment? Most ordinances define multifamily as three units or more, so it does not need to be a particularly large development project to be classified as multifamily. I think people hear the phrase multifamily and they think large rental apartments in a large complex with multiple buildings. That, that, is, that is rarely the case in the more rural parts of the state. So I think it could very easily benefit either a, a private landowner or a private developer, uh, not a corporate entity. One last follow-up, Mr. One, Chair? One more. Okay, thank you. So how would this address the crisis or the need for missing middle housing in our state? I think a number of these projects are disadvantaged at the local level because of the notion that they're bringing in folks from outside of the community who, uh, who may not be uh, of the higher income levels. Um, I, I think this fills that middle by providing some more support for those projects if and when they reach the courthouse and the reasons for the treatment at the local level are explored. Whether you want to talk about the Housing Appeals Board, the Superior Court, there are forums where these, the rationale of the local boards is examined. And this type of language is very helpful in figuring out whether or not those bodies have done their job. Yes, uh, Ms. Gilman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question. Do you have any concerns about the about including non-residential zones and the mixture of perhaps light industrial or industrial businesses with, uh, with live dwelling units? I would have concern in terms of mixture of uses if the language behind it wasn't also provided, which is meeting applicable other, other applicable standards. I think that modifies the concern. Yes, uh, <coughs> Representative Lascellas. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for taking my question. I'm over here. Hey, there you are. <laughs> I represent uh, the town of Litchfield, which has uh, the overwhelming majority of the town is single family housing. But we do have um, over 55 housing, which is uh, uh, a, a development where uh, I assume that the requirement is that you're you're over 55 and you don't have young children. And, and that's fine for those people. But in this case, why couldn't we have housing similar to over 55 communities that are, for instance, under 40? Right, so the over 55 category, over 62 category, those are essentially legally discriminatory practices. It's a, it's a specialized, recognized um, subset of, of elderly. Um, there is no prohibition against having children in those developments. It's just less likely because of the age group of the owners. Uh, and so, you know, having something that says, uh, you know, four under 40, um, that, that would be discriminatory in a way that has not been recognized as legal. It's well beyond my pay grade to, to decide whether we should or shouldn't have it. But there's the distinction. Any Further questions for uh, Mr. Pollack? I think there's one here oh, yes. to my right. Representative Tripp. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question. Uh, with regards to the uh, other applicable standards, 
could you give me some examples of uh, what these other applicable standards would be? Yes, that was a good question asked previously of the sponsor. And I, as I understood his answer, it was things that I would consider to be in the category of dimensional requirements. Do you meet setbacks? Do you have proper parking loading? Can you uh, achieve the proper loading for whether it's an on-site septic system or does the sewer capacity uh, achieve the project's needs? Um, things of a, of a more technical nature than what I would call a, of a use nature. Thank you. You're welcome. Any uh, questions from the public for Mr. Pollock? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And next, we're going to hear from NHMA. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Nate Grace for the New Hampshire Municipal Association. I actually get to support uh, this bill. Um, we, NHMA does have a policy that recognizes the need for diverse and affordable housing in New Hampshire, and we support legislation that allows municipalities to um, require the inclusion of affordable and diverse housing opportunities as part of new housing developments. Um, I think, as was described in previous testimony, uh, this provides further incentive for municipalities to look at what they're doing, look at their zoning codes, and provide more opportunities for affordable housing, and that's why we support it. Happy to answer any questions that committee members may have. Yes, Representative Manjapudi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Grace, for taking my question. Same question I asked the previous um, speaker. How would you characterize this bill with other bills that are in our committee to help with increasing the densities um, that would help individual homeowners? increase the density in their property? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly how it would help individual homeowners. I would say as far as uh, asking municipalities to look at increasing density opportunities in their zoning, um, this certainly uh, bolsters what the legislature already has in effect um, to say this is something that they want municipalities to look at, especially with that missing middle um, as Mr. Pollock indicated, uh, the multifamily is often defined as, as three units or, or more, so it's possible that could help, uh, help that type of opportunity uh, arise. Yes. Uh, yes, go ahead. Mr. Grays, um, I thought that NHMA opposed all statewide zoning ordinances. Does this not require places to allow multifamily in places that they don't now? Can you explain to me uh, NHMA's change of heart? We, we do oppose all statewide zoning mandates, but we, we also, uh, because an innovative land use control is a local option, not a, a mandate, it would be something adopted at the local level, and therefore we'd be able to support it. In, in conjunction with our policy on how housing opportunities. So this only applies to communities that have adopted uh, innovative land use policies. Correct. Under the statute. Correct. So it would have to be, it's a, it's a local option. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, uh, any final questions for the NHMA? Thank you. I'm going to close the hearing on, uh, I'm sorry, I, have, I do have one more speaker. Um, so I'm not going to close the hearing. I have, uh, Mary Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, this bill strengthens the state's workforce housing law by preventing local governments from prohibiting workforce housing development in any district that meets other applicable standards, presumably including life safety codes. It is unclear how stringently this law would be interpreted in its literal interpretation, and this is talking about not the amendment, I haven't had time to review the amendment, and its literal interpretation the new law could represent a massive statewide deregulation of housing in which every single district 
must allow affordable housing to be built over the state's entire territory. But the law could be interpreted narrowly, simply making the existing requirement that every municipality must provide at least one pathway to building workforce housing more explicit without explicit preemption of lot sizes, setbacks, floor area ratios, parking minimums, minimum house sizes, and so on, municipalities could probably find a way to evade this as they already are doing. So uh, in any event, it does end up being a, a local control, sort of local option um, thing. Uh, Again, not considering uh, what changes the amendment uh, would have on this bill. So I just encourage the uh, committee to consider uh, doing something today to improve the state of uh, New Hampshire affordable housing. Um, so please uh, do not vote to ITL this bill. If you want to do something today, anything today, to improve uh, housing costs and access to affordable housing in this state. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this, uh, this bill received support of 16 people, and uh, those opposing was zero. So, your information. We're going to close the hearing now on House Bill 1238 and open a hearing on House Bill 1119. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. My name is Representative David Muse. Uh, I am here uh, in place of the sponsor of this bill, Representative Nicole Klein Knight. Um, and thank you for giving me an opportunity to uh, to present this bill to you. I know this is something you folks have uh, have seen before. I hope the approach that we're taking this time is something that can meet with your approval. What the bill would essentially do is to allow New Hampshire cities and towns to regulate the distribution of single-use plastic bags uh, to their customers as they see fit. Um, and that's basically it. This is not a plastic bags ban. This is not a tax on plastic bags. This essentially says uh, that if you're a community and this is an issue uh, for the people in your town or the people in your city, you have the ability under New Hampshire law to pass regulations that would impact um, the distribution of single-use plastic bags. Um, the bill, as it's written, would amend the municipal ordinance statute, that's RSA uh, 31 colon 39, uh, to include a new provision uh, related to single-use plastic bags. Uh, and again, what it would do is it would give municipalities the option of doing this. Uh, it is not a mandate. Uh, it is not a requirement. Um, one of the one of the big issues with uh, with single-use plastic bags and a lot of plastic uh, uh, plastic materials that are put out uh, into our environment these days uh, is that they are many times billed as being recycl recyclable, um, but the simple truth is is that they are really designed to be disposable, and the vast majority of people simply dispose of them, and this is why they wind up in our landfills, they wind up on the side of the road, they wind up uh, as litter, um, they wind up along beaches in places like Portsmouth, Rye, and Seabrook. Uh, so this is, a, this is an issue uh, that in a, maybe in a small way, uh, we can begin doing something uh, to, uh, to help the environment a bit. Um, the other thing I, I think that sometimes flies under the radar a little bit with plastic bags is they are made from fossil fuels. Um, so one of the things that continually churning out an endless supply of plastic bags and plastic materials does is it actually makes um, uh, the climate problem that we have uh, just a little bit worse. 
So this is a proposal that uh, a lot of people have been behind um, uh, for many years. I, I know there have been several attempts to get various uh, versions of this uh, through the legislature. Uh, this would simply give communities uh, like mine the ability uh, to regulate single-use plastic bags without having to worry uh, uh, any longer about whether or not that's something that is permissible under state law. And I can take any questions. Any questions? For, yes, uh, Representative Manjapudi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative, for taking my question. My question is, in the seacoast and the communities that attract a lot of uh, tourists and during summer and the population fluctuates, how would this help those small communities to deal with plastic waste? Well, um, it, it, would it, it helps, benefit? It, it helps them by having less of plastic waste to deal with. I think that's really the, the intent of the bill. So part of what this bill could do, depending on how different municipalities implement it, um, is it could begin to constrict the supply or the amount of this material that actually goes out into, uh, into the world uh, from stores, from businesses, and, and places like that. Um, there are many different options that communities have for doing this. And one of the things that you can do is you can just uh, Google municipal plastic bag bans. Um, and what it'll do is it'll take you to pages where you can see state laws that, are, uh, that have either banned them or restricted them in some way. You can see municipalities. Um, it's dozens of states at this point, and, and it's hundreds of municipalities. Uh, so this is something that is happening uh, across the country, and it would, be, uh, it would be a good thing if our communities had the option to do this. And my community in Portsmouth, we have kind of uh, come up against this several times. Um, we have a very active uh, high school environmental club uh, that over the years has, uh, has uh, proposed this to our city council. Um, Portsmouth is actually the, the only state uh, in New Hampshire, or the only city in New Hampshire right now uh, that actually uh, has any kind of uh, regulations or restrictions on, uh, on styrofoam uh, and on uh, uh, plastic, uh, single-use plastic disposables. And uh, those particular regulations have been written with the knowledge that the state, uh, you know, that this is not something uh, that, that, a, 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 that there isn't blanket permission uh, to do this across the board. However, um, our council uh, was confident that New, New Hampshire's municipal waste laws uh, do allow for some of the things that have been done. So for instance, Portsmouth's ordinance is not a total ban. One of the things that Portsmouth or, or, ordinance does is it uh, restricts uh, the distribution of uh, things like styrofoam containers and single-use disposables on city property. There are um, exceptions to that. Um, there is also uh, another ordinance that restricts the distribution of styrofoam uh, containers. And so what, one of the things that just sort of happened in our experience um, is that a lot, of this, this, a lot of this coincided with the COVID period. And so a lot of restaurants and businesses that normally use these materials were really kind of taking a second look at this. You know, they wanted something that was environmentally sound. They wanted something that was cost effective. And where a lot of, a lot of them have landed is they've landed on paper products. And they've also landed on, um, on things that are recyclable. So one of the problems with uh, both plastic bags uh, and with styrofoam is neither one of them is recyclable. And uh, a big problem with plastic bags in particular is that if people put them in their recycle bins, and you, you see that a lot if you have newspapers, and a lot of people will look for something to put the newspapers in, those, those uh, plastic bags can actually foul up recycling equipment, and that can actually add costs for municipalities. And it can, there can be extra costs uh, to sort through uh, material that has a lot of plastic bags in it and things like that. So for a lot of reasons, um, it, it makes sense to uh, let communities chart their own path when it comes to this, 
depending on things like the extent of their recycling programs, depending on things like, are they in a tourist area where you're going to have, you know, beaches and recreation and, and where, you know, having this, this litter would be an issue. Um, uh, uh, you know, in Portsmouth, we have hundreds and hundreds of restaurants. We have a lot of, we have a lot of supermarkets. We generate uh, a lot of disposable material. And this is a way of just sort of helping us start to get a handle on the amount of waste that we generate and the amount of waste that we put into our environment. with the follow-ups, we have a whole slew of people that want to speak on this, so I'll come back to you for a follow-up later. Um, Mr. Bruce Burke, are you here? Come on up. And am okay. I done? Or? You're all done. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. <laughs> See what we did? Oh, I'm sorry. Before, before you leave, uh, Representative McDonald had a question for you. Yes, sir. Thank you for taking my question, the Representative. I know some of the uh, communities in Massachusetts have uh, adopted similar policies that you want to adopt in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, there have been many failures in those communities, confusion to the public. Uh, you know, do I get a plastic bag? Don't I get a plastic bag? And I'm trying to figure out how you're going to determine that we don't have those same failures in New Hampshire. I'm sorry, we don't have what in New Hampshire? The same failures that Massachusetts has had in some of the communities where some communities adopt a policy of, yes, we take plastic bags, others, no, we don't. Well, part of, I think part of, part of the reason for this bill, and, and one of the things that we went through in Portsmouth, is this wasn't just something that was proposed one night and everybody agreed to it. Um, this is something that's been debated over a period of many years in Portsmouth. So I think uh, at least three or four years that I'm aware of, uh, it was proposed in several forums, shot down in several forums, and finally it, it, it was passed. Um, but it was passed with a lot of local debate, and it was passed with a lot of local input. And one of the things that was part of our debate were local issues. You know, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, in doing things like banning styrofoam from city locations uh, to, to put food in, um, there were people who were very concerned about uh, folks who may have bought supplies of, uh, of styrofoam containers and who had a lot of them on hand. Uh, they're, they're not cheap. Um, so there's an exception in, there was an exception in the local, in the local ordinance that allows people uh, who, who did buy stocks to use those, to use those stocks up. Um, there were other exceptions for nonprofit groups who, who rent out city facilities and things like that. So I think one of the things that we found is that at, at a local level, we can be very much in tune with, with local concerns. And I'm not saying that, you know, we're doing it perfectly. I think we're sort of going along and sort of seeing how things work and people are probably fully expecting to have to tweak it in some point way down the road. But having the flexibility to do that and not having to deal with, you know, uh, a one-size-fits-all mandate imposed from the state, uh, which is something that, that could come at some point, I think would tend to work better for a lot of communities in New Hampshire just because of the independence that you refer to. One follow-up. Uh, thank you for your explanation. Uh, regulating is a very broad word, and couldn't, if this was approved, couldn't a community say, okay, we're going to keep plastic bags, but we're going to make everyone pay 10 cents a bag if they want to use one. Well, you could. I mean, you know, essentially the bill is yours now, so you can do whatever you want to it. But the reason for keeping it broad uh, was to really just give municipalities uh, the maximum amount of, of flexibility uh, to enact regulations that really meet the needs of their citizens, meet the needs of their situation. Not everyone is going to want to charge for them. Um, there are also debates about where the money goes. Does it go to our community recycling program? Does it go back to the, um, the, the restaurant owners and merchants? And you know, where does that 10 cents go? Um, so one of the things I think sometimes is that we, you know, we, we try to solve all the state's problems up here at the state house um, when there are people who are perfectly capable of solving problems for their communities in those communities. And what we're really just trying to do here is to let them do what 
people in local communities elected them to do. Thank you, Representative. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Representative Mantafudi, just to be fair, I'll let you have your follow-up now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative, to, for taking a follow-up. Um, Single-use plastics would also um, enhance or wouldn't that uh, help with more recycling, better recycling, and uh, locally produce a reusable, I mean, recycled product from the single-use plastic versus mixed-use recycling stream, which can, uh, the single-use plastic can uh, pollute or, I, w I don't want to use the word corrupt, but it kind of could reject the whole bulk. I'm not sure. I'm not sure so, I understood uh, your okay, question. Okay, let me <laughs> phrase the question. It's in so many broad sections. Um, Single-use plastic. This providing this opportunity to separate and uh, single-use plastic will also wouldn't it also help with uh, doing a recycle recyclable product? For example, in Vermont, they do the chairs. Uh, plastic chairs, the Adirondack chairs using the re uh, single-use plastic. Uh, <laughs> similarly, but if it is mixed in with the multi-stream or mixed stream, it can reject the whole stream because of the single-use plastic. Yes, and, and, and one, one of the things that, that this, that, you know, one of the impacts that legislation like this could have is it could allow communities to actually kind of clean up their recycling streams a little bit. Um, so a lot of disposables uh, that aren't recyclable wind up in, in, in recycling streams, and that costs municipalities extra money. Um, and I think, as we all know, recycling programs these days are not, uh, are not inexpensive. There's a, there's a significant cost to, to having one of those. And a lot of our communities, we, but we still, we, still, uh, we still do want them. So if you have fewer, fewer disposables following up your, your recyclables, and then when when restaurants and, and when business owners do provide single-use plastics, they provide them in a form that, that is recyclable. Um, you know, that, that's something that, again, can, uh, uh, can help significantly. Representative Lascelles. Thank you for taking my question. Um, what do you think will it will be an alternative. Let's say a grocery store. Uh, if they prohibited single-use plastic and paper bags, what would they use? I think I think there are grocery stores now that provide uh, that provide paper bags. So um, uh, Trader Joe's, I think, is one grocery store in Portsmouth. They no longer uh, they no longer give out plastic bags at all. Um, all of the bags that they uh, uh, that they give out when customers come into the store and buy things are paper, um, and uh, a lot of people are also bringing in their own uh, uh, permanent bags. Yep, like you've got right there. Um, I have four of them out in my car right now. I use them every time I go grocery shopping. Although sometimes I do forget. I think everybody forgets. But the um, but the issue. You know, one of the things I do want to say is, is I think that uh, some of the grocery stores we have in New Hampshire, like Market Basket, are to be commended because they have made it um, a lot easier for people to bring their used bags back into the, the, the supermarket so they can be properly disposed of and hopefully recycled. Um, but, it, but again, that's only a very, very small percentage of, of the bags that actually leave a store like that, like that. So only a very, very small percentage actually come back and get recycled. Follow up. Yes, thank you for taking uh, my follow up. But the proposed bill um, has language that says they can regulate the distribution of single-use plastic or and paper bags. So a grocery store would not be able to offer plastic or paper, so they would have to offer something like this or something else. 
Well, there, there's actually no requirement in the law as, it, as it's written for a grocery store to do anything unless the municipality tells them that they have to do something differently. Um, but the reason for paper bags is that paper bags are uh, a lot of times are put out there as an alternative. So for instance, there are some communities that say, uh, we don't want you to, uh, to distribute plastic bags anymore. Instead, uh, we would like you to offer paper bags and, and charge people 10 cents a bag or five cents a bag or, or whatever, uh, you know, whatever the, the community thinks is, uh, uh, is fair. Uh, the idea is to really, is to really change behavior. Um, the, the plastic bags as they now stand, they're just am amazingly convenient for a lot of people. We've grown used to something that 20 years ago we didn't necessarily have. Um, and, uh, and, and I think a lot of people do appreciate the convenience, um, but um, the convenience comes at a cost, you know, to our recycling programs, to our landfills, and to the natural beauty of our state. So this is sort of why we're, we're, we're doing this. And, 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 I, and I would stress that, you know, we're not trying to design, uh, you know, the regulations here in this committee right now, unless the committee decides that's where they want to go. Um, you know, this really is about just basically said, telling municipalities that if you want to do this, you, you can. Yes, Representative Gallagher. Uh, so to kind of um, rephrase the previous question in a different way, uh, would you support an amendment that would change plastic bags and paper bags to say plastic bags or paper bags to change the and to or, or does it have to be and? I think that the, I think your, your suggestion is probably a little more precise. Um, again, the, I think the only reason paper is in there is in situations where a community might want to, um, to have uh, paper bags be your preferred alternative to plastic. It's ba basically, there could be somebody who comes out and says, well, wait a minute, the legislature never gave you authority to regulate paper bags. Um, so part of, part of it is, try, is just trying to get around that issue. And the other thing is um, plastic bags are the only single-use disposable uh, that are covered under this legislation. So it, it's, it's very narrow. Representative Tripp, did you have a question? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking my question. I'm sorry I'm behind the speaker, but uh, uh, it's interesting that you, uh, you read the uh, bill to say single-use plastic bags and paper bags, but you, paper bags are not considered single-use? I'm sorry? Oh, sorry. Paper bags are not considered single-use? They are considered single-use. The, the issue is paper bags are... Um, are not uh, quite as destructive and long-lasting in the environment as plastic bags. So um, I think the ideal solution would be uh, uh, for people to bring in their own bags. And, and that, that's actually something in our, um, in our municipal ordinance in Portsmouth that is encouraged. You know, people are encouraged to bring their own containers, um, to bring, you know, their own bags and things like that. It's, a, it's sort of a slow, steady, uh, a slow, steady change that'll take people a while to get used to. You know, no two ways about it. Um, but um, uh, a small change that hopefully will help. Yeah, follow up, please. Yes, follow up, go right ahead. All right. Uh, well, I, I typically use my paper bags to take my trash to the dump, but uh, there are. Uh, would you consider a uh, hefty trash bag to be a single use plastic bag? I think in the bill we're talking about bills we're talking about bags that are provided to customers, so I, um, I'm I, I think for the most part what we're talking about are the bags that we get at Walmart and Target and Market Basket and things of that nature. One more follow. -up. That was a great answer, but not to what I ask. Okay. <laughs> I ask, would you consider the hefty trash bags to be a single use? plastic bag? I would say generally yes. 
I know okay. thing, things like leaf bags and work bags, um, like when you're taking like waste out of your house and things like that, they're more durable. So some people might use them more than once. But I think in general, uh, I, I think they're, it's a similar issue to uh, the bags that are given away in stores. They're used once and then they're disposed of. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Uh, I, I would like to follow up on Representative Tripp's question. Um, because of the word single use, and you cited uh, market basket because they have a thicker ply. Um, that what, that's what makes them reusable. Um, so I'm wondering if you want to, to get to your point about the grocery store or, you know, Places that have the single, what we really understand is or the notion of single use. Would we change, would you consider changing that phrase to one ply or two ply or all ply? <laughs> um, yes. I mean, if, if it's something that, that you folks think would make, would make the bill better and more understandable, um, um, yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, Representative Power. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Re Representative, for taking my question. I'm curious to, to know, has any of the sponsors of this bill, have they considered the concerns related to reusable bags and the, the, uh, the sanitation with respect to that and the spreading of germs? Uh, you know, perhaps if we might be in a pandemic? Well, I think, I think one issue at a time. <laughs> but... but um, you know, when it, when it comes to that, I think one of the things that we went through early on in COVID was we did have an executive order that, that did ban um, those, those types of reusable bags uh, from grocery stores because there was a concern about transmission. I mean, anytime you're dealing with things like, you know, meats and things like that, there, there is always uh, a danger um, of uh, bacteria building up you know in reusable bags but i think it's kind of up to us as consumers to keep them clean um kind of like anything anything else it's kind of like you wouldn't use you know your cooler summer after summer after summer without cleaning it and uh, the same thing for plastic bags at least you know give them a spray of lysol every once in a while yes sir. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Um, I'm wondering if um, this whole issue about uh, are, is a hefty bag a single-use bag might be addressed by saying in your amendment or in your proposed change, regulating the distribution of single-use plastic bags and paper bags at point of sale. Yes. Yes. Would you accept such an amendment? Yes, I'm not. I'm not the prime sponsor, but I'm a co I would be an enthusiastic co-sponsor with that. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Uh, and uh, now we're going to go to uh, Bruce Burke. Oh, come on up. Bruce. Thank you. And you're welcome to use the uh, Clorox there to sanitize the, oh, the work you. here. <laughs> Good morning, my name is uh, Bruce Burke and I am from the town of Pittsfield and uh, I want to thank you for all the time you spend on behalf of our state. Uh, I want to speak a little bit about this bill and maybe just some general facts for a moment. Uh, you know, astonishingly, plastics have only been a major part of our culture since 1950. Uh, we older folks, some of us in this room remember uh, a world that didn't really use a lot of plastic. As a matter of fact, we lived in a world where they delivered milk to our doors, right? That world existed. Plastics is a recent phenomenon, and I don't want to bury you with facts, but in 1950, uh, we produced something like 2 million tons of plastic a year, and in 2015, that number increased 220 times, right? Plastics have not always been with us, and they are, I think, um, you've heard before, I think they're an emerging crisis that we're not really, uh, haven't really grappled with yet. Um, 
Having said that, plastics are an important part of our economy, and what I think this bill is trying to address is single-use plastics, which are estimated to be 40% of the plastics that we use. Uh, I think giving towns the option to eliminate plastic bags and paper bags is a step in the right direction. To my sense, there are two major arguments against this. One is about individual freedom. I, as a person, should be able to decide what I want to do when I go to buy groceries. I would suggest, however, that there's something called a social compact, where we as a society try to do the best for all of us. Even imagine sacrificing the ability to choose between plastic, paper, or uh, a reusable bag. Uh, you could also make the argument that people who are well-informed will make the right decision. I, I don't spend my time doing this, but if you spend 10 minutes outside of Hannaford's and Concord, where I shop, 60 to 70 percent of the people are coming out with plastic bags. I think they've heard of the crisis, but it's just not an awareness for them. The second argument is economics, right? Families are stretched and they can't afford any additional expenses because what we're saying to them is you're going to have to go out and buy reusable bags, probably. That's what you're going to have to do. I can accept the first part of this argument that families are stretched, but not the second part. Uh, I went online to find how much plastic bags, uh, reusable bags cost. Somewhere less than a dollar. I would suggest to you that any family would be willing to spend five, ten, fifteen dollars pizza with pepperoni, right, to ensure the health of their kids in the future. Um, I would also say, and it's been brought up before, that reducing this will help our waste stream. It will reduce demand for new landfill, which is a major issue in New Hampshire at the moment. And as I said, uh, even reduce, if you followed it, plastics in our lakes. Sideways. Last week, the governor said in, his, in one of his talks that we have the largest surplus we've had in the history of the state. He said, conservatively, we have a two to three hundred million dollar surplus. That's conservative, he said. Imagine, and this bill doesn't ask it, but just imagine for a moment if the state went out and bought a reusable bag at a dollar a bag for every citizen in this state, it would be one and a half million dollars, be 0.5% of his suggested surplus. What I'm trying to say is that I think this is a minor step, an important step to create awareness and to help our landfill and our future health. And thank you for your time and I'll take your questions. I've been in trouble before I recognize that. You know, those of us who used to get milk delivered to our houses before plastic bags didn't have to deal with these phones. That's all I'm trying to say. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, thank you for your testimony. I'm going to move on. To thank you. Because there are a lot of people that have requested to speak. Uh, Christina Dubin, is that right? Good morning, uh, Chair Dolan, uh, Vice Chair Piedmont, and members of the committee. My name is Christina Dubin. I am a volunteer secretary and campaigns coordinator for the New Hampshire chapter of the Surfrider Foundation. And our chapter has worked to address single-use plastic and packaging pollution in seacoast communities for well over a decade. Um, before I begin... Is your microphone on? I, it or is on. Do I make it lower? Yeah, no, just maybe speak in. Oh, lower. lean in. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so I'm here to ask for support of HB 1119, but before I um, begin on that, I just wanted to address the question about paper bags. Um, from my understanding, having p paper bags as well as plastic allows for perhaps adding a fee mechanism. So not just to outright get rid of them, but it would allow municipalities to add um, something like that. So, so not to get rid of them entirely, but perhaps to do something to incentivize um, behavioral change. So HB 1119 would basically just clarify current ambiguity regarding the inherent authority um, 
that municipal municipalities have to regulate waste from single use paper and plastic bags. And this is really important. Um, it's an important clarification of existing ambiguity in uh, 149-M. Um, and it has basically stalled local efforts uh, for municipalities to follow in the footsteps of Portsmouth to pass local laws to meet waste mitigation needs, which ultimately help to achieve the state's source reduction goals. What HB 1119 does not do is ask this committee or the state to make a decision about whether or not single use bags should be mitigated in any way, nor request any um, administration of solid waste regulations at the municipal level. It just simple, simply clarifies that ambiguity in 149-M um, for municipalities that, you know, for well over a decade have expressed this desire uh, to have local laws aimed at plastic pollution mitigation. Is that okay to go on? No, that, that's, your time is up. That was three minutes? That was two minutes. That was two minutes, okay. So you, can you wrap up in a sentence or two? Um, yes. Uh, so let me just see if I, um, I guess I'll just know, I just want to give one example of the kind of the ambiguity that's perpetuated. Um, in the past, our, our chapter uh, testified in support of Senator Martha Fuller Clark's SB 410 in 2016. And the committee, uh, Public and Municipal Affairs Committee at the time argued that it would be redundant stating that there's already inherent authority in our state solid waste regulations, so. Thank you for your testimony. Sure. Uh, Next, we'll hear from Simon Thompson from Concord. Mr. Thompson, feel free to sanitize the work area there. All right. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Simon Thompson. Uh, I'm with Sheen Finney Capital Group, and I'm here on behalf of one of our clients, the uh, New England Convenience Store and Energy Marketers Association, that's a mouthful. Uh, we go by Nexima, and we represent convenience stores, uh, not only in New Hampshire, but all, all throughout New England. Uh, in, here in New Hampshire, we have about 850 stores, um, roughly employing close to 14,000 people. I'm not gonna read this testimony. I have had it submitted to you folks online. Thank I think you. the one point I'm gonna make is we have experienced how bad this approach has worked in the state of Massachusetts. Um, where many of our members own several stores throughout different municipalities and lo localities, and we've just seen that this is very difficult to deal with and manage. So I'll leave it at that, answer any questions that folks may have, um, but I appreciate your time. Okay, thank you uh, for your testimony. I appreciate it. So next, we're going to hear from Curtis Barry from the Hampshire Retail Association. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you, and good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, I am Curtis Barry, here on behalf of the New Hampshire Retail Association. The New Hampshire Retail Association represents several hundred retailers in New Hampshire, both the national major chains and many hundred uh, small independent businesses. Uh, I'm here to oppose uh, this legislation. And my testimony is, is very brief uh, and to the point. Uh, the Retail Association is very wary of a trend that this bill may start, which is environmental regulation on a town-by-town -town basis. There are 234 municipalities in the state. This bill could set up a, a, a scheme where you're pitting one town against another in this and then potentially other environmental regulations. You folks are 400 strong in a small state with very small communities. and We think you're, you have the ability to decide uh, environmental regulations uh, on a statewide basis, which is more appropriate. Uh, one last point I, I think I'd like to make. There are more uh, reasons why uh, this bill uh, should not pass. It would be ineffective. For example, one town banning uh, plastic bags does not mean plastic bags don't enter the waste stream in their community. If I lived in Portsmouth, uh, I could shop in Newington where they might not ban the distribution of the single-use bags. Uh, bring them back into town. Uh, if I were visiting Hampton Beach, I could shop here in Concord, bring my uh, lunch in a plastic bag in Hampton Beach. Uh, responsible disposal is the, the solution. I think you'll probably hear more about that 
later this morning or during this hearing. Um, happy to answer questions to the best of my ability. Thank you for your testimony. Thank Appreciate you, sir. It. Next, we're going to hear from Kevin Daigle. Welcome, Kevin. You've got two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, I'll try my best. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'll try not to talk so fast here. Uh, my name is Kevin Daigle. I am the president of the New Hampshire Grocers Association. Uh, for those of you not familiar with us, and this doesn't count in the two minutes yet, right? Uh, <laughs> we are the organization that represents both chain and independent grocery stores, supermarkets, convenience stores, and their suppliers. Um, before I begin, uh, a couple of the first presenters doing their testimony had talked about environmental awareness. Um, I just want to get back to the bill itself is allowing towns to regulate the use of paper and plastic bags. So if passed, this bill would have many unintended consequences. As you're aware, New Hampshire is a Dillon Rule state, meaning that the state retains all powers which are not specifically granted to municipalities. It has been wise to maintain Dillon's rule as opposed to home rule, and for good reason. New Hampshire is a state of 234 cities and towns located in a very compact geographic area. Grocers do their best to attract customers from not only their own community, but from surrounding communities as well. As well. Now, imagine if this bill was passed, if suddenly a particular community instituted a ban or mandated a fee. These communities and grocers within those communities could see a migration of consumers to other towns. Now, through no fault of their own, other than being in the wrong community, businesses would lose commerce to businesses in other towns. By allowing towns to create their own rules, both retailers and customers would be faced with differing regulations from town to town. Grocers, like many other businesses, oppose a patchwork quilt of local ordinances. The immense complexity of operating in an environment of varying local laws increases customer confusion, and through high cost of compliance, unnecessarily increase the cost for all the parties. In addition to the confusion and complexities this creates for businesses, this bill sets a bad precedent. It provides an opportunity, if passed, for other issues to come forward seeking home rule for their cause, thus creating an even greater web of regulations that businesses and citizens just now need to navigate. For these reasons, we ask you to find the bill inexpedient to legislate, I thank you for your time and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. You made it within two seconds. Whew. Can I next? Here? We can if you want. Uh, Representative Van. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you uh, for the Grocers Association. So, would you support a statewide ban on, would the Grocers Association support a statewide ban on plastic bags? We would have to look at what those details look like and entailed. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for your testimony. We're now going to hear from Zachary Taylor. Feel free to use the Clorox to sanitize your area. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, Chairman, Vice Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Zachary Taylor. I'm the director of the American Recyclable Plastic Bag Alliance. We represent the U.S. manufacturers and recyclers of plastic bags. We oppose this bill for multiple reasons, most notably the complicated patchwork of local ordinances that it opens the door to. Um, we've heard from businesses in the community about why that's a bad idea, but I want to focus on a few other things that were raised this morning, notably the concerns about plastic bags and the environment. Data from the Environmental Protection Agency finds that plastic bags and sacks combined, all plastic bags and sacks, account for 0.3% of municipal solid waste. Plastic carryout bags targeted by this bill account for a fraction of that. Litter surveys from across the country consistently find that during litter cleanups, plastic bags account for less than 1% of litter. And data from the Ocean Conservancy finds that beach cleanup items, plastic bags account for a similar amount. What that means to say is that while efforts to ban plastic bags to address environmental concerns and advance sustainability, they will miss the mark because these products do not contribute meaningfully to these real issues. However, they do open the door to unintended consequences. Alternative bags are more expensive for businesses to procure, particularly paper bags. There's a national shortage of paper bags right now that is going to hurt small businesses distinctly who will lose the ability to access economies of scale in purchasing their carryout bags. Furthermore, bag fees also hit 
vulnerable families more severely. Research from the University of Ottawa on Toronto's bag fee found that lower socioeconomic families are more likely to be hit by these policies. But most importantly, I want to underscore, we're the first to say that if you don't need a bag, don't take one. We care deeply about sustainability. That's why we promote recycling in the store take back program that provides a pathway for plastic bags and films to be returned to the store and transformed into new products like bags, railroad ties, composite lumber, decking, and other similar applications. We believe that increasing recycled content, promoting recycling, and promoting consumer education around these issues is a better approach than bans that force consumers to use alternative bags that are both more expensive for them, but also have greater environmental impacts. Every life cycle assessment has found that comparing carryout bags, the plastic carryout bag when disposed of properly is the one with the fewest environmental impacts. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Representative Majapudi. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking my question. Um, don't you, um, in your facts or in your research, have you come across the fact that single-use plastic bags can cause uh, drainage obstruction or flooding, you know, in the drains because the easy with which they, if it's not properly disposed, um, can block the natural rain and flood uh, drains getting caught. Thank you for the question, Representative. I think, you know, it's important to note that plastic bags do not belong in the environment. We're the first to say that. Plastic bags should either be reused at home, they overwhelmingly are. Uh, research from Recy Quebec, the Recycling Authority in Quebec found that about 77% of plastic bags get reused for household chores like picking up after pets uh, or lining waste paper bins in the bathroom. So the idea that they're single use is, is sort of a misnomer. Um, also, it's important to recycle them. And as an industry, we want, we want to see more recycling. Uh, we were able to put out uh, a release last week that our members um, have met their recycled content goals for their products. So now that on average, every plastic retail bag manufactured by our members in the United States contains on average a minimum of 10% recycled content. We want to see those numbers continue to increase in future years and to help that, we've also partnered with a company called Stina on a new film drop-off recycling directory that's going to help consumers find where to take these products back to the store so they don't have to throw them out. They can actually recycle them in the store take-back program. Yeah, I have a question for you. Is our biodegradable plastic bags uh, an option? Uh, so, so it depends on, uh, sorry, thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it depends on what you mean by biodegradable. So there's multiple kinds of plastics. Most uh, plastics are compostable, and most of those compostable plastics require industrial composting. Um, what the life cycle assessments find is that the traditional plastic carryout bag, as long as it's disposed of properly, is the one with the least environmental impacts. And, and that's the one that a lot of consumers reuse, um, and a lot of consumers recycle. I'm sorry? A lot of consumers reuse and recycle the, the, the traditional plastic carryout bag. Well, thank you for your testimony. Um, next, I want to hear from uh, Mary Smith. I'm sorry? I have a question. Oh, yes, Ms. Representative Tripp. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, during your presentation, you identified uh, uh, several items that uh, these bags can be uh, uh, recycled into, basically products. Could you... Uh, Give us those products again, and not so fast. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the question, Representative. Um, so plastic bags, when they're returned to the store, are purchased by other companies to be turned into a variety of other materials, including new bags, um, railroad ties, composite lumber, composite decking, furniture. I think that was raised earlier, playground equipment and similar applications. There's continued research going on about other ways to reuse uh, these materials, recycle them, and, and avoid the use of, of virgin materials. Uh, there's new research coming out about using them as binder for asphalt and paving as well. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Thank you. We're going to hear now from Mary Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, the rest of the committee. Uh, it is not the purpose of the government to micromanage every aspect of the interaction between producers and consumers. Producers should be allowed to provide a low-cost way for consumers to carry their items to their cars and into their homes. To allow for towns to regulate how businesses interact uh, with the public in this way interferes 
unnecessarily with the market, which increases costs that businesses have to pay, and inevitably the businesses won't pay them, the consumers will pay them. States such as California have tried similar bills, which leads to more financial burdens being placed on businesses, especially small businesses. This burdensome regulation has no place in New Hampshire and impedes the whole live free or die spirit that makes the state so great. Um, any questions? Thank you for your testimony. Uh, have I called on Kevin Daigle yet? You had a chance to speak, okay. And last we have uh, some testimony from Representative Rosemary Run. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the committee. Um, I want to make clear, um, especially after the comments of the previous speakers, this isn't a ban on plastic bags. All this is is enabling legislations to let our towns and cities who have the cost and the responsibility of managing solid waste to make this decision. Uh, a similar bill that was a statewide ban came before the legislature about three or four years ago. I voted against that. Um, I don't believe in a statewide ban on this, but I do believe that we should enable our towns and cities to make the decisions that are best for them. I seriously doubt that if this bill passes that my town of Merrimack will, will, innate, will, will use it. Um, but I don't want to presuppose that what's good for Merrimack is also good for Littleton or Colebrook or Hampton or Portsmouth. This is simply letting our towns and, and cities who have the responsibility for solid waste management the ability to control it. Thank you. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Representative. Are there any questions for Representative Vaughn? Seeing none, thank you okay, very thank much. Thank you. Uh, thank you all uh, for enduring that, uh, that time, those time speeches. I'm sorry, but we just had to li limit some of the output. For, the, for this uh, particular bill, we had uh, 118 in support and 11 opposed. Is that mine? Okay. Thank you. That, that ends the hearing on House Bill 1119. The committee is going to take a break now. A lunch, or early lunch, and I ask you all to be back here at five minutes of 12, and we'll begin our next hearing on uh, 12.68. What? Five minutes of one. Five minutes of one. Five minutes of one. We still have 12.68 to do. You want you want to plow on and uh, and do the next hearing, or do you want to take a break? What's that? You want to keep going? All right. Okay, we're going to open the the hearing on House Bill 1268, which is limiting the authority for city council bylaws and ordinances. I'm sorry. Yes. Before we get started, should we uh, make sure that uh, hey, Diane's going to pull the, the corridor out there? Yeah, I just yeah, I did, right here. Yeah.
Okay, it looks like we are going to move forward with uh, House Bill 1268. Do I have uh, anyone that would like to introduce the bill? Please come on up. Welcome. Thank you very much, um, Chairman and members of the Municipal and County Committee. Uh, I realize that uh, you folks probably want to get to lunch. Um, so I'll be as concise as I possibly can. Um, there's a number of handouts that are going around, so um, I'll be very uh, concise. Uh, this, the issue this bill seeks to address is the overly broad, broad language in RSA 47 colon 17. It has come to everyone's attention that the cities of Keene, Portsmouth, Berlin, Lebanon, and Durham have passed townwide mask ordinances, all with different rules, and many with no quantitative expiration information. This has resulted in some confusion. Um, the language, which we will discuss later, I have an example for you. The language in this RSA can also be better defined to reflect our existing DHHS guidance regarding communicable communicable diseases to reference guidance from the New Hampshire Public Health Nuisance Task Force and to avoid conflicts with Dillon's rule. <clears throat> um, we can improve the consistency uh, with this bill that I have, uh, the amendment that I'm, that's being handed out right now um, in the language in this RSA. All items listed in the section of this RSA, 47, chapter 47, and in particular 47 colon 17, refer to local issues and nuisances. References to communicable diseases, viruses, contagions, uh, vaccines, personal health, etc., have been omitted because the state was uh, meant to take the lead on these issues pertaining to communicable diseases. Yeah. Um, it, as a uh, way of reference, um, that I have uh, found on the DHH website uh, under the health officers section, a PowerPoint by Philip Alex Alexa Kos, MPH, Chief of Environmental Health and Emergency Response, uh, who addressed uh, the city of Manchester about the rules. And um, it says, quote, New Hampshire DHHS has the responsibility to lead these efforts. This was in the communicable disease section of his presentation that can be found on the website. Uh, DHHS should lead the, the efforts with regard to communicable disease because viruses such as COVID-19 know no, no borders uh, and because DHHS has the epidemiologist and other staff who are better prepared than anyone else in the state to handle such problems um, on a uh, statewide level. And furthermore, because a townwide Town-by-town -town approach will only lead to a patchwork of confusing bylaws. Um, please see, if you may, the um, City of Portsmouth's directive. It says Public Health Directive on the top. And this is uh, taken from the City of Portsmouth website, um, where it is unclear whether this is a law, a bylaw, if it's been codified. Um, that has not been clear to me. I've reached out to this department uh, to get clarification. But as you see, if you flip it to the back, it is signed by a city employee. Uh, it's a health officer <clears throat> who is employed, not elected, by the people. And it is a ma mask mandate, as I understand. I tried to look this up on the, uh, there's some news articles about it. It's my understanding because the city of Portsmouth is still in the hearing process of this statute or this bill, this bylaw for the for the city, so um, I hope this is maybe the last time I ever see a directive or a bylaw that's um, posing as a law signed by a city employee. At the bottom, they have referenced the statute in forty uh, one forty seven colon one. Now that is meant to um, yeah, the health officers may make regulations, but it's supposed to be um, approved by the selectmen. 
to my knowledge that they are still in the hearings stage. So um, what this is exactly, I don't know, but it is confusion, I would say. Uh, okay. Also, please see the map that I've passed out, the, the, uh, the state of New Hampshire that I've taken off of our COVID-19 interactive dashboard. I've gone through and, and highlighted and outlined the cities that have mask mandates, <clears throat> just to show you that uh, there's nothing jumping out here that says that mask mandates works at work, and this isn't a, a testimony about whether masks work or not. I realize that's a whole other uh, issue, but I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything jumping out saying uh, that these cities have some sort of overwhelming advantage in the fight against um, transmission. Okay, so um, also, okay, so they may make any other bylaws. In the uh, bill itself, or in the uh, RSA, uh, the, the, the language that we're addressing is on line 16. They may make any other bylaws and regulations um, for the, which may seem for the well-being of the city. But they, they don't really mean any. Uh, because of Dylan's rule, um, this isn't really, it's, it's uh, ancient language from the year of 1846. The language is quaint, and attorneys will warn you about enforcing it due to constitutionality issues. Um, so if, if you read chapter 47 someday, and I hope you do, it's, it's full of all kinds of quaint language, um, including uh, giving cities... Uh, leeway to make, to regulate all kinds of, quote, all kinds of immoral and obscene conduct. <laughs> it's very broad. Um, but just uh, to read a little bit about Dylan's rule is a municipal corporation can exercise only the powers explicitly granted to them, um, those or those necessarily or fairly implied or incident to the powers expressly granted, those essential to the declared objects and purposes of that corporation not simply convenient, but indispensable, Dillon's rule states that if there is a reasonable doubt whether a power has been conferred to a local government, then the power has not been conferred. I would argue that the, there is a reasonable doubt. Um, so what I have done, and I hope uh, you like this, is um, I have clarified this. If you look in your uh, public health nuisance guidance document on page four, this is a great sort of study that was conducted in 2014 uh, by the, uh, you can see the list of all the different um, health officers, public health officials of the state. And it really, it really gives a lot of great, I emailed it to all the committee members because it's 22 pages. Um, and I have only printed out nine in the interest of saving trees. Um, but as you see on, it sort of goes into defining what a public health nuisance is, uh, because it is difficult, it's confusing. Um, on page four, um, it says at the top, first paragraph, the task force was interested in developing model language that could be used by cities and towns interested in developing stronger public health ordinances. So they did the study, and then at the bottom, where it says overview of public health nuisance, they sort of basically define it, uh, since I've noticed some people have, uh, are not sure whether a communicable disease is a nuisance. In general, a nuisance is defined as a condition, activity, or situation, such as a loud noise or a foul odor that interferes with the use an enjoyment of property, especially a non-transitory condition or persistent activity that either injures the physical condition of the adjacent land um, or interferes with the enjoyment of easements. Uh, and that is consistent with um, what we have heard uh, in our last testimony of the health officer bill, that it is related to local issues. Um, so I have, uh, I think you all have the amendment 
Um, and I think that I actually passed out all of the amendments to everybody, but I didn't keep one. Does anyone have? <laughs> um, so what I've done is taken that. Um, thank you. I've taken that um, definition and incorporated it, incorporated it into um, line 16 here, and it just now says they may make any other bylaws and regulations, and I crossed out, which may seem for the well-being of the city because it is, uh, of course, all the regulations are going to seem for the well-being of city, just for the sake of flow. <clears throat> they may make any other regulations and bylaws for the abatement of nuisances that interfere with the use and enjoyment of property to emphasize uh, that it pertains to the use of property, um, which by all measures is consistent with everything else that I've seen on the DHH website about nuisances and about the role of public health um, regulation within the city. So I think these changes are the responsible thing to do. I'm asking you to support the amendment. Last year we had a similar bill which eliminated uh, the regulation ability for cities to pass any bylaws at all. <clears throat> so I think this is a good compromise. It allows um, the ability of cities to make their own regulations pertaining to local issues as uh, they would like but it also clarifies and better defines the purview of public health uh, within city government. And it's consistent with the existing uh, DHHS guidance on uh, regulating and um, regulating public health, especially communicable diseases. Thank you very much. I think that's it. I have a question for you. Um, as I understand what you've done here, it, does, it seems like you're not objecting to the mask ordinance. You're objecting to the, to the fact that the community doesn't have the authority to implement a mask ordinance. Is that right? Uh, thank you, Chairman Dolan. Um, it, that is pretty much true. Um, I'm objecting to the idea of not just... The mask ordinance is sort of incidental to the larger picture um, of, you know, narrowly defining what cities and towns may do in keeping with Dillon's law, where you know, we're getting into the sort of slippery slope of, by, by um, interpreting this line of any, they may make any other bylaws. Well, we know that we can't allow, <laughs> you know, they, they shouldn't be making regulations about personal health or telling us what to eat or drink, for instance, uh, I think everyone would agree that maybe we shouldn't allow lockdowns or stay at stay at home orders. Um, so those are the so it's it's just sort of the responsible thing to do to to, to define it. Well, look at this map that you've uh, provided to us. Have you had a chance to sit with and discuss uh, those those communities that you've highlighted? Sit with their legal team to see. Uh, how they feel the legality of this is? Um, I have reached out to Portsmouth. I didn't get a call back. Um, I haven't um, reached out to, to all of, not all of the cities, um, say for instance Manchester and Concord don't have townwide, citywide mask ordinances. Um, I have reached out to um, Hanover and I just got dumped into the voicemail I think maybe they're just uh, here that it's about mask ordinances or something, and then they just... Okay, uh, so. other questions from the committee? Yes, Representative Klee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for taking my question. Um, the map that you show here, um, the I see that the date of it is 21022. Are you aware that um, what you show here is that at the beginning of Nashua's mask mandate, we were in significant um, high... Uh, surging, and we are getting better. So, uh, your your comment, would you not say that your comment that um, mask is not showing this is not necessarily accurate? 
Thank you for your question, Representative. Um, I s did not, uh, I, I put the date on there so that you know that it was, that was the date. And it's, it's the rate that's being, the rate per thousand is, is what I'm, what I, the, param the uh, parameters that we're using. So it was a random date. Um, and that is, it, it could be getting better. Follow up, sir? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, the, I'm trying to put this into a, a proper question. Um, if, if this did show that it was getting better, would you feel comfortable with um, changing your statement? Thank you for the question. Changing, changing my amendment? No, changing your statement. That, that this map showed that they're not working. So the, I'm just not sure if I understand the question. If we looked at the map today, no. I had commented prior that when the mass mandate was put in in January, or actually December, um, the numbers were per 100,000 were quite significantly higher than they are on 210. I have those numbers. Um, would you not say that your statement was not quite as accurate as you would hope? Um, thank you for the question. I, uh, I no, no, I would not agree with that because I'm, sh I'm sh simply showing you as a snapshot and saying that there wasn't anything that jumped out as overwhelmingly showing that the cities with mass mandates, not, not the state as, as overall, and don't forget, uh, some of them are in various degrees. They've um, had mass mandates last winter. They took them away. They put them back. I think that was uh, Hanover that did that. I'm not sure about the other ones. And I haven't done a, a great study of whether or not they uh, show promise. And it, it's quite complicated, the science and the data. That's, that's all. Um, and I'm not an expert for sure. I'm I not agree. going Thank to claim you. to be. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking my question. My question is simple in terms of your bill, uh, 1268, is trying to take away the local control, flip it around, and say state has more control over the local ordinance. Is that true? Thank you for your question, Representative. Um, well, what, what I said was that we have Dillon's rule in the state, which preempts any state city rule. Um, we all automatically, the way we're set up, have the control. The legislature has the control to make the laws. And this ordinance is, is really just, I consider it housekeeping to better define. I, I'm not taking away anything because they already have all the abilities that they need to regulate all the public nuisances that they so choose. If you read the entire chapter of 47, it covers just about everything, including um, making playing cards illegal and, and regulating um, candle makers uh, all the way back to 1846. Plus, in, in other sections of the RSA, there's all kinds of regulations. This This only would define what kind of regulations they can pass. Um, and that is, that's all. It's just a better definition. Thank you. Representative Lasalas? Oh. Yes. Thank you for taking my question. I uh, looked at the, uh, the directive from the city of Portsmouth and uh, I see that there is a paragraph that says a face covering is not required for a person with a medical or developmental condition, and you're not required to produce documentation. Now, I am a person who has what's termed a cleft palate, okay? It makes it harder for me to breathe. So I am not covered by any sort of mask mandate. The problem for me to go into a city 
that has a mask mandate is that I personally have to uh, tolerate the scorn and the bad looks that I get uh, from that. Would your bill prohibit the uh, me getting that scorn going into a, a municipality that requires a mask mandate. Thank you for your question, Representative Lasalles. Um, so this this bill would prohibit cities from making mask mandates. Yes, uh, or any mandate uh, pertaining to communicable diseases, which would be the purview of DHHS. So, technically, possibly the governor or uh, at the state level, we could pass ma mass mandates. So I can't say for certain that um, that it would never happen, <laughs> but it would would allow it to happen at a state level rather than a city by city level. Thank you, Representative. Please. Uh, thank you, and, and my question will be quick. You, you, you mentioned something that kind of triggered when you said the governor. Um, the governor has actually come out and said that whatever the municipalities felt was necessary for the health of their, um, could, could in fact do mask mandates and so on. He has not prohibited it. He said that he would not do it statewide. Um, so would this prohibit him from saying that? Or any other future governor, I apologize. Thank, thank you, Representative. Um, he did. He he did say that uh, the governor. I believe that I don't know whether that was after or before he, as you recall, did pass a sort of mask mandate for the state at, for, in a limited way at one time. So I imagine that he could do that again. Um, I am not. Uh, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, he could. I don't see why he couldn't do it again. Follow-up, sir? Yes. It, um, he, he did it after he stopped his, the, the statewide mandate and, and then basically allowed the states to do it. My question to you is, would this prohibit him from, without regulation, stating Oh. Any municipality, as he has done presently, any municipality can invoke um, a, a, something of a mandate, of a mask mandate or, or something like that for the health of their citizens. If, the, if I understand the question, thank you, uh, Representative, would this prohibit the governor from saying that a city can do this? Um, I believe... This would put the onus on the state or the legislature uh, to to deal with it at a state level, and it would. I don't see how, uh, unless there's there's something more to the to the to the regulation, but it would it would stop that from yes. Just one quick follow up, and I apologize, sir, just for okay, clarification. One, one, one more. Okay, and and I apologize to you too. I I don't mean to to keep, keep asking you this. Um, oh my God, it just went out of my head. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, you said that it would not, so if this were to happen in um, October, November, when the um, legislation is not in, in session, they would have to call an emergency um, meeting in order to be able to pass something like that. Is that your intention? Um, thank you for the question, Representative. Um, is it my intention that the state go and, and call for an emergency legislative session? No. I, I don't think uh, that would be a, probably something that they would do. Um, so, no, they would not do that. But, um, at, at, you know, to, on, a, on a side note, uh, a governor can, can say that they... They wish that people would wear masks or to, to maybe publish some, uh, some more guidance. Uh, they could certainly publish guidance. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative, for taking my question. And I apologize if you addressed this already. I, I, I might have been shuffling paper at the time. So my question is specific to your amendment. And I'm just trying to understand, for the abatement of nuisances that interfere with the use or enjoyment of property, my question is about the word property. Is that personal property and municipal property? Is that all the property of the town? I just want to be clear on, what, on how you define the word property there. Thank you. Um, I believe, thank you for your question, Representative. Um, when, a, when a word is not defined in an ordinance, I, my understanding is that the common uh, use of the term it applies. So um, for the use and enjoyment of property, I, it certainly uh, pertains to private property because when you're discussing nuisances and um, health officers and regulations, they're often dealing with uh, private property and dispute, disputes between, part, you know, landowners. Um, yeah, I don't see why it wouldn't apply to public property. Any, any further questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Mr. Grays. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Nate Grace for the New Hampshire Municipal Association. We oppose the bill as written, as well as the amendment. Um, the, the amendment does address a number of our concerns with the bill as written. Um, as I, it's very similar to a, a bill previously heard by this committee relating to the authority of local health officers for towns um, and uses terms like uh, presenting a clear and present danger as well as uh, limiting the, the time period for an ordinance for a certain period of time. Um, as I explained in that prior hearing, we think that's inappropriate. I believe it's the sponsor's intent that the amendment would replace the entire bill, or at least the problematic language, um, and therefore I would like to address my comments towards that. Um, first, I'd like to note that under RSA 4717 Roman uh, 14, there's already a provision that allows cities to abate and remove nuisances. So uh, this, to, to the extent that this language uh, proposed today, the abatement of nuisances that interfere with the use or enjoyment of property would be added, that would be duplicative of what currently exists and may in fact restrict it to uh, specific property rather than however nuisances uh, are interpreted. Um, and the way nuisance, nuisance is interpreted at the moment um, is it really has to be um, clearly defined. And so uh, if I can use the city of Nashua as an example, um, they have a very uh, robust process in order to enact some sort of local regulation. Um, so if it's something that a health officer would propose, um, they would you know, have to f write up the, the wording and find a reason for it. it would, they'd have to find a sponsor on the city council the city council would debate that before putting it into action. Um, and so you have all these sorts of local checks. Um, obviously, there would be opportunity for the public to address the city council and express their opinion on the matter, um, flush out any issues that might arise that might not be foreseen by uh, the uh, local officials working on this. Um, and so we are concerned that this would take away local authority. Um, I did just put out a question to our members about, you know, what, what specifically does this provision in the law, uh, has it been used for in the past? Um, there are a couple of cases on it. Um, and really the cases are, well, the law has changed slightly since, since the first case, which is Dover News Inc. versus City of Dover, 117 NH 1066 from 1977, which saw the City of Dover regulate the display of adult books and magazines at a newsstand. Um, the law has changed slightly. There is now a provision that uh, under 4717 Roman 13 that allows that type of regulation specifically. Um, and this provision was also mentioned in the case State versus Lilly. Um, I don't have the New Hampshire citation, but the uh, regional citation is uh, 204A3D198, 2019, which saw the city of Laconia 
regulate uh, topless female sunbathers. Um, and that is, uh, and there's now a provision in the law that specifically addresses that as well. I'm not sure if that was in, in place as well beforehand. Um, but in any case, um, really this provision of law by and large has been used as supplement, supplementary authority. Um, 4717 covers a huge range of things that cities are allowed to, to deal with. They really are things that you would, that just kind of the average citizen would think of calling their local officials about. So it's not something they would logically think about calling a state official about. It's something they would call the city about and assume the city has the power to regulate. You know, trees on roads, snow plowing, et cetera. All of that's covered under 4717. Um, the one area where it may be the case that this provision stands alone um, is something like dealing with, uh, in, in the health context, is some, something like dealing with uh, mosquitoes. Um, so for example, Concord and Manchester have similar provisions. Um, I learned this morning dealing with mosquitoes and um, standing water. So obviously if you have standing water, mosquitoes can breed there. Um, so they have ordinances in place to try to limit the amount of standing water around the city, um, and in particular to some places like junkyards, which see a lot of things like tires that collect the standing water. And in this, in the region uh, between Concord and Manchester, they're dealing with um, kind of a, a seasonal outbreak of the Jamestown, Jamestown Canyon virus and some other viruses spread by mosquitoes, obviously limiting the number of mosquitoes available limits the probability of that spreading. Um, uh, Salem, uh, using its, its provisions as a, a, a council, um, has a, uh, a provision that requires testing of private wells when new homes are constructed to ensure that they provide safe water to the inhabitants. There's currently no state provision on that. So that would cover things, and I'm not sure exactly how, how much that covers, but that could cover something like testing to see the level of PFAS or the level of lead or arsenic, um, et cetera, and having that disclosed to new homeowners who would then presumably be able to negotiate with the builder and ensure that the water is safe to drink. Um, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Uh, we're going to take a break in just a few minutes. Could I ask you to hold? hold for us to leave? Absolutely. Before you leave? Absolutely. Any questions for the NHMA? Yes. Jim. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Grace, for taking my question. Um, if House Bill 1272, as amended, were to pass, giving health officers the uh, right for, uh, to, to deal with nuisances, and House Bill 1268, as amended, were to pass, giving the City Council the same authority to abate for nuisances, God bless you, would we have a conflict or would we have confusion about whose authority or who has the authority, Health Officer or City Council? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, you would certainly have a duplication of who has that authority. Um, it, it gets a little complex in how these relate. Um, but again, if I can go back to my example of the city of Nashua, typically the health officer themselves aren't making regulations in a city context. Typically they're doing it through um, the city council's process. Um, so I'm not that concerned about the, any sort of conflicting language between those two. Um, I would add, however, we, we also object to the amendment on 1272. Any other comments? Yes, Representative Mitch Pudding. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Grace, for taking my question. My question is, um, how does this flip the state versus local control, and how would it jeopardize local control? Well, Representative, I think you had it exactly right earlier when you asked the sponsor that this does take away local control. Um, you know, local authorities are granted a limited yet broad grant of power in certain areas simply because we can't anticipate the issues that are going to come up. Um, the, the two case examples I, I came up with, probably not something that the legislature thought about ahead of time until it was an issue. 
Um, and this just gives municipalities the option to deal with that. And of course, the check is that the next session, the legislature comes in and decides whether that was dealt with appropriately. Follow up. Follow up. Thank you. Um, and is it not true that we are the pandemic? This is the first time we have had a pandemic, at least since I've lived in here for a few decades. And uh, so, you know, to change something that not knowing if you're going to have another pandemic or not, wouldn't that mute the uh, local control? I, thank you for the question. So I, I guess to paraphrase what the governor's comments were, as far as I understand them, at his several Thursday afternoon briefings that I watched where he addressed the issue, um, he believed it was appropriate to deal with this at the local level with regard to the masking because local conditions are different. So someplace like, you know, Hanover, obviously it's the center of Dartmouth-Hitchcock, large hospital, you know, you don't want doctors getting sick during a, health out, uh, during a health crisis. You need them to care for the populace more broadly, but you might not have that same kind of concern, you know, outside that immediate area. So a few towns away, it might not be appropriate. Um, it might not be something that, that is, and I think that towns have used um, their authority very judiciously and had public, quite a lot of public comment, I can tell you, because I've heard about it, um, and made decisions based on what the people of their municipality want. Any, any additional questions for the HMA? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from Christina Dubin. Did I pronounce your name correctly? You did, Dubin, right? Yes. All right. Good morning again, Chair and committee members. Uh, just to reintroduce myself, my name is Christina Dubin. I am volunteer secretary and campaigns coordinator for the Surfrider Foundation New Hampshire chapter. And I also have the privilege of living in Portsmouth. So our chapter is opposed to HB 1268. Um, the goal of this bill is identical to multiple bills before it, including HB 439, which failed last session. And it seeks, of course, to limit the scope um, of city councils it takes aim at strengthening RSA 4717, but does so in an unreasonable and overbearing manner by adding a time period of 10 days and increasing the limitation of the scope of authority to, quote, locations that present a clear and present danger to the city, end quote. The state, of course, would be sought after to resolve many issues that required an extended time period beyond those 10 days. And it would create a need to arbitrate every instance of what constitutes that that uh, clear and present danger. We have 234 municipalities and 25 unincorporated places that vary in their demographics, economics, culture, and geography. And so it's necessary for local governments to maintain their current authorities to make timely decisions in response to unique situations which arise in their communities. It's of course already provided by statute that local policy must not directly contradict the state constitution or laws. And so attempting to require explicit authority for all municipal matters is really creating an undue burden for all, all, every level of government and also on the liberties of New Hampshire people. There's plenty of examples where municipalities are afforded inherent authority to carry out ordinances under their respective RSAs. And I'll just give you a few examples um, to add to the ones already given. Workforce housing ordinances under RSA 674-58. Also within zoning and planning, inherent authority is given in land use boards. And the last example I'll offer is, of course, within 149-M, which we just heard about uh, with Bill HB 1119. Um, in that regard, municipalities have existing authority to regulate solid waste and therefore inherent authority to classify specific items within the state's definition. And clarity there is needed because there is a demonstrated need to resolve ambiguity. But by modifying our state law in a sweeping manner, as HB 1268 would do, again, just causes unnecessary and burdensome, burdensome oversight um, really onto every single letter of local law where that is just not needed. It would bog down the state, local governments, and citizens with the minutia of municipalities 
and it ultimately just demonstrates a lack of confidence in local government. Um, I'll just end by saying it would also cost the state more money, which uh, we really don't have to spend. So I just urge the committee, as it has done in the past, to vote this bill ITL. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions at this point? Seeing none, thank you so much. Thank for you. I know it's lunchtime, so I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, so at this point, we're going to come. I'm sorry. Can you fill out one of these uh, pink I cards? Well, come on up. Uh, I, just, I just don't have it. Apologies for the uh, confusion. Just, uh, we're not taking the uh, Department of uh, Health and Human Services isn't taking a position on this particular bill. We want to talk about the bill and, and some of the concerns that we had. Um, the most recent version of the bill, which I got last night, that um, basically removes um, uh, anything which uh, seems uh, for the well-being of the city and then adds in the abatement of nuisances that interfere with the use of the enjoyment of the property. Um, at this time, the ESO understands the sponsor wants to make the law consistent uh, between towns and cities and so has added this reference to specific nuisances. Um, the only concern is the bill eliminates a phrase uh, which seems for the well-being of the city and replaces it with the abatement of nuisances at a specific property. Um, and they had the discussion a little while ago about a property. It can be private property. It can be the self. It can be public property. It might even be shared media, um, like air, water, things of that sort. Um, and I think the change really is that um, it shows kind of originally the well-being of the city is about the people. And I think the change makes it kind of more about the location, the nuisance of a particular property. So I just wanted you to be aware that, that that's a change. Um, uh, and we may be more interested in protecting the health officers are about the population that they control, not control, that they protect um, and manage it. Um, DHHS doesn't see a significant impact on public health from this change or restriction to creating a health code. Um, uh, as I say, we're not sure exactly what it would create, but we're not seeing a significant problem at this time. Um, you know, we want to give health officers and support them in being able to do their job, sometimes as broad authority. Um, we don't know what the next hazard or nuisance is going to be. Um, and we want to assure health officers who are on the ground and really see what's happening in their own cities, understand, know their neighbors, have the ability to do that. So I'm happy to take any questions you have specific about these changes or about uh, could, the law. Could you state your name for the record? Yes, Matthew Cahillane from New Hampshire uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Can you get that, John? You don't have a card. I have a question. Uh, go ahead. Um, I just you don't have position or you're opposing or supporting? We're not taking a position. We're just providing information today. Okay, seeing no further uh, questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Can you repeat what you said about the, um, sorry here, I'm hiding behind the chair. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, can you repeat uh, what you said about the um, this is co covering particular property or particular buildings and places. And you mentioned something about not air or water supply or something like that. Can you explain, yeah. can you repeat what you said? Yeah, yeah, let me try to describe the difference between um, the original law um, as it currently is, which may seem for the well-being of the city, right? So when I think of the city, I think of the population of the city and all of its environments, things of that sort. Um, that's being changed to abatement of nuisances that interfere with the use or enjoyment of the property. And as we discussed, somebody mentioned they thought that property really was talking about either private property, the self-property, public property, and it may include media, right? It could Property could be viewed as air, water, waste, things of that sort, the way we look at it, because things can move between those, right? Pests can move and infections can move, odors and other things can move between those. So I was just trying to get a broad picture of all the different types of property. I feel like most things are property and could be managed. Um, there are things that aren't necessarily nuisances. Um, uh, uh, Nate Gray's mentioned uh, the issue of arboviral disease and the need to remove standing water, right, stagnant water. Well, there's no risk there yet, right? There's no nuisance there yet. There's just a, um, a media which could grow those eggs of the mosquitoes and spread them. So is that a nuisance or not? I don't know. Would a health officer be able to would be they be able to control that based on the definition of it not being a nuisance? Those are some of the concerns that DHHS has. Thank you. 
Okay. Uh, seeing no further questions, and thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. It just as a point of interest, uh, a little discussion earlier about pandemics. The, uh, the, the previous pandemic we had, the most, the most previous, was the, was the uh, 1918 pandemic, where about one-third of the world's population died. And, uh, and, there was some, and before that, there was something called the Black Death. I'm not all that familiar with that. Yeah. Okay, so, so we're going to take uh, a break, and I'd ask you, to, all the committee members, be back here at 1 o'clock. Thank you.
Okay, in just about a minute, I'm going to start up. If you don't mind, I'm going to sit here because it's one more get up and sit down I don't have to do on these old knees. You want to introduce the, the first bill? Okay. Okay, let's get started. Welcome to the Municipal and County uh, Committee meeting. We are at a, had a full morning of uh, work sessions, and we're going to finish up with all work sessions this afternoon. Uh, and we're going to start with HB uh, 1293. Um, so let me invite Representative Rizzullo to begin the, the testimony. 1289, I'm sorry. You scared me for a minute. <laughs> but then again, at my age, you can be in places and not know where you are. <laughs> so <laughs> the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, my name is Andy Renzullo. I represent Hudson and Pelham, Hillsborough District uh, 37. I also chair the Resources, Recreation, and Development Committee. I'm introducing House Bill 1289. An act relative to the applications for abatements and authority to abate prior year's taxes for certain homeowners. Yeah. Actually, really what the bill is, if you read the analysis, the bill provides for a good cause for a tax abatement under RSA 7616 shall, uh, shall include allowed recreational use of OHRVs on class 5 and class 6 roads. I kind of wish that that analysis had been in the title. You'd had a lot more people to sh uh, show up to testify. But then maybe that, you know, you'd have needed a, a you'd have needed a bigger room. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I wish uh, well, the purpose of this bill is to provide some equitable relief for those who have lost a significant part of the use and enjoyment of their home due to actions of government local and state. The issue is two conflicting activities. A high impact noisy recreational activity and a quiet residential activity. Let's step back a few decades. Some of us can recall when vehicular recreation in the wild areas was very limited. Many, maybe some dirt bikes or dune buggies, but they weren't prolific and limited to private property. Then along came the ATVs and with them the pressure to use them on trails in the, in the summer like snowmobiles are used in the winter. We, it used to be that the OHRV, which is the off-highway recreational vehicle, uh, was used on trails either in, on state land or on private land with permission. Then we opened Jericho State Park which was dedicated to OHRV use. And the people came, the sport became more popular, very popular. The types of vehicles grew, including four seat dune buggies, types for the whole family. And when, then the great idea, connect all the trails so you can have 1,000 miles of trails, ride the wild. But you had to connect all these trails. How about letting them on a few public roads? But it was only a few public roads at first. But then, as, some, uh, as someone could see the economic potential of letting all the riders there coming in to spend their money in, come on in, spend their money in town. Other roads were open to OHRV traffic by local officials. 
class five and class six rows. And we're not talking about small numbers. So now we have a high impact recreational use impacting on, low Im on a low impact residential use. Consider this. When did public roads become recreational areas? They're not. They're for transportation only. There are those behind me who can speak from personal experience on the impacts of this clash. As a freshman, this was my first committee in Esplanade County. If I learn nothing else, I learned that a person's home really is their castle. And as legislators, that, that should be where we stand. Looking back, the legislature messed up. The piecemeal expansion of OHRV use never involved, to my knowledge, the one committee, one committee proficient in the knowledge in the, in, of the use of land. Things like zoning, powers of local government and government officials, conflicting land use, and yes, abatements. That means this committee. I think municipal and county needs to be part of this solution. I recall this scene in the movie Die Hard where Bruce Willis's character, uh, in order to gain attention of the police car, sent to investigate what was going on in the, uh, in the tower. He, uh, he eventually ends up throwing a body of the terrorist onto the hood of the, of the police car, and all of the machine guns of the terrorists open up. And Bruce Willis says in the famous line, welcome to the party, pal. Well, welcome to the party. I think we, you, we really do need municipal and counties expertise in this matter. And I speak as the chair of resources. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Let's uh, have uh, Wayne Moynihan. Oh, I'm sorry. You want to have uh, questions for the uh, representative? Yes, uh, Representative Ron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Representative Renzula. It's such a pleasure to have you come to municipal and county government. Um, I have a question. Uh, Homes that are on rail trails, is, would those be included in this, um, in this bill? Uh, only to the fact that uh, they've, they have been opened by the selectmen. To, 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 but if they're, if they're not class five or class six roads, they would not be uh, part of this bill. Now, uh, there's, uh, there's uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, committee uh, know the you know what class five and class six roads are. I, I can talk to that if there's a, anyone needs to know or well, doesn't know. Yeah, um, would you please describe that? Thank you, okay. Representative. Well, ba there there is a statute on roads. Bas basically, the class five roads are town. The general town road, road uh, the paved road, uh, the town maintains it. Class six roads are not maintained by the town. Uh, they're, they, uh, they used to be called dirt roads, and, uh, but uh, they are roads that are not maintained by the town, but there are people who do live on them. Uh, and uh, they, they, in order to, to fix those roads, they, they need a permission of the town. Follow up. Mr. Chair? Yes, one more. Okay, thank you. Um, so what about homes that are on maybe a state road and maybe the town has allowed or the state has allowed OHRVs to travel on that road to get to, uh, you know, to kind of as a connector to another OHRV trail? Um, certainly those homeowners, I would think, would be subjected to the same noise and dirt and particulate matter um, generated from OHRVs. Um, why are they not included in this bill? Uh, I, I, actually, they should. They, people have asked me to uh, include it or uh, uh, to amend it, uh, and I would not be uh, adverse to that. I, I chose class five and class six uh, to start because that's the 
that to me is the low hanging fruit. Okay, thank you. Representative Guthrie. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your, your uh, testimony. Uh, in the uh, act, it says authority to abate prior year taxes, and I'm not that familiar as why why that's even in the act. Is it just the way it's written up by uh, those who write up our, our laws, or what? <laughs> You got it. That's ex that's that is the way it came from the. Uh, they that's the way they wrote it. So there's nothing in here that uh, allows abatement back for back years. Uh, not to my knowledge. That's not. That's not the. They put it this way. That is not my intent. Right. Thank you, Representative Maggiore. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Um, the town of Northampton that I represent is is right now trying to figure out a, a noise ordinance. Uh, that's going to the ballot. And, and of course, that raises questions about what's noise to me, what's noise to you. I'm just curious, how do you envision any kind of uh, a, a process by which I'm going to be aggrieved? Is it noise? Is it volume? Or is that clearly left up to the Board of Selectmen? Well, as the the no, well, noise the noise ordinances are uh, very difficult to enforce. I think what you uh, what you're going to really for abatement purposes, it has to be the effect on the uh, on the the homeowner. Uh, it, there's a there's obviously a big difference between one OHRV going by and a hundred. Or 200, and that's one of some of the issues that have uh, driven this. But I think the way the way it is written, it is a uh, it is a, a, a you know it is a cause of uh, you know it, it is a something that is now uh, an, uh, something that would be an abate available for abatement now, as opposed to it just being blown off. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Um, on the similar uh, line, noise and also emission, has you know, have you considered emission pollution in terms of the number of OHRVs uh, and how the impact on the residential well, area? See, the, the the amount of dust and the amount of uh, pollution. Uh, and the the actual impact of these vehicles are pretty well known, and the uh, so they just the, they're being avail being uh, in an area, and they're being the trails being used uh, actually are it's pretty easy to uh, de determine what they will. What they can and and uh, can't do, uh, as far as the environment, uh, we're we're talking like I said, the folks behind uh, me will be able to speak better to that, as to what the impacts actually how they how it affects people who actually live there. Yes, Representative Lasella. Thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Um, I live on Route 3A in Litchfield, which uh, I have to live fairly close to the road. There are no uh, ATVs that go in front of my house. What I do have is a lot of motorcycles go up and down Route 3A because it's a very scenic road and uh, the, uh, the, it's not a toll road or anything like that. Now, the motorcycles really produce a lot of noise, a lot of noise. I also am a rider of a side-by-side -side ATV. It's one of the most pleasurable things that I have left in, in the world. I have hand controls on it, so I don't need to use my legs. Now, we have a place in Coas County where I ride this. Now, there's 
a lot of ATVs up there because we live right on the trail. But the noise that is produced by the ATV is much less than the noise produced by motorcycles, particularly Harley-Davidson motorcycles. Now, my question of you is for assessors and selectmen who are trying to quantify some sort of abatement, how would they, how would they go about doing that? I think the very fact that a high impact area, a high impact recreational use, and that's what these these vehicles, in a, especially in mass, consist of. I mean, uh, they, by the very fact and what they what is known to produce. Will was is should be sufficient. Now, in your case, you're on a trail. You're not on a class six road or a class five road. It's much different. There's much different, especially if you're on a class six road, which in in effect is a very fragile road, and most of the homes uh, on it are fairly close to it. So it's they are the a bunch of this is situational, but I think by the fact that you have this build this area that your area where your home is has been determined to allow these, which they're uh, this have heavy impact use, uh, is should be sufficient to warrant. An abatement. Uh, you, you live on Route Three A. That's that is a probably a class, uh, probably a class two or three because it says a secondary. Yeah, it's a secondary state road. That's made for heavy heavy vehicles. Uh, that's made for a, a, the higher traffic. Uh, that 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 is not covered by by this, of course. Okay. Representative Justin. You, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, I didn't hear you. Uh, thank you again for being here, and I can imagine you almost feel like you're sitting in front of a bunch of selectmen, <laughs> which you are. I happen to be. <laughs> it, it seemed to me, uh, would you believe, not would you believe, is not a, a fact that when they value homes, that they take a lot of things into consideration. And the value of those homes in the area that you're talking about would be impacted by the situation you talk, you're talking about. Their saleable value would be impacted. I would suggest to you that uh, wouldn't you think this would be better uh, taken care of in ass assessing the value of the house as assessed instead of trying to go into the back door with an abatement? I don't quite understand. In the, uh, you I'm mean, sorry. Uh, maybe I better put it clearer. Isn't it better to leave the value of the house that's impacted by this condition to determine what the uh, tax will be instead of going into the back door and after the fact putting a, an abatement on that same property who has been valued and taken into consideration the plus and minuses of the neighborhood? Well, most of the time, aren't the evaluations of a house of properties made uh, kind of in mass by the by the assessing uh, by the assessing authority, and uh, you know, they don't dig into the uh, that much into the uh, uh, the siting of uh, of the of the houses. Usually, they just go by comparative values. Things of that nature. So uh, I, I don't think they that, an, or, uh, just a, just using the assessment, alone, is uh, would be sufficient for to to make restitution. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for the representative? Seeing none. Thank you, representative. Thank you.
We'll now go to uh, Wayne Monahan. Welcome, Mr. Monahan. And feel, please feel free to use the uh, disinfectant if you uh, so desire. That mic turned on? There you go. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, it is with um, gratitude towards Representative Renzullo, Representative Gould, and Representative Gottling for their introduction and sponsorship of House Bill 1289 that I've traveled down here today to express support for this proposed amendment to the New Hampshire taxation statutes. As you folks are aware, passage of this bill will create an opportunity for a fair and just property tax abatement for affected properties when the government allows town roads or highways to be used as trails by off-highway recreational vehicles. The proposed amendment makes such an allowance to be good cause for a property tax abatement under RSA 7616. 7616 already allows for consideration of back taxes. That's already in the statute. Gives that option to selectmen. This bill would not affect that wording of RSA 7616. All this bill does is add a, under the good causes allowed, the fact that the selectmen and the state have designated town roads as open OHRVs. When town roads become OHRV trails, they become a detrimental nuisance in the vicinity of residential neighborhoods and, and other properties in a town. I recognize that motorcycles are noisy as well, but motorcycles are subject to a noise ordinance, believe it or not. There is a limit to how loud a motorcycle can legally be in the state of New Hampshire. Law enforcement doesn't enforce it, because they have to buy sound measuring devices and it's expensive for towns to acquire that, those things. And so a law officer may hear one go by that is offensive, but it doesn't have the tools or the means or the time to deal with it. I have served as a state representative in recent years past and it's good to be back among you and grateful for your volunteering service here. But while I served up until 2020, I received a great many phone calls and letters from constituents throughout my district, which was Co-Ops District 2, as well as from residents of the city of Berlin and co and all over co County. These calls and letters emanated from the stress caused by on-highway use of off-highway recreational vehicles. The use of the roads puts the trails in close proximity to people's homesteads. Those who contacted me too often related distressful stories and described objectionable levels of noise, dirt, fumes, dust, disrespect, road damage, and trespass, all coming about by the OHRVs using the town's public ways. That is not to say that everyone who rides an OHRV is an evil person, but there is no enforcement of these vehicles except the occasional opportunity for a fishing game officer to drive up from the south to serve a weekend in Coas. And occasionally the Coas County Sheriff will independently fund some effort to regulate these devices. You'll appreciate that while traveling on town roads in proximity to residential properties, these ORHRVs do not have and are not required to have the safety equipment mandated by the DMV rules of the road for vehicles that travel on public roads. These vehicles are not equipped with substantial noise mufflers and are not required to by state regulation. They come as produced in the factory without mufflers. And they will complain if you seek to impose a muffler because if you put a muffler on one of these engines, supposedly they can't carry as many people. 
These, me these machines have become huge. They carry four people at a minimum. They're much louder than the old tricycle ATV you might recall, or the little OHRVs you see young people that used to use and look like so much fun. I'm sure the big ones are fun also, but they're not the same machines that existed in the early start of this sport. OHRVs generate a noise level that is between 90 and 100 decibels. Examples of this noise level are jackhammers, rock concerts, monster truck shows, car races, and helicopters or jets taking off and landing. It is a medical fact that hearing loss is possible from sufficient exposure to noise levels of 100 decibels. Ironically, a local city that prohibits Jake braking for large trucks because they want to keep the noise down allow unmuffled OHRVs on the city streets. Furthermore, OHRV trails are open from dawn to dusk. The season opens in May and generally closes around October 31st. These are the best six months of the year in New Hampshire for enjoyment of one's yard and property. People report having to yell at each other to carry on a conversation on a front porch. Windows on the roadside of the, their houses cannot be opened during the summer months due to noise and dust. The affected citizens use, uh, use and enjoyment of their property is substantially diminished under these conditions when the Selectmen and Bureau of Trails declare these roads to be trails. Please consider that it's the current taxation policy of New Hampshire that the value of a property with a pleasant view can be taxed at a higher value than a similar property without such a view. As a result, the tax liability on such a property is higher due to that special positive circumstance, sometimes called a view tax. Doesn't it follow that a special negative circumstance should allow a lower tax liability? Properties impacted by having the adjacent roadways become OHRV trails are burdened by an unwelcome nuisance rather than benefiting from something like a valuable view. Given the noise, dirt, dust, fumes, and other detriments generated by proximity to such trails on town roads, it is simply fair and just to recognize the burden and loss of value. As House Bill 1289 proposes, such an effective property should be eligible for an abatement for good cause, and then allowed to be taxed at a lower amount due to special circumstances if the other requirements of the law are met. By way of anecdote, I have spoken with at least one citizen in the North Country who's been informed that his taxes are higher than others in his area because of the value added for the truly pleasant view from his home. However, now, all summer long, he suffers daily waves of OHRVs, documented at over 780 OHRVs in a day. Divide that by eight hours, and that's more than 80 OHRVs an hour. Some days, they're in the hundreds, traveling on the pond side road where he lives. The circumstance, this circumstance was created because the town selectmen in the New Hampshire Bureau of Trails have made that road into an OHRV trail. The property owner was informed that while he pays extra for the view, he may get no abatement for the noise, dirt, dust, and disruption caused by the road becoming a trail. So because of the impact on the quiet enjoyment and value of these citizens' property, caused by the public policy that permits these roads to become trails, it has only failed to afford the property owner on such roads the opportunity to petition for a tax abatement with good cause. Uh, I hope you'll give this idea a positive hearing and send it to the floor of the House for a positive vote. It will be well received by the people who suffer from these circumstances. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. You're seeking uh, the ability to apply for an abatement, which will lower the taxes for the property owner. Um, 
What um, what benefit does the that property owner that's dealing with the noise and the dust and so forth get uh, other than financial? Uh, Unless the legislature tells selectmen and uh, the Bureau of Trails that they can't make class five and six roads into trails, the property owner would get no other relief the, other than a bit of compensation for the harm they suffer as a result of having this nuisance created by government for whatever reasons the government may seem. And you believe uh, that that uh, benefit of the abatement will uh, make, the, make these uh, affected citizens happier? I believe it will make them happier, sir. It won't make them happy. Okay. Yes, Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, uh, Honorable Moynihan, for being here. Thank you. Um, I was up in that area, and I observed a lot of the OHRV activity in front of homes and, and on, the, on city streets. And I was appalled by what people have to tolerate. But my question is, uh, have they not had access to any abatement before this? Is this? I believe, I understand your question, I believe. And the answer is, I, I believe under 7616, any citizen can file an abatement petition with a selectman. The issue and the, and the benefit that this statute, as I understand it, will offer is that it gives a presumption that the petition has got good cause. So the citizen may still have to persuade the selectmen of how much the damage is. The selectmen still have all the discretion they have with regard to any other abatement. This doesn't affect the selectmen's power. It just prevents them the, from, it prevents the citizen from being told that, you know, OHRVs are not a reason for an abatement. Go away. It gives them the right to say, oh, all right, you've got good cause. We have to consider it. That's my understanding of the law and its impact. Okay, Representative Power. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Honorable, for taking my question. My question pertains to the process by which a municipality uh, allows a road, such as a Class 6 road, to be used for um, such recreational purposes? Is there a hearing? Is there opportunity for abutters to come and to provide input? And could you explain that process to me? Thank you. I'll explain it as best I can. Uh, and it's a, it's a sore point in the sense, most of Coos County became open to OHRV trails in 2000 and I was going to say even early in 2013. And it was done um, I, in my own town. Uh, the Bureau of Trails called the selectmen on a Monday night uh, because, uh, and said, Do you, is, are you okay with our making your roads into trails? And the selectmen, two of them were present that Monday night, and they said, sure, go ahead. There was no public hearing. There was no notice to the property owners um, until the signs started going up. Uh, that it's now a part of the Ride the Wilds Trail. The Ride the Wilds Trail uh, advertises a thousand miles of OHRV trails, of which, to the best I can get for information, at least three or four hundred of those miles are public ways. They're not trails in the woods where the noise and the dirt and the congestion and the fun um, will be found. It's public ways. So there, there is an effort and has been an effort in prior years recent years, to get notice and require notice, and that may in fact be the case where selectmen now must give notice of a hearing before they allow such a use. Representative Guthrie? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your testimony, Your Honorable uh, former House Member. Thank you. Uh, we miss you, I'm quite sure. Uh, is it your contention that the assessing cannot take into consideration the conditions that you're talking about, because there's no question that they're, I don't know how you contend with it. And I'm a selectman in Hampstead, and we don't have it, and I'm glad we don't have it, because if this bill passed, the unintended consequences is that they're going to get about 200 requests for an abatement. So, my, again, to get back to my question, is it your contention that the assessors 
cannot take this into consideration when they're determining the value of the homes? This has been a, a, a situation since 2013 or, or longer. And while when they assess property for views, they actually make a point of putting in the assessment that so much may be related to the view. There's no history of them taking into consideration the negative consequences of trails and noise and things of that nature. I expect a sincere assessor would, but he'd have to sit out there on a Saturday and count the 780 OHRVs going by, listen to them, to somehow make a subjective assessment as to what that value is. Um, I had thought that it would be good for this statute to say the abatement would be $250 off credit against your tax, some firm amount. But it doesn't say that. It leaves it up to the judgment of the selectmen to use their judgment along with their town assessor if necessary to come up with a value. Um, so I think the value still enters in because once the petition for good cause is presented, it still becomes quite, quite judgmental or on the part of the selectmen as to what they want to do. We have my deepest sympathy as do all those people, and I'm sorry, but they have to contend with this. It's well, it, I, you know, thank I, you for bringing it forward. And we're great. That's why we're grateful to Representative Renzullo and others who have carried on the, the effort to address the issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Representative Manjuri. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Um, I try to look at each bill as, as an individual bill, but we can't do that. We have to, I mean, we can't just do that. We have to look at it in its totality. We have two other bills that we heard today. Both consider uh, abatement of nuisances that interfere with the enjoyment of property that give cause for unsanitary living conditions. Those are two different bills that give towns, cities, health inspectors the right to look at things as they affect your personal property. So I look at your bill and wonder, could you see where the Board of Selectmen would say, I reject your good cause and take it a step further. I'm not going to abate your taxes, but instead I'm going to close that road. Would I have a problem there if all three of these bills passed? Because I'm making a judgment on what, I, what we are considering to be a nuisance and unsanitary conditions and have three separate, at least three separate instances where I can make that judgment. And I'm wondering if I'm going to have a problem. My question is, am I going to have a problem if I deny your abatement on a judgment for what a nuisance is? Does that make any sense? I say all the time, I'm not even sure that my question made sense. <laughs> I, I do un believe, I understand how much the, the existing tax code and maybe recommendations for other changes to the code put a burden on selectmen and city assessors and people have to make those, those calls. Um, one of the differences that I see here from what I understand your question to address is that the property owner who puts in an Olympic size swimming pool is personally doing something and that ends up increasing the value of his property. If you Buy a house with a spectacular view that increases the value of your property. That's something you've chosen and you've done. Um, if you let your property go to hell, and, and if that's what the nuisance or bad condition issue is, I mean, that's something that's being personally done by a landowner and, and, ha and should be dealt with somewhat differently than this. This is an abatement as a result of action that government took. The government made this from a standard road, which has noisy vehicles that go by already, but when it adds hundreds of unmuffled vehicles designed both from a safety perspective and every other perspective to not be on town on, on pavement, these vehicles come with a warning in the front of their owner's manual that says don't operate on public ways unless approved. They're dangerous. They're not designed for public way. But my point is, that's government that made that change. That's government that's made 
the reason and the good cause for this abatement. And I think a side benefit is selectmen will have to take the financial impact of making their town a recreational trail into account when they decide to do that in the future because they know that they may be affecting the property values of their citizens. So it may give them something extra to think about. Thank you for your question. I'm sorry if I went Representative on. Tripp? Uh, thank you for taking my question. Or thank you for... Uh, I'd like to follow up on uh, Representative Power's question. Uh, apparently it's very easy to... Uh, for the uh, uh, class five and six roads to be adopted as uh, uh, trails. Uh, is it that easy to uh, uh, reverse the adoption? Uh, interestingly, uh, there is no requirement for a public hearing to make the decision to allow class five and six roads to become trails. You do have to have a public hearing to stop a uh, class five or six road from being a public uh, OHRV trail. Um, so in a sense, I, I would say it's harder to stop the nuisance once you've created it than it is to create it to begin with, if that answers your question. Uh, yes, it does. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'll continue along that same line. Would you be looking to us to put in a requirement for a public hearing prior to designating, one, designating a road for this type of activity? There have been uh, bills introduced, and I think that issue's been addressed um, in other legislation. So it is not something that this would need to, that your committee would need to address, in my humble opinion. Any other questions for the representative? I mean, for the, uh, for the man testifying, a former representative. Seeing none. Uh, I'm very grateful. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, and welcome back. Thank you. Okay, now we'll now hear from uh, Abby Evanchow. Is that right? Evanco. Say it again. Evanco. Evanco. Got it. The floor is yours. Thank you. My name is Abby Evanco. And I live in Gorham, New Hampshire, about a mile from where Ride the Wild starts. Uh, my friends live in Gorham, Colebrook, Pittsburgh, Henniker, Stratford, Berlin, Milan, Dummer, Hillsboro, and they are all impacted by OHRVs going past their homes. I absolutely agree with this bill that recreational off-highway vehicle use is cause for an abatement. Um, Earlier, someone asked about how much. I would argue if it's five months of the year, it should be that percentage of their taxes removed because that is how long these people cannot enjoy their homes. They run <laughs> from them. Um, many of the, and I also, I ask that you amend this bill to include all public ways. Um, uh, route 2 and Route 16 in Guam are open to OHRVs. That was by a vote of the Board of Selectmen without a butter notification, without consideration of our zoning laws. Um, um, and these people, they know what trucks sound like, they know what motorcycles sound like, and now they have hundreds of ATVs going past their homes. After committee meetings, writing to officials, on and on, seven households in Gorham finally sued the town of Gorham and the Bureau of Trails to have these ATVs taken out of their neighborhood. And the Attorney General is using all its might to crush these seven households. Um, ATVs have been causing problems around New Hampshire for over 20 years now. In 2001, the legislature established the HB 717 Committee quote, to make recommendations on policy concerning state-operated trails and private lands used by off-highway recreational vehicles. As it worked, the study committee found, quote, significant controversy regarding noise, dust, and illegal operation of various kinds. Again, as, as uh, Representative Moynihan said, 
it's well established that these things are a nuisance. The ATV concluded, committee concluded that, quote, other trail uses, low impact, snowmobile, and non-motorized conflict conflict with ATV use. New or expanded trails should be for ATV use only, and conflict issues will not arise. I remind you, this is from a 2001 committee. Ride the Wilds was opened in 2013 against this recommendation. Certainly, residential life is an in incompatible, well, ATVs are incompatible with residential life. Um, I, I quote further from this committee report. The policy of coarse and fine filtering must remain in place. Environmental concerns and the potential degradation of an area must always be the paramount consideration. Again, these are neighborhoods being degraded by these trails. Another recommendation, quote, the emphasis should be on development of self-contained trails, not linear trails. And now you've got Ride the Wilds throughout Coas County. They are not self-contained. These recommendations have been ignored and our, and our towns have been turned into linear trails with homeowners subjected to hundreds of ATVs roaring through. Um, as this committee is charged with municipal and county government, I want to point out to you that there are two laws written to protect New Hampshire citizens from recreational off-highway vehicle use. RSA 236, 56, Roman 2D, and RSA 215A10. Both of these exempt COAS from the protections that are written for the entire state. If you live in another county, you have more protections from OHRVs than you do in COAS. So um, as, as you consider if recreational off-highway vehicle use is an abatable cause, know that COAS citizens are denied equal protections of law by these exemptions. Thank you for your time and consideration. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking my question. Um, you said you live in Gorham, and uh, do you remember before this H O H R V was uh, allowed on the public ways? Yes, yes, I do. And you uh, would you? Be, yeah. It was quieter. I mean, you can hear ATVs from every part of town now. I'm a gardener, and I was gardening. I was working in various parts of town. I could hear the roar of ATVs in every part of town. I was picking blackberries in the town forest. I could hear the roar of ATVs somehow going through conservation land. I don't know how ATVs combine with conservation land. Um, I, live, I live a mile from the trail. Moosebrook State Park is between my house and the trail. And I can hear them roaring through. So when my, my friends down at the trailhead their homes are 60 feet from these trails. My heart breaks for them. And to your question, no, this abatement won't give them what they want. They want their, they want their lives back. They want their residential neighborhoods back. Uh, you mentioned that you think this ought to be expanded to include all, all public ways. Let me suggest, talk to that man right over there under the clock. Representative Renzullo, and see if you, he if he wants to expand the, uh, the legislation to include that. Yeah, and the reason for that is because the Gorham selectmen were involved in every decision to open every ATV trail in Gorham on private land, on the rail trail, on the state roads, on the town roads. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, uh, Representative Dan. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for taking my question. Um, is it your consideration that um, OHRV use is incompatible with other uses of the trails, such as bicycles, walking, horseback riding, any of those things? Yes, and it's, it was established in the 2001 study committee, and uh, every state does a statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan, and Wisconsin, they have a chart that shows that OHRV riding is highly antagonistic with 
eight out of nine other recreation, re recreational uses, and they are still moderately antagonistic, even with snowmobiles. So it's, it's established. It has nothing to do with opinion. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, yes. John. Thank you for taking my question. Up in your area, isn't the uh, OHIV a fairly big part of the economy for the community? It is a loud part of the economy. Um, we live, we abut the White Mountain National Forest, which brings millions of visitors in. Gorham has been a tourist town for over a century. People coming in for the quiet of the mountains, hiking. If you look at fish and game statistics, uh, far more fishing license, fishing licenses, well over 100,000 fishing licenses are sold every year. And actually before COVID, ATV uh, registrations had started to decline and they were at, I don't know, 36, 37, 38,000. And it's over 100,000 fishing licenses. And I don't know anyone disturbed in their home by someone fishing. I may have a uh, lakefront property uh, in a channel, and there may be four or five hundred boats that go past my house every day with loud motors. Should I also get an abatement? I don't know. I just know that this has been a drastic change in use in our community, and that noise pollution is a serious health problem. I, I think there's no reason for any motor to be that loud. Okay, thank you. Yes, Representative Ned Peter. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking an, yet another question. Um, are you aware of any health effects, negative effects of children in your communities, especially young ones with, you know, loud noise and not being able to sleep or hearing problem because of that. Are you aware of any of those things? No, not as it pertains to young children. Um, I do know a friend of mine was walking on the sidewalk and uh, an ATV revved right next to her and caused temporary hearing damage. So, but it, it is established that loud decibels of this size damage human health. abatement or a larger abatement, uh, the homeowners may get a couple hundred dollars or less in their next bill. I, I'm, might I suggest that that's not really what they're looking for? I would completely agree with you, sir. So I, I guess my thought would be we're going we're gonna to vote on whether we support this or not, but um, I might suggest that gather the impacted uh, families together and say, what do we really want out of this? Do we want the OHRVs to go away? Do we want something else? Do we want a, a larger barrier between w where they go and where our houses are? So, so that's the thing. I, I think, I think yeah, once you get larger ab abatement, your, account your accountant may be happy because you're going to see a little bit more money in, in, the, in the tax return. But it doesn't take any of the noise, the dust, the nuisance. It doesn't take any of that away. And uh, I, so I'm not, I'm reflecting on the fact that I'm not sure this is what you really want. Um, I agree with your assessment. It's, um, they want their homes back. They want these trails removed from their neighborhoods where they were put in without any notification. Um, they want their zoning honored. These are residential neighborhoods. We, Gorham has a noise ordinances, a no, noise ordinance. You, roosters were prohibited when this bill went through. Roosters? Roosters. 
and you could have no more than five or six chickens and they could not be a nuisance by noise or odor. That was the standing ordinance when the select board voted to allow off highway recreational vehicles to travel through this residential neighborhood. Okay, we, we, have, the, we have the legislation uh, proposed to us. Uh, we're, we will evaluate that and, and you have my advice to think about, maybe think about it a little different way of what you really want. And it, it's too late now to change that uh, for this year, but maybe next year you can come back and say, this is what we really want. Yes, Representative Vance. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for taking another question. Uh, do you consider that it's likely that the select board may reconsider their decisions if they have to start shelling out abatement after abatement after abatement? I think other citizens might care, might start to care if their tax bill goes up. Uh, right now, people, if it's not, uh, the, the use is very much concentrated in different areas of town. The burden is not distributed equally. So some citizens are suffering terribly. And other citizens are saying, oh, it's not in my neighborhood, I'm okay. So if their bill started going up because this other neighborhood was negatively impacted, they might start to care. Thank you. Uh, seeing no final questions, uh, I want to thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from the NHMA, uh, Mr. Grays. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Nate Grays for the New Hampshire Municipal Association. I'm just commenting on this bill. We do not have a position. Um, there are a couple questions that committee members asked earlier that I do want to address. I believe Representative Power asked about the current process for opening and closing roads to OHRVs. That's found under RSA 215-A colon 6 Roman 9. Um, that also reference, references RSA 215-A colon 15. Um, essentially what that requires is that there be a public notice um, with, it, with notice to the abutters on the affected roads. Um, and that notice has to go out uh, 14 days in advance um, of that public hearing. Um, and after that conclusion of that hearing, the governing body can vote whether to open or close the road. And additionally, the costs of providing notice both to the abutters and uh, posting notice generally is borne by whoever the petitioning party is. So if it's the local OHRV club, they would pay for it. If it's the homeowners that want to close the road, they would pay for it. My understanding is the this change occurred, I think, two or three years ago. Um, and it didn't affect any current disposition. So if a road was currently open to OHRVs and then a group got together to, and wanted to close it, you know, they'd have this new process they would have to go through, which is, which is what um, some of the discrepancy uh, that was described earlier today might have, might have covered. Um, as far as this bill goes, um, under RSA 76 colon 16, the selectmen or assessors for good cause shown may abate any tax, including prior year's taxes assessed by them or their predecessors, including any portion of interest accrued on such tax. Um, the term good cause shown is not defined in the statute. Um, what this bill would do is simply add a um, an partial definition um, in that it says that good cause shall include um, allowed recreational use of OHRVs on and then if it's amended, potentially more than just class six and class six roads, or class five and class six roads. Um, I would suggest to the committee that the term good cause is purposely vague here. Um, essentially, if you can go to the select board and make a good argument about why your property was incorrectly valued during the assessment process, um, they could give you an abatement. Um, and that's gonna vary. Uh, typically, it's gonna be related to the property itself you know, perhaps the, the select board is unaware of the fact that you had some, you know, uh, termite infestation or something like that that totally destroyed the inside of the property and therefore the value or the building and therefore the property is not as highly valued, but it could have external causes as well. One of the common ones is if someone is receiving municipal welfare, they obviously can't pay their taxes because, you know, they need assistance from the town. They're, they're not 
they don't have the means to pay for a lot of things, so it doesn't make sense to tax them because the select board would just be paying them to pay themselves. It would be a it would be a circle. Um, so to Representative Guthrie's point earlier, um, presumably if properties are valued correctly at the assessment stage, there would be no need for a, a, for an abatement. Um, but because we already have this vague term good cause, presumably if you had loud boats, loud motorcycles, loud OHRVs, and could convince the select for that that was cause to devalue your property, um, you could get an abatement for that. Um, but as I stated, the, the Municipal Association does not have a position. I do want to note um, that currently there is there is a bill, uh, two different bills um, working through um, the legislature. Um, there's HB 1109, which the sponsor also sponsored, um, that would change the process for opening and closing roads to OHRVs um, to be a legislative body vote instead of a governing body vote. Um, there's also HB 1188, which is go would create a commission to study OHRV use in the state. It's a very broad um, commission. Um, presumably, it would cover uh, whether any change needs to be made to the abatement um, process as well. But um, I, I think it would I think it would cover a lot of what Chairman Dolan pointed out to the, the previous speaker in terms of what we want to do as a state and a state policy regarding OHRVs. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, Representative Mercatini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Grace. Uh, could you just tell me where these HB 1109 and 1188 are? I believe both are in the Resources, Recreation, and Development Committee. I'm not sure if they've been um, exact or not. Guthrie. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you again for your testimony. Uh, as I said before, I'm a selectman in Hampstead, and we've always felt that you can abate for anything. Correct. It's in the eye of the beholder, and this bill is not, would, would I be correct if I said this bill is not necessary for the process to go forward for a request for an abatement, an abatement and they the homeowners can request an abatement at any time for any reason, and they really don't need this tool, if you will, to go forward with the problem. That's my interpretation as well. Um, it sounded like some of the testimony today th that they were really looking for a tax credit, not an abatement. A follow up, if I could, Mr. Chairman. It's been, to t I've asked the question a couple of times, I guess, but is it your understanding that the conditions that we're talking about in this, these situations cannot be considered when the original abatement is made? Well, I, I would ass my understanding of how the assessment process works is that the assessment should take into account the value of the property and the value of the property would be based on whatever the market would support. So presumably if you're next to a large factory your property is going to be less even if the exact, you know, building and the exact size of the property are the same as something across town because there are outside factors there. Presumably, that could take into account um, the use of the roadways as well. Um, I, you know, this all gets very complex and is way above my pay grade. Um, but I am too. <laughs> as I said, presumably, if it's correctly valued in the first place, you don't need to have an abatement because everyone's paying what they should be paying based on what the value of the property, the various properties are. Um, but if they can come in and say, hey, you missed this, that's really the basis of the abatement. I suggest to you, if I may, Mr. Chairman, that the, whoever the, the assessors are in these communities are to take a look at what they're doing and how they're valuing those homes. I will pass that on. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Representative Clee. Uh, thank you, Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for taking my call. Um, I, I think um, the, the previous speaker uh, kind of hit one, some of the things that I, I wanted to speak to. So my question is, is there a potential by naming this specifically that we're going to create a slippery slope of boats public roads, trains going by, 
Recently, Nashua had a train idle for nine and a half hours by a residential area. Would all of those kind of things um, fall, bec suddenly become named in future bills? So thank you for the question. So what I've, I think that we've seen in the history of the development of the law in New Hampshire is we've typically started out with specific lists, and those have gotten very long and various statutes. So for example, um, under RSA 53A, uh, multiple communities can join into cooperative agreements, and it used to be that it was for a long and then increasingly long list of specific things, and then at some point the legislature said, hey, this doesn't make sense. Let's just say you can enter into those agreements for anything you could lawfully do. Um, so in the kind of the same vein, kind of just letting it be a vague good cause allows different select boards to make different decisions. Um, it's rather than have a very long list. Follow up, sir. Thank you very much. Um, so I guess my question would be, would you make better recommendation because I think these people are suffering um, closer to what um, Chairman Dolan had said of, of trying to to get these roads to be more approved or pulled back or something like that. Would that be a better recommendation for the, the towns and cities? Um, so I don't have a specific policy recommendation. Um, I, I did note that you know there is HB 1109, if that's something that um, is that members of the legislature want to consider um, as an option. Um, certainly there's, there's also um, 1118, HB 1118 for a commission. Um, I've been in a number of these OHRB hearings over in Resources and Recreation Development. I can tell you they pack the room. They're usually uh, like 100 speakers. Um, it takes the whole day. It's a very controversial issue. I, I can't solve it. <laughs> thank you. Representative Ron. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Grace, for taking my question. You talked about market value being a basis for um, determining the assessed value. Um, from your experience maybe attending some of those hearings by resources and from testimony you've heard today, would a house on an o OHRV um, trail, if that's being on the market and shown, let's say, in April, would you expect it would be the same market value than maybe three months later with the, the traffic that's been described? Or would the market value change because of the nuisance of the noise and dirt? Well, thank you for the question. Now, I'm speculating here, but I assume that assessments are based on the selling value, sales value, and presumably the person selling the property isn't going to want to disclose anything that might be considered a defect whether that's, you know, the boiler is about to go or whether there's a huge amount of traffic during certain times of year. Um, and it's <laughs> the, the, old, the old saying is buyer beware. And so the, the buyer is going to have to be savvy enough to sort of suss that out with, you know, the assistance of their real estate agent, if any. Um, that does cause problems because it's certainly something you might not necessarily know if you're not from that community that that might be an issue, whether it's this or something else. Um, so I don't, I don't know. Um, I think we're looking towards what the true value is, and that might be very hard to, to determine. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, Representative Tripp. I mean, uh, Ms. Ellis. I'd like to follow up on uh, uh, Representative Rung's uh, question of you. Um, one of the, uh, the most important websites that you go to if you're looking to rent or buy a property in Coas County is Craigslist. Okay? If you go to Craigslist, would you believe that if you are right on a ATV trail or a snowmobile trail, that is a very positive thing in marketing your property? Would you believe that? I would believe it. I have no experience in this area. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Mr. Graves. Appreciate your testimony. Thank you. have now, I 
that's it. Okay, so I'm going to close the hearing on HB 1289. And for the, all of you who came long distance for this meeting, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we're going to now open the uh, public hearing for uh, HB 1293, which is relative to the design of sewage or waste disposal systems for a person's own domicile. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> for the record, my name is uh, Mark McConkey. I represent the good people of Carroll County 3. I hail from freedom, and I've resided in public works and highways for 16 plus years. Uh, I'm here to introduce uh, House Bill 1293, relative to the design of sewage and waste disposal systems for a person's own domicile. Um, this is a uh, housekeeping legislation for the Department of Environmental Services subsurface, so you might ask why Mark sits before you. Uh, I have been a permitted, New Hampshire permitted septic designer for more than 30 years. Um, I have done hundreds and hundreds of designs. My sons have followed me and worked with me in the trade. And there are years that we produce over 15% uh, to 20% of all the septic designs generated in Carroll County. Part of the process to become permitted by the state uh, is that you need to uh, pass two parts of a testing protocol with them. Uh, one is a knowledge of the uh, environmental rules that pertain to uh, sewage disposal. And the second and most important is that you have to pass a competency in evaluating soil. The most important component of our, our, of our industry is being able to judge where the seasonal high water adjusts to over a period of 20 years. When I started in on this practice uh, 30 plus years ago, it was pretty standard. We were using stone and pipe and that all systems would be built four feet above that height. The, um, the, if you would provide at least two feet of great soil underneath that system, there were some that claim you could put a cup of water underneath it and you could drink that, that effluent as it comes through. I have never done that. I've never suggest anyone do that. Technology marches forward uh, like it does in every other industry. And a majority of the systems, not many, many of the systems now uh, have gone from stone and pipe to Enviro to Elgin's to all these other innovative systems that instead of needing to be four feet above seasonal high water, you only need to be two foot above seasonal high water. The margin of error of a layman figuring out where that mark was uh, just became extremely important because if they miss that mark and they're less than two feet above that seasonal uh, height of uh, water, uh, then we're shedding uh, untreated effluent into the groundwater. Uh, the department had uh, asked me to bring this forward on their behalf. I understand the issue. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. I know the department uh, is here to answer uh, further for you also. Questions from the committee? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question. Um, I'm trying to formulate the question in my mind, um, and I'm looking at the language. So I'll just, I can't, I can't see the word that I'm looking for, but my question um, pertains to a, um, the septic design being approved. So currently a homeowner can, in fact, make the app, do the design and make the application. Is it not true that 
regardless um, whether it's a licensed septic designer or a homeowner, do, do both applicants, must their designs be approved by uh, another, another agency? Uh, designs must be are reviewed and approved by the department and the department is taking on face value uh, that the person that has submitted this is knowledgeable enough to know um, to know where the seasonal high water is. Follow up. So in either case, um, or the case of the homeowner, that their design still must be approved. Thank, thank, thank you for the question. Um, the department reviews the design, and it has to be designed. The difference is when the department reviews a design done by myself or my boys or other licensed people, they know the quality of our work, and we've been tested to know that we know what's in the soil. When the department gets a homeowner's and, um, design before them, they, the department doesn't have that same certainty of what they're looking at. Follow up, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Thank you. So what the concern is from your standpoint is the integrity or, or the um, yeah, integrity of the septic design due to the fact that the homeowner may or may not and most likely not be a licensed septic designer. And so therefore, the evaluation of, to approve this design is, is not, you're not checking every single jot and tittle of the design. Is that right. the concern? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. I think it was a, a good summary. Okay, any other questions? Yes, Rep Representative. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for taking my question. Is this, um, is the current RSA applicable to all septic systems or, or septic systems that may be near vulnerable locations, shorelines, wetlands, whatever? Um, are they held to a higher standard or is this, does this apply to all of them? The, the nature of my question comes is that I'm wondering if by restricting septic designs to just the professional engineers, such as yourself, rather than just any person, that um, we may be able to address uh, threats to very uh, sensitive environmental locations. Thank you uh, for the question. I'm, I'm pondering um, your question. So um, being accurate becomes uh, even more important the closer you become to a valuable resource, um, a river and so forth, and uh, wetlands, uh, aquifers, and all of that. Um, I. I don't think I don't think t if the question was should the bill be broken for certain locations, uh, I don't think so. Um, you had characterized designers as engineers. Uh, I just want to make the point that a lot of us are, are laymen, we're uh, contractors, we're not engineers. You're going to have the pleasure of hearing from an engineer after, but we're we are trained in the field and we have to. We have to know soil, we have to know wetlands, we have to draw those boundaries. And for the purposes of a septic design, we are permitted to go in and put those boundary lines on our plan. Uh, so, and once again, if, if, you're, if you're a layman by being a homeowner, I don't know that you have that level and would know enough to say, for instance, to pull yourself 50 feet from what they call a hydric soil or 75 feet from a, a poorly drained. So uh, your question's valuable, and uh, I, I hope I answered what you wanted. Thank you. Um, question, uh, who did you say you brought with you from the environmental services? Uh, behind me is uh, Rob Tarda, from, who's the subsurface administrator. And I believe um, I'm not familiar with the other gentleman from the department, who is uh, Philip Throwbridge, uh, PE, 
who is the manager of the Land Resource Management Program Water Division. Well, I'm assuming that, that they're here because there's a message that needs to be delivered to the committee from them. I would believe so, Mr. So Chairman. Why don't I invite, invite them up to the dais up here and uh, you know, ask you a few questions. Certainly. Welcome. Thank you. Well, again, I was here earlier this morning. Uh, thank you again for letting me testify on, on this time, House Bill 1293. Again, my name is Rob Tardiff. I'm the administrator of the Subsurface Systems Bureau within the Department of Environmental Services. Uh, just briefly, the Subsurface Systems Bureau regulates all on-site wastewater in the state of New Hampshire, uh, regardless of whether it's residential or commercial. Uh, we also do subdivision of land, and uh, relative to 1293, we permit or license, they're kind of synonymous here, uh, all septic system designers and installers in the state. Uh, other than for a person's own domicile, you must be a permitted designer or installer to design and install systems. Um, right now, we have approximately... 680 active uh, designers in the state and about 1,500 active installers. Uh, as Representative McConkey pointed out, uh, each one of those professionals have had to pass a state exam. And that, that exam demonstrates their knowledge of soils and their relation, the relationship of soils in the seasonal high water table. I don't necessarily think I need to repeat a lot of what uh, Representative McConkey said. I'd be happy to go over it. Uh, but in, in an effort to save everybody's time here. Could you field a few questions? Of course. Uh, Representative Power. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question. So could you explain to, to us what happens when you receive a, 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 a septic design plan that's very poor and, and just not adequate? What is the process? Is it just is it denied, or does the department have to assist in lead the, the the homeowner into correcting the design mistakes? What does that process look like? How much time does that take and the resources from your department? Thank you for the question. Uh, every application is reviewed. Again, if there are any deficiencies noted during that review, we issue what's called a request for more information letter. In that letter, it describes, it itemizes all of the deficiencies that we found with the application. Hopefully, uh, when the applicant or the designer, or the homeowner in this case, receives that letter, they can correct the deficiencies, resubmit the application to us, or at least resubmit the information that we've requested in our letter. Uh, and then we, in time, will be able to issue the approval. Unfortunately, with the homeowner designs, that request for information process goes back and forth many, many more times than it would for a permanent designer like Representative McConkey, which takes a significant amount more, uh, significant more amount of, of staff resources. Thank you. Uh, seeing no further questions, thank you for, oh, I'm sorry, a Representative Tripp. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you for taking my question. Uh, when I first reviewed this bill, uh, one of the things that struck my eye was that uh, uh, the person that d developed the, their own plan had to uh, provide that uh, they uh, meet the eligibility for this exemption. What kind of uh, process is there for someone uh, uh, attesting to their eligibility? Thank you for that question. I'm sorry that, that's, that the speaker is right in between us here. Um, that, that can be interpreted in a number of different ways. One is the eligibility or the knowledge that uh, we would like to have from people submitting applications relative to soils, groundwater, uh, just all our rules, our design rules. But it could also be interpreted as just the eligibility of 
that you actually live in the property you're, you're considering your domicile. So again, that, that could be considered in, in two different ways, if I've answered your question. We would, like, we would like to be able to say you have to demonstrate your eligibility through knowledge of, I know, I'm sorry, of, of soils and, and season and the groundwater. Representative Mandra Cooley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for, for taking my question. So um, my question is only for do-it-yourself do folks that this is needed. Are there other categories of uh, septic design and source waste uh, system design and uh, implementation? Uh, this bill is, and I'm hoping I'm answering your question, but this bill is specific to homeowner designs for their domicile. That's do-it-yourself correct? kind of. Uh, so are there other categories is my question. What other categories are there? Homeowners, small businesses, commercial large scale. Well, we have residential systems and commercial systems, but I don't know if I would consider them necessarily different categories relative to design. Thank you. We have, we have different design flows that have to be taken into account to create the, the appropriate design. Representative Power. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my um, subsequent question. So to be very clear with regard to the, 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 the concept of DIY, a licensed contractor or septic installer would be the only parties permitted to actually install such a design. That's correct. There's a very similar st statutory provision in RSA 45A36 where the statutory provision we're talking about about design is in RSA 45A35, but there's a very similar provision in 36 for homeowner installation. Hey, which oh, causes yeah, its own. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question. I've replaced a couple septic systems in my life, and um, aside from calling up the company and writing a very large check, um, I really haven't been involved except I did notice, I, I think during both of those installs, that somebody inspected, I think it was somebody from the town. Is, is that inspection a common practice throughout the state, and how would, would that be impacted at all by this bill? The inspection of the construction of the system would not be impacted by the bill. But if I could back up a little bit on your question, the Bureau kind of has two functions relative to septic systems, and that is we review every design before it's approved, and then we inspect the other part of our Bureau inspects every system before it's placed into operation. If I could take just a minute, my analogy is kind of when you build a house, you get a building permit, when you build a house, that's essentially our approval for construction. We approve the, the plans. And then, on the, again, the house side, you get a certificate of occupancy, right? The, the, the town guy comes in, or the town person comes in, inspects the, the house, and issues you a certificate of occupancy. In our, in our world, we inspect every system, and we issue what's called an approval for operation. So you have an approval for construction, we do an inspection, we, get, we grant an approval for operation. Thank you, Mr. Tarda. If I could just say, if I could just add one more thing very sure. briefly uh, to your question about sensitive areas, I would like to say that we think that every area is sensitive because we're really protecting groundwater, i.e. drinking water. Uh, so it's not just sensitive areas as far as surface water goes or wetlands goes. So we feel that this is, should be a statewide. Thank you, Mr. Tarter. If you would help to educate, uh, Representative Van. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Tarter. Uh, am I am I correct in assuming that the issue that we're trying to address here is not so much the design of the system, since you have to inspect that anyway, but you inspect it as a design on a piece of paper. The issue is. Is the system going to be situated appropriately vis-a-vis -vis the um, high water mark? Is that what we're trying to fix here? That's part of it. But, I mean, that's, that's the vertical extent that we're talking about as far as the design goes. There's also horizontal setbacks to wells, to, right. again, wetlands, surface waters. But your follow-up, please. You're depending on the design to um, correctly 
identify what the mean high water line is and where those other things, that, the horizontal issues about the well. You're depending on the designer to have told you the right thing there. That's correct. So this is in an effort to make sure that that person actually knows what they're doing. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tarda. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you much for your, er, very much for your time. Yeah, we've, uh, we le we've learned something today. <laughs> That's well, a good thing. I hope so. Thank you. So that ends our, our uh, hearing on HB 1293. I'm going to unbang my mallet. Okay. Never heard of it. Mr. Chris Albert. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Welcome. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. Thank you for taking your time. Uh, again, for the record, my name is Christopher Albert. I am chairman of the Grant State On-Site Wastewater Association. It's a new name we've rebranded. Uh, it used to be GSDI. Uh, we're the septic designers, evaluators, pumpers, uh, installers, uh, land use professionals. Uh, we're in support of this bill. Uh, we understand the situation that DES has with homeowner designs. I know we live in New Hampshire. Our home is our castle. Uh, but, you know, deciding a seasonal water table is a science. Uh, I have a four-year degree from UNH, a minor in soils. I'm a wetland scientist and evaluator designer. I put a lot of training uh, into understanding a water table. I'm actually an instructor at the University of New Hampshire teaching continuing education on soils. Uh, the soils are the key on doing a proper design. If that's not done right, uh, again, we could have failures uh, to our groundwater, our water supplies, and our wetlands. So it, it, again, it's, I understand that the situation of maybe sensitive areas. The problem with that concept is DES is only getting a small snapshot of a plan. They're not getting a giant locust map that knows what's going on maybe 500 feet away of a, of, of a lake perspective. Uh, so again, this should be a broad-based uh, bill the way it's presented. Uh, allowing uh, or not allowing any more homeowner designs. Do you, do you have any uh, more handouts? With, with oh, yes, I do. I'm sorry. Oh, I split it half and half. But yep. Well, I think Representative Lasalas ate something. <laughs> oh, Representative Strip. Again, I'll leave, you know, leave the letter for the, uh, the committee to read at their leisure. But it, it, again, it's the, the seasonal water table is the key component of, of what the homeowner's issues are. Mr. Republican uh, McConkey and Mr. Tardiff kind of outlined those aspects. And again, we just want to reiterate, uh, you know, the, our board of directors, we, we actually discussed this at length. And I had unanimous support of all the board members uh, for the passage on this bill. Very good. Thank you for your testimony. You. And we have one more question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question. Are you aware of any um, such septic designs that, that have been installed and have failed and have, have caused damage to the environment or other um, you know, it, consequences it, as a result of a faulty design? Every day, unfortunately, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, we're, we're seeing failures all the time now of even the designers not understanding a good concept of the water table. So it's, it's a learning process. That's why we're always continuously teaching it. Um, failures on a leach field are, are pretty isolated to that general area, uh, but they have been known to, to break out in the lakes. I mean, we have algae blooms and our, our, our cyanobacteria hits in our lakes. Uh, we're a non-point source issue with our septic system. So again, there, there will be future bills or possibly bills this year about different types of uh, restrictions on, on development along lakes, but it is important. Uh, we're, we're part of the culprits for our, uh, our water quality that keeps New Hampshire so great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Abbott. Albert. Albert. Oh, Representative Mangiapudi. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking my question. Um, how uh, prevalent is the leaching and affecting the groundwater and drinking water through because of septics? I, I don't have any studies with me, but there, I was on a, a study through this, this uh, house last year. Uh, it is prevalent. I mean, if you just look at the, your beach closures, every year they're getting, they're getting worse and worse, uh, and septic systems as a non-point source contaminant are, are uh, a culprit of that. So again, if things aren't done, uh, we're going to lose our lakes. Okay. Now, thank you for your testimony. Appreciate it. So that now closes the hearing on HB 1293. And we're going to open the hearing on HB 1365. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. It's, it's good to be back. Um, my name is, uh, as most of you know, Representative Max Abramson. Uh, now that I have a Floterio, I'm, I'm representing the towns of Hampton, Hampton Falls, and Seabrook. And I'm introducing a bill that, that um, just asks the question or would simply provide the local option to allow towns to s split from a, a one-rate property tax to a two-rate property tax system, one for residential and one for residential, essentially uh, industrial office, commercial, big box stores, um, and that kind of thing. Obviously, the, the Seabrook nuclear power plant is the largest uh, individual property taxpayer in Seabrook, and at one time they were paying almost 90% of the property taxes. Um, as time has gone on, um, that amount has gone down and the burden has shifted around. Now they pay about 40%. Um, this bill is intended to, to, to deal with two problems. One is uh, dramatically rising residential property taxes, uh, which in some towns, including very blue-collar Seabrook, is, is um, threatening to force people out of their homes. Um, we had, um, when I moved in, I believe my property tax bill, property tax bill for the whole neighborhood was about $300 a month for everything. Uh, today it's almost $700 a month. So there's a, there's a tendency to want to talk about what the rate is versus the assessment or the things that can be done with the assessed value and so forth. Um, but what, what's killing us is just the fact that the, the total bill is getting too high and what's happened in, in business-friendly towns like Seabrook. Originally, years ago, we thought, well, as the power plant pays less and less, we'll attract more business, and then business will take on more of the tax bill, and then our, prop our residential property taxes won't go up. And, um, that is, actually isn't what's happened. What's happened is um, we've done studies in recent years finding that certain types of business, like retail, actually cost you know, about $18 or $19 per thousand because of the higher restaurants and uh, fast food and um, certain types of businesses take about eighteen to twenty dollars per thousand because of the higher rate of uh, nine one one calls. Um, obviously, water and wastewater, garbage pickup, you know, per square foot for restaurants, for fast food and drive through restaurants. The impact on the town uh, towns is is actually a net negative. And what's been happening is more and more towns are around New England are cutting off big box stores or cutting off certain types of development or instead of having a very business-friendly planning board, I served on my pl town's planning board for three years, instead of being business-friendly in order to both create jobs and at the same time reduce our residential property tax bill, what we're being told is that for certain types of business, new business comes in and our property taxes actually go up. Um, so the response from towns has been more and more inclination towards stopping new business development. And that's what I'm worried about. At, at the, as, as bad as property taxes can be for businesses, the, uh, the zoning power can be just absolutely devastating. And I've, I've seen business owners come in time and again, and once they, they start hitting uh, the red tape and regulations, and once they're no longer being helped, and once they're uh, finding they can't get variances and conditional use permits anymore, um, when the town turns against them, it's almost impossible to put a, a building up or even uh, renovate or revise or expand a building. Um, without uh, spending a lot of money on lawyers. And that's not, obviously, that's not guaranteed either. So my hope was to kind of return to a, a more business-friendly environment for all these border towns and towns that have a large amount of retail shopping. 
um, that have lots of the strip malls and big box stores and whatnot to, um, to put that incentive in place. Um, I'll, I'll give you an idea of the impact um, based on the estimates that I did of the, of the, the breakdown of the property tax. Um, in a place like Seabrook, residential property taxes, if this passed, would go down by an average of $2,000 a year, almost $200 a month for residential property taxes because more than two-thirds of our, uh, more than 70% of our property tax base is business, the power plant, the dog track, um, big box stores, and, and so forth. Um, Hampton Falls only has a small amount of commercial development, so I'm not sure that they would adopt this because there isn't that much to be saved for them. But Hampton is split. It's, it's almost even, so I think that Hampton voters would, would probably be inclined to support it since they would save about $1,000 a year in property taxes. Um, when we've talked to business owners where we, I, I thought there might be some resistance, small business owners have a business and they have a house. Uh, so they own two, so they're paying property taxes twice. On the net, on the whole, almost all the business owners I talked to would have, at least in Seabrook, would save money and would still vote for the measure. Um, because they would, you know, they might see their, their business tax, property tax go up by five or six or seven hundred dollars a year, but then if they're saving two thousand dollars a year in, in residential property taxes, it's definitely worth it. And, and there's the, the other issue that we brought up on municipal and county that, that you do have. It's, it's only people who live in town who are voting on the property tax, and that does affect the business community, and the business community doesn't get to vote on the warrant articles. So they're kind of at the mercy of it, and we kind of, we would, we would benefit as a state, and we'd certainly I think towns would benefit if the, you know, the marginal, even though it's a smaller amount, what's left over, if the, if you no longer have this kind of attitude where some voters are going in and saying, well, we'll get the power plant to pay for it. Well, we'll get all these businesses and we'll get these offices and industry to, to, to pay for all these warrant articles. Some warrant articles are absolutely necessary, and even in Seabrook, even in tough years, those still pass two to one. Um, all the school warrant articles pass every year. Um, most of the infrastructure stuff, the, the, the absolute have-to-haves, they pass every year. But um, even I would admit that there are some warrant articles that um, they're iffy or they don't need to be done this year or maybe they don't need to be done at all. Um, and, and the selectmen will just put, put the question on the ballot and say, do you want to spend money on this new thing? And um, normally those would fail, but in, in Seabrook, sometimes they pass just because there's this attitude of, well, you know, we'll have, we'll have business pay for it. And that isn't really fair. So w what I tried to do with this bill is come up with one that was mainly business friendly and also residential property taxpayer family friendly. So what businesses get is their property tax rate could go up by as much as a dollar per thousand depending on how this is written on the town warrant. But then that's locked in for three years. So they get a stable rate. What we consistently hear from business owners is they really need the stability. They need to know, you know, what they need to finance, what they need to do next year and the year after and the year after that. Um, the residential property owners would, of course, have the lower rate, and some years you'd save a thousand a year, some years you'd save two thousand a year, some years it would be about the same. But overall, residential property taxpayers would would save the money with that that variable rate. But it it, it would encourage, um, on one hand, land use regulations and rules that are more business friendly, um, and because seventy percent of the states revenue comes from business taxes um, and a disproportionate amount of course comes from business profits tax and uh, meals and rooms tax um, are two very large sources of revenue um, that from our vantage point if, if a few towns did take advantage of this and we did then get more big box stores and more of the larger business development that the that it would make the budgeting process a little bit easier in the future for the state I don't think that a lot of towns would implement it um, because it's, there are only a few towns in the state where there's such a disproportionate amount of business development that's there already. Um, but I, I think that just looking at Seabrook and Hampton, I think that it's likely they would, they would probably take the option. Um, and my main concern, the reason I put this bill in, of course, is um, we are seeing a lot of older folks, people on fixed income, disability, um, people who are in a job where they're paid, they don't get promoted every few years, they don't get pay raises every few years, and they're really kind of on fixed incomes. Um, I, I do have a lot of blue-collar folks in my district, and I have a lot of people who are on a fixed income. 
so they 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 can't afford another you know two or three or four hundred dollars a month in property taxes they just can't afford it that, that would wipe them out Representative Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Um, simply put, aren't you shifting the tax burden from one group of residents to another group, which is residential to commercial, commercial to, you know, at the end of the day, the tax revenue is what runs the towns and the cities. And by giving a break, you're shifting it to the other. So how would that benefit uh, uh, attracting more? You're shifting it. It's an option for, for, for towns with warrant articles, so town form of government. And it's, it's, there are two different ways. There are two different ways that we benefit. One is that it encourages the voters, since it's, um, voters must be taxpayers and taxpayers must be voters. Residential homeowners and apartment owners, people who live in town, are the only ones who are voting on the warrant articles. So that's part of it. We want to encourage people to be more prudent and more careful and get more involved at looking at the warrant articles. The bigger issue that I'm looking at over the long run is I'm seeing business-friendly towns like Seabrook. When I ran for, for planning board, um, I, I was continuously hearing this, this concern. We originally were a very business-friendly town, top to bottom, in order to get business to pay more of the property tax bill. So towns and planning boards and town hall, they can just say, we don't want any more apartments. We don't want any more big box stores. I'm even hearing some people in town don't want big box stores even in Seabrook. And we're right on the border, we're right on the border with Massachusetts and driving distance of Maine. So if you have more and more towns cutting back on big box stores and large developments, it hurts the state's revenue, it hurts jobs for the state, and uh, it would reduce the state's overall uh, uh, revenue source. So we want to maintain, we want towns to have a strong enough incentive uh, in some way, shape, or form to attract more business and maintain business-friendly zoning laws and land use regulations. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for taking my question. Um, I, I will admit that uh, I do have concern that we'll push large businesses out of your town or your city. But my, my question is, um, how does this work with cities? I, I know that they have to pass an ordinance or something, but the DRA uh, approves our rate. The DA, DRA would have to take the budget, create a, a rate for each body, so for residential and for businesses, they would have to come up with their own rate? Mm -hmm. it, it's in the warrant article. It, it's, it's for towns with warrant articles. Um, we, we don't, I, I pardon me, my, pardon my, yeah. in, we don't do warrant articles in cities. Yep, yep. So okay, the, sorry, the measure is a local option for towns with warrant articles. It's a kind of town form of government, which is run very differently, does budgeting very differently. Cities have a lot more flexibility in, in how they do budgeting. Um, they're able to do things. Things like put contracts up for competitive bid in November and December, and they get to save money. You know, they can move funds around, and they have more flexibility than we have in towns. Um, so this was aimed at, at, at specifically towns. Um, if there are members of the committee who want this amended to include cities, I'm willing to, to go do the legwork and research on that. Um, but what it, it says is, yeah, it, it would allow the voters to to push, and it'd be, the, the wording would be in the Warren article, should the town of Seabrook separate its property tax rate to raise the business rate up by, could be 50 cents, 75 cents, or dollar per thousand, or any amount up to that. And that would have businesses taking on more of the tax burden, that's true. But for in Seabrook, a dollar more per thousand for business results in three or four dollars less per thousand for residential, for residential property owners. Now it is, we have to be realistic, it's also the, the same residential property owners who are voting on the zoning laws and land use regulations and whether or not to enact impact fees and other development fees and, 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 and so forth. And, and as a former planning board member myself, I was answerable directly to residential property owners and not business owners. And business, the businesses overwhelmingly tended to be out of state and didn't have that much representation so they kind of have a tendency to just be at the mercy of whatever residential property owners do. 
um, residential voters do. So the, the, the hammer that people can bring down against business right now is basically to just completely wipe out all new development and just say no big box stores. And there, there are towns all over New England that are saying no more big box stores, none. And they're completely putting a stop to that. That's one of the things that I'm trying to stop with this bill. I'm trying to make sure that residential voters understand that a big box store pays a lot of taxes and can help a lot can help a lot to reduce the tax burden. Mr. Chairman, I have a follow up. Yes, go ahead. I, I'm not quite sure that um, that you understood. W when I read this line 26, mm -hmm. it says in a city or town that has adopted a charter pursuant to blah blah blah. Right, right. The legislative body may consider and act upon the question in accordance with this normal procedure for passage of resolutions. The title of it is allowing towns and cities to tax residential and non-resident property at different rates. So it already does address cities. My question still is, how would the DRA, have you spoken to them, I guess I should have asked it that way, how would the DRA calculate a different rate for residents versus right now we're all at the same rate. They may go to court and disagree with the assessment, but regardless, they're going to pay the same rate that residentials do. How would the DRA, you, you, I understand you outlined it with towns and war warrants and so on. Um, cities don't work that way. We do ordinances and so we could adopt this through an ordinance, but how would it work? Uh, the way DRA does it for Seabrook, um, and I've talked to folks in the finance department, and a few years ago I did talk to DRA about how about this issue, about allowing two different rates, um, but that's that's long before actually introducing this bill. Um, if it were done using this mechanism, then the, the article itself allows them to increase the business rate by up to $1 per thousand, and they can estimate what the amount of revenue is for that, and then whatever is left over is paid for by residential. The smaller amount that's, that remains is what's paid for um, by residential. Uh, okay, and uh, thank you for that clarification, Mr. Chair, may I? Thank you. Um, then my next question is, um, in, in the city of Nashua, we consider any apartment building five and up as commercial. Would that fall within your, within this business versus uh, residential? You could have a five unit apartment in a fully residential area. Would you tax them at a different rate than you would tax the, ne that, the next door neighbors? Yeah, to be fair, um, I did consider apartments and I also have a provision in the bill for mixed use. Um, so apartments would be considered residential for property tax purposes, even if it, you had a town or a city that, that only allows apartments in commercial or even industrial. Or, um, I worked with form-based codes, so if you have you know, T1, T2, T3, T4 zones, different density zones, um, it would still work there. It's, it's the use of the building itself. And if you had a split use, like if you had two floors of residential and one floor of commercial mm -hmm. down on the bottom, which is, is very common in cities, mm -hmm. um, down at the, the, the down floor, that would be considered business. It would be taxed at the higher rate. And then the upper floors would be taxed at the lower rate. And the, the surrounding land would be taxed at the lower residential rate. So the, the intent is it, it, gives it gives the voters an incentive to do a little extra work to keep the property tax burden down and also keep a business friendly environment. Thank you. Well, Representative Power. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question, Representative. My question pertains to the number three as it, uh, as it relates to lines 17 and 18. How did you come up with the, the time of three property tax years? And what happens to this separate tax rate after three years? Does it simply expire? Yes, it's, it's only a three-year provision. I assume that if, if people are saving money, my assumption is that they're going to keep renewing it every three years. Um, and the reason for doing three years, <coughs> sorry, the reason for doing three years is, is to say, I, um, I'm trying to think. I think it was the conservative party's definition of conservatism is being realistic about human behavior. Um, and that people do tend to vote for what they believe is in their best interests. Um, people tend to act in, in their best interests. Um, 
my, my concern was what if somebody tried to, you know, or a group of voters tried to game the system somehow that they would enact this and then that same year they would try to buy a whole bunch of new, you know, all sorts of gold-plated brand new ladder truck and brand new this, that, and the other thing and, and add all kinds of additions that year to try to pass this measure and then in the same year pass a whole bunch of warrant articles to just expand the rec center and expand the library and get that overpass people wanted but they didn't want to really pay for it and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, locking it in for three years is a way of kind of protecting the business community from a, just a sudden surge resulting from people saying, hey, we'll get the power plant to pay for it. And that, that's, at, that actually is what happened in Seabrook. Um, the power plant came in, it was paying 85 to 90 percent, and people just said, well, the power plant will pay for it. Brand new fire station, even though we already had one, brand new police station, brand new library, all sorts of, you know, brand new parks and accessories and things that are, that are definitely ni nice to have, but if the question had been, well, if you have to pay for it, would you pay for it? And now that the, now that the, the nuclear power plant only pays about 40 percent, a lot of people are saying, wow, this is, this is really expensive. Our tax bill has gone, it, it's more than doubled. Um, you know, so that's kind of hence the idea. But the reason for the three-year lock-in rate is, is, is to provide business would get at least some benefit. The benefit that they get is the stability and being protected from, um, you know, what they used to call in the old days the tyranny of the majority, that, that it, is, it is possible to have a majority of people in town just say, hey, let's get some free stuff. Um, tax me, tax the, oh, don't tax me, don't tax the, tax the man behind the tree. Um, you know, we don't, we want to have all the nice things, but we don't want to pay for it. I wanted to have a, a provision that said, okay, you can have it, but you've got to pay for it. It's not right to, to keep shifting the burden to somebody else. Okay, you have Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Um, I'm from Merrimack, and I doubt this is something we would do. Our, our two biggest uh, non-residential property taxpayers are Fidelity Investments and InBev. We have an Anheuser-Busch brewery. Um, I don't think they would be really happy if we passed this. But when reading through it, why there, it seems like the only option for a, a municipality is to raise taxes on non-residential property owners. Um, why is there not a provision in case there might be a circumstance a town wants to lower the, the uh, property tax for non-residential? Maybe they want to attract more business or, or something like that. I mean, is, why is only one option available? Well, it is, it is a local option. So I, I, I can kind of guess which way my three towns would likely go with this measure. I, it's just a guess. It's kind of speculation. Uh, Merrimack, I don't know. I, in fact, there there are a lot of towns where, sorry, there are a lot of towns where 80 to 90 percent of the tax bill just comes from residential right now. I used to live in um, Deerfield, and I think it was 90 percent was residential, so there'd be no reason even to contact the town's lawyer and have them look at this. But there are a lot of towns that are near 50-50. Um, I think that it's it's fairer in the long run to business to incentivize the towns to create that more business friendly environment. And I, and I kept bringing up zoning and land use regulations, but there are actually a lot of different things on you know permits and licensing fees and expansions and, and, and whether or not the selectmen should give an abatement, whether or not the planning board should offer a conditional use permit, whether or not the zoning board gives, gives out variances and whatnot. Towns choose and they, they can go very fast one way or the other. And I, I, I felt like, while I was on the planning board, I felt like Seabrook could very quickly go from business friendly to not business friendly at all, that, it could, that they could pull up the drawbridge and say, no more, no more development. The same way in the 1980s they said, no more apartment developments. Absolutely none. And, there, and there's, there's a degree of adamacy by people who've lived in Seabrook for a long time. No more apartments, because they felt like they were overloaded. They said, started saying the same thing about big box stores and, and industrial developments and large business developments. Um, there'd be no more large. There'd be no more large buildings coming into town. Um, and 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 this the state 
if more and more towns start moving away from the business friendly environment to just pulling up the drawbridge and using their zoning powers or their or the town powers or the selectman's abilities um, powers, um, there'd be a, 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 a real stunt in 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 large business development. So um, you have Anheuser Busch, you have or Portsmouth has a lot of large business development. They have a lot of large companies. If they said, hey, we don't want any more large big box stores or car dealerships or anything coming in, um, because now the cost is just a little too high to serve them. If they're saying, hey, that actually hurts us as property taxers, that taxpayers, takes away that incentive to maintain a business friendly environment. And there are there are towns and cities that aren't that business friendly right now. Is a follow up? Thank you. There may be a distinction between commercial, which I think you're citing, and industrial, but uh, I, I'm still looking for the answer why you think raising taxes on businesses is business friendly. Uh, the, every single business owner I knew in Seabrook, every single one I talked to had a home and a business, that they have two properties. And they told me that when I brought this suggestion to them, Every single one said that they would see basically a net savings. I mean, obviously, the nuclear power plant would pay more. Obviously, there are a few big box stores that would pay more. But remember, right now, as taxpayers, our, our total payout for big box stores, big box retail, it was something like 18 or $19 per thousand. And our tax rate is $16 per thousand. So we're actually being forced to subsidize certain types of business development. And as people became aware of that, there were full-on department heads, there were planning board members now saying, wait a minute, there are certain types of business development, we can't recoup the, the cost. We can't even come close. So why can't we charge $17 per thousand if we're paying $18 to $19 per thousand? Another thing that a lot of voters in my area, and not just in Seabrook, said is that they don't like being forced to subsidize. And this is this was left, right, middle, libertarian, everywhere on the political spectrum. Everyone hated having to pay extra taxes, even if it were a small amount. But if they're having to pay extra taxes to subsidize business development, they hated that once they found out that they were having to subsidize anything. So really, big box retail should be paying its own way. And if it costs if it costs over eighteen dollars per thousand to provide myriad public services to them, then it's 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 um, I don't think that it's unfair to charge them seventeen dollars to provide eighteen or nineteen in service. As if anything, in that for that case, for for towns like ours, this would just reduce the subsidy to business. Okay. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Nick Herman. Oh, is that it for me? That's it. Okay. I don't mean to run, but I've got another hearing going. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for having me speak. My name is Nick Norman, and I am an advocate for landlords. I follow landlord-tenant law throughout the state. I'm a government, I am the government chair for the Apartment Association of New Hampshire. And personally, I own 48 units and I've been involved as a landlord for about 35 years here in New Hampshire. Our legislative update that follows all new bills goes out to about maybe 2,500 or so landlords across the state. So I'm very connected into landlord tenant law and the landlord side advocating for landlords. <clears throat> I don't have a lot to say on this bill, and I don't quite fully understand uh, everything that Max was presenting, particularly how it's business friendly to raise property taxes on businesses. Our concern is that it seems like this is a slippery slope. If you begin to have a different tax rate for residential and a different tax rate for commercial, does that mean we're leaning towards, well, now why don't we have a separate tax rate for multifamily owners and uh, other categories? We're just concerned that this is a real slippery slope of what could happen in the future. It could be the, the opening of a door into a really bad situation in the, in the rental housing industry. 
and we're very, very concerned about affordable housing and anything that increases the cost of managing, running rental property. So that, that's really my only point. The bill doesn't say anything about that right now. It, it only says we want to be able to raise property taxes on commercial. But again, we, we fear for what that will lead to. And it seems to me that the property tax system is already fair. You pay based on the value of what you own. So resident, I mean, commercial properties are already paying a higher amount because usually commercial properties are valued higher than residential properties. I'd be happy to take any questions. Anybody have any questions? Seeing none, do we have another speaker? Catherine Heck? Good afternoon, Chairman Dolan and committee members. My name is Catherine Heck from the New Hampshire Municipal Association, and we are only commenting on this bill. We do not have a position. We did want to point out that the bill as written does raise some question on how the division of tax rates might work on a practical level, both from assessing and from setting the tax rate. So talking about our assessors, our tax collectors, and the DRA, as currently we do not have provisions in our software or forms to set two tax rates, so that's one consideration. However, what I did want to touch on was what we know from other states that allow for a local option, which we do appreciate, it's a local option, when they adopt a tax scheme that is intended to shift the burden from residential to commercial industrial, is that there is an unintended consequence over time. It does seem like a short-term policy solution. However, we've heard from other states that have similar tax systems that are adopted locally, that what happens is costs are then passed on to the tenants. Once the tenants have to pay more, they tend to leave. So then they move to the next town and they find another community who has not adopted this provision. So in the long run, this actually hurts the community. So imagine in 10 years or 15 years, that piece of property that was once a vibrant business now is falling apart. It has decreased the value of the entire neighborhood because it's unkept. Perhaps it's gone defunct and is now you know, taken by tax deed. So now the town is getting no dollars from that. So we have seen um, from our neighbors just to the south who have this scheme, they do not recommend that it's a long-term policy solution. So while I appreciate that there's three years written into this particular bill that it would lapse, it appears in three years, there's nothing to say that a petition warrant article won't come forward because the residential taxpayer is paying less money, regardless of what it's doing to the economy of that town. So we did want you to perhaps consider the long-term economic impact of this legislation as you deliberate this bill. Additionally, in New Hampshire's constitution, we would like to point out Article 5 that tax rates have to be proportionally assessed. So whether reasonable and a proportional um, become unconstitutional in this case, we, we don't have a legal opinion on, but that's something that you might want to consider as well. And I will take any questions that you have. Questions for Ms. Heck? Eric? So you mentioned in your testimony that there are some other states that have laws like this with local options for different rates. Could you list some of those states for us? So if we want to do our look into um, how they implement it. Sure, Massachusetts, New Jersey, to, to name two that are um, in New England. That's more closer to how we, we operate because they do local property taxes. They're not county run. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hex, for taking my question. In other states that have similar laws, don't they also have prop, um, income tax and sales tax and other taxes that is offsetting the revenue? Uh, yes, those states do have those other taxes. That's correct. A quick follow-up. Yes, so that would be not comparing apples to apple, apples to orange, isn't it? Well, we're talking about property tax. 
So they assess their property tax at a different rate in those states. They have different tax schemes. So what happens is it drives businesses out of one town and they move to a town that has not adopted these provisions. So I would say on the taxing side of the property tax bill, it probably is the same because they're paying income tax and sales tax in that state if they remain regardless of where they're physically located within the geography of that state. So um, I understand, but with that, uh, you know, because we don't have any other revenues, this may not just, uh, you know, to move the businesses out of that uh, town or, um, but maybe out of the state altogether. Well, In this case. I, I can't speak to that, but it's possible. Yes. Thank you for taking my question. Um, Tax policy has a dramatic effect on business. I've been told that with the uh, proliferation of malls along our southern border, um, that they all have a provision in their leases that if there is ever a sales tax enacted in the state of New Hampshire, that their leases will be null and void. Do you know if that's true? I do not know if that's true. Thank you. Any other questions for NHMA? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you Catherine very much. Hecht. And our last speaker is D David uh, Juve. Welcome, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Dave Juve. I'm a senior vice president for public policy for the Business and Industry Association. We serve as New Hampshire statewide chamber of commerce. We have approximately 400 plus employers with over 80,000 employees here in the state. So I represent the people that would be most impacted by this legislation. And although I tried to do the mental gymnastics on how raising taxes on a business is business friendly, I was not able to figure that one out. Uh, but I encourage all of you to go to the employers in your communities and ask them that. I think the answer will be different than uh, those received by the prime sponsor. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll keep my uh, comments very short, but I just want to put this proposal in the context of what's going on with employers in the state right now. Right now in New Hampshire, because of our unique tax structure, business taxes are among the highest of any state in the country. Our business enterprise tax is unique to New Hampshire. We can't even compare that to other states because no other state has it. Similarly, Property taxes are high here, and I I'm, I'm a property taxpayer. You're probably all property taxpayers. Probably everybody in the room is a property taxpayer. We understand that property taxes are high, but there is the benefit here that we also often talk about, about not having an income tax on New Hampshire sourced income or a general sales tax. So there is a counterbalance. Businesses are not only paying those high business taxes, but they're already paying high property taxes, just like everyone else. This bill, which is designed to shift the property tax burden to employers, will make that even worse. These are employers right now around the state who are already struggling because they're having a hard time finding labor. They're already struggling uh, because of um, the ramifications of the COVID pandemic, either um, having a direct impact on their business in, in terms of employee absenteeism or what's more likely happening, a reduction in business. If you're a hotel or a restaurant, you're seeing the people coming into your business at about 50% of what it was pre-COVID. So it's not like they have a lot of extra revenue to, to uh, give back in a way this proposal suggests. 
we're happy to do our part in communities and pay our property taxes because we benefit from the fire departments and the police departments and the good educational systems. Those are all important to our businesses. But please think long and hard about doing something that is as unfair as what this bill suggests. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Go ahead, Representative Gallagher. So um, with you mentioning businesses having a hard time finding people to fill jobs, isn't part of the reason for that due to the housing shortage we have? So wouldn't making housing more affordable by having their property taxes be lower help those businesses find more people to work in those jobs? Well, uh, BIA has long been involved in uh, uh, workforce housing issues. I've appeared before this committee this session on workforce housing bills. Um, and certainly we're concerned about the uh, availability and affordability of housing. Um, I believe it's a bit of a stretch to suggest that uh, an individual who isn't able to afford a house now would somehow be able to afford it if this legislation passed. And I would add that there are also a lot of other factors uh, that are making it difficult for employers to find work. It's not just housing. Thank you. Uh, Representative um, Mancuti, do you have your hand up? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Zue, for taking my question. Certainly. Um, uh, something caught my attention in your statement. You said um, education and workforce, and isn't that, don't you think that having good workforce providing all the infrastructure in terms of education, roads, and fire is critical for a thriving community? In that case, you know, the um, taxes or the revenue for the municipalities, and it benefits both businesses as well as the residential communities. Just by cutting taxes, we are not going, you know, or shifting burden from one to other, we are not going to enhance the growth of the community. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I'd like to make two points. One, we're not talking about cutting taxes here. We're talking about shifting the burden to uh, employers in your community, uh, which I'm opposed to. I want to emphasize the importance of education and especially our public education system, which is where most of our employees and future employees come from, and the importance of making sure that those in educational institutions are funded appropriately, which most businesses around the state, at least the ones I work with, are more than happy to do because they recognize how critical it is. Yes, and Representative Clay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Mr. Juve, for Certainly. taking uh, my question. Um, based on, on your knowledge of the business, obviously, you've been in the BIA for a very, very long time. It seems like a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I first met you in your office and had a conversation with you about business taxes. But um, the my, my question is, um, do you feel that um, smaller businesses or maybe even larger businesses might pick up from a community that puts us in and go next door to a community that may not. I know that's a big burden for them to pick up and move, but do you think that something like that could possibly happen and potentially shift the burden back to residents because now it becomes yeah. 90%? Well, I want to be honest with you. The likelihood of a company like uh, Fidelity was mentioned and Anheuser-Busch and um, the uh, nuclear power plant uh, the likelihood, or hospitals, the likelihood of those businesses picking up and moving is, is not likely at all. I do think there's a potential for mischief with smaller uh, companies. Your, your, I call them mom and pop shops. That may be unfair, but, but you all know what I'm talking about. Smaller, smaller businesses where it's quite easy to, to pick up and move uh, to another community. Um, I think there is some potential for that. And I think with, even with the larger companies that aren't likely to move, 
this may impact other decisions that they're making in terms of hiring. So I, I think there's, I think a proposal like this has, um, we've all heard about unintended consequences, and I think there could be a lot of mischief that would come from a, a bill like this becoming law. Thank you. Yes, Representative Powell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for taking my question. You mentioned unintended consequences. And the um, prime sponsor, he focused a lot on the Seabrook nuclear, power, nuclear station. Do you think that if this were to become law in some communities who had non-residential property that was a power generator um, that now would have to be paying more in property taxes, that that might result in higher energy costs for business, which I know is a big consideration in New Hampshire, many businesses cite high energy costs um, in, you know, a, as a problem for their business. Do you, so do you think this bill would even raise the cost for businesses even further? I think it has potential for raising electricity costs for everybody, residential mm -hmm. uh, individuals and other businesses. Uh, electricity rates, as I'm sure you're aware, are established by the PUC, and when a rate request is requested, or when a rate request is made, the utility has to provide justification for, for the rate uh, increase. And I guarantee you that if their uh, taxes are going up significantly, that is something that they would use as, as part of a justification. Thank you. Yes, Representative Matt Dory. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, thank you, Mr. Gervais, for taking my question. I think hopefully this is an easy one. <laughs> Does the BIA have statistics on how many uh, businesses are also, or how many business owners actually live in the communities for which they have their businesses? Uh, and I don't need yeah. the answer now. I'm just curious if, because the, the sponsor said that a lot of those people, but, you know, is that true? I know it's not in Northampton. That is not the case in Northampton. Uh, we don't have those okay. statistics, and I'm not, you, it, would, it would take an exhaustive study to come up with them, but I think you raised a good point that uh, just because you run a business in the community, regardless of whether it's a large business or a small business. It doesn't necessarily mean you live there, but even if you did, he made the point about um, his, the businesses he talked to being supportive of this because they saw the potential for their, their home property tax to go down, even if their business property tax went up. But we're kind of talking about two different things. The home property tax is a personal expense that we all pay. The business property tax is a business expense, which is deductible um, as a part of your, your business return. The business is paying for it. The individual isn't. Hey, uh, the re remote uh, feedback on this particular bill is two people support it and five people oppose it. So thank Am you I all your, done? Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. You thank you, members of the committee. Appreciate it. Uh, that closes the... Uh, the hearing on HB 1365 and we're going to we're going to take a 10 minute recess and uh, representative power could you join me over here with representative trip and Pacella?
The what? The concept would be oh, yeah. Thank you. 
Spectrum of understanding. Sure. Yes, there is. <laughs> you know, I, I, I can ask. I was just going to say, since I'm in the middle of the beginning, I don't know if I want to go with this five or six o'clock thing in the booth because I'm just waiting for it. I'm sure that he had a. I read that, Bill. You oh, I was watching well, the sure there. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends. If you opened it at night for dinner, you have to finish it at night. I'm just spinning it everywhere. It reminds me of. Well, what do we got left? I'm willing to pay for all of my six minutes that I spent in this presentation. Well, when you catch people's eye, you, you catch Rosemary's eye, you go like this. <laughs> I had that on my truck. Yeah, when I, if I'm, if someone's coming behind me, and they they come like this, like in front of John, my right butt cheek vibrates. And if they're coming from that side, my left butt cheek vibrates. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and the next one. That's right. Now, you're clear on how to deal with your husband during this testimony? What's that? You're clear about how to deal with your husband? Yeah, I'm just doing it the regular way. I mean, for the sake of time? Should I no, I'm just saying about where you're going to go and what you're going to say and all that stuff. I think so, yeah. That's what we talked about last night, or the day before. Her 
right, let's get started. Okay, we're going to uh, uh, conclude my recess here with a starting to hear the next bill of 1393, which is the relative to the adoption of school district budget caps. And uh, Representative Representative, you're going to introduce the bill for us? Yes. Please, please okay. Start. Thank you, Mr. Chair and fellow committee members. As the prime sponsor, I appreciate the opportunity to introduce to you today House Bill 1393 relative to the adoption of school district budget caps. For the record, I am Representative Diane Power. I represent the towns of Brookline and Mason in Hillsborough County District 26. This bill establishes the requirements and the procedure for the adoption of school district budget caps. This bill is a constituent request. Year after year, New Hampshire taxpayers are faced with ever increasing school district budgets and spending, despite continued declining student enrollments. This bill is enabling legislation that provides a mechanism for taxpayers of a local school district to address the unsustainable trend and to bring spending to reasonable levels. As enabling legislation, the legislative body at a school district meeting may adopt the school district budget cap by a three-fifths supermajority vote. The Warren article to adopt this budget cap specifies a gross cost per student as well as an annual inflation adjustment factor. The inflation Inflation adjustment factor can be a fixed percentage or an index from the United States Bureau of Labor Statistics, such as the Consumer Price Index for all urban consumers or, for example, the Employment Cost Index. Annually, the school district budget cap is determined by multiplying the gross dollar amount per student by the student enrollment, which is defined as a school district average daily membership as of the previous October 1st. This figure is then multiplied by the annual inflation adjustment factor to yield the budget cap for that fiscal year. Notably, the budget cap will tend to decrease with lower student enrollments and increase with higher student enrollments. At the annual meeting, the total proposed spending of all warrant articles presented by the governing body or the budget committee is limited by this budget cap. And the legislative body can increase or decrease appropriations in warrant articles using the normal procedures. However, when an appropriation will exceed the budget cap, approval to override the budget cap will require a three-fifths supermajority vote, a ballot vote. Requiring this supermajority to override the budget cap ensures that any spending that exceeds the budget cap is in fact warranted and is overwhelmingly supported by the legislative body. Additionally, this bill stipulates that in the case of warrant articles proposing bonds, notes, or other multi-year expenditures, only the first year estimated costs shall be used in calculating appropriations for the purpose of overriding the budget cap. This bill also outlines the procedures for overriding the budget cap in a school district that has adopted the official, ba ballot, the official ballot form of meeting. And lastly, this bill also specifies the procedure for overriding the budget cap when the SAU alternative budget procedure under RSA 194 dash C colon 9A has been adopted. In conclusion, this bill specifies a budget cap based on a gross dollar amount per student, an inflation factor, and the average daily membership. This bill establishes a three-fifths supermajority to override the budget cap, and this bill provides flexibility in spending while at the same time maintaining fiscal responsibility to taxpayers by scaling the budget cap upwards or downward, 
downwards with the changing student population. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That concludes my introduction. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was speaking with Representative Power last night, and we talked about the fact that her husband was going to be doing some testifying today on a bill that she has uh, int just introduced. And uh, so, uh, Mr. Power, if you can I get you to s stand up? And uh, you're not Mr. Power. Well, not yet. Uh, I just want to make sure that that it's identified who he is, and that uh, that this is a disclosure of that. And I want to make sure that's all uh, understood. Is there anybody on the committee have any questions about that? Okay. Come on up. Thank you, committee members. I'm the Vice President of the School District Governance Association, and my name is Eric Power from Brookline. And what I wanted to talk about today was about this bill. Um, the School District Governance Association, or SDGA for short, is made up of current and former school board and budget committee members from across the state of New Hampshire. It's an all-volunteer organization. Myself, I am a former school board member in the Hollis Brookline Cooperative School District, served there for three years. SDGA is, been, was founded to promote educational excellence, prudence in budgeting, and responsible governance in school districts. The SDGA membership reports that school budgets are increasing faster than inflation across the state, despite declining student enrollments. I actually was uh, the chair of a BudCom study committee in the town of Brookline uh, two years ago, where we looked at school districts and towns, and I'll talk about school districts because that's the fo focus here. We looked at 26 peer school districts to Brookline, and we looked at what they were doing in terms of budgets, what was happening. And so we normalized it. So we looked at, essentially took out inflation and took out um, the changes in population, and we found that 21 of the 27 school districts in this sample had per student costs exceeding inflation over that four-year period. So it's definitely a problem. The other example, I think there's a handout here. I wanted to point to um, example student enrollment and appropriations history. This is actually from the Hollis Brookline Cooperative School District. The blue bars are showing the student enrollment. You can see that it peaks in, in FY10 and was da is going down since that time. The red line on there is actually showing the actual appropriations that has been done for the, the, the co-op school district. And we'll talk a little bit in a second, but the green line is if you had adopted this school budget district, this school budget dis, uh, school district budget cap with the CPIU as your uh, inflation index, what the cap would have done. Mr. And Mr. It, Power, just so you know, yours is in color. We're in black and white up here. Okay. The bottom line that you see is the, is the green line. The top line that's going up almost off the chart is the red line. So that's the, that's the actual appropriations. You see a label on it so you can follow it. Thank you for letting me know that. So this is hypothetical that if you had adopted this, we went back in time and said in 2006, what, FY06, if we had adopted this, this is what would have happened. So you can see despite the dis declining enrollment, the budget was allowed to go up. It just wasn't allowed to go up quite as fast. This is an example how you would apply the uh, school district budget cap. See, this, the graph, the other graph there shows the per student cost, the gross cost per student, and the taller graph is the actual, and the inflation adjusted one, if, we, if it had stayed uh, and adjusted with inflation, is the, is the lower graph. So that, that kind of shows you here that the, uh, the increase over this time period was 80, almost 88% for the actual per gross the gross cost per student, and the CPIU adjusted was only up 43%, so it was up more than double the rate. The budget cap provides a reasonable approach to budgeting. The budget cap, cap as you've heard, includes a dollar figure for gross cost per student and an inflation factor, which can be a fixed percentage or a U.S. government index chosen by the legislative body. 
The budget cap is, is the gross cost per student times the number of students times the inflation factor calculated every year. And it basically adjusts spending based on the number of students and what's happening with inflation. Small adjustments are going to be generally made over time because populations don't change rapidly. And if an urgent need to exceed the budget cap arises, it can be approved with supermajority support. This is just like we do with million dollar bonds. That's a significant financial commitment requiring a three-fifths supermajority approval. Exceeding the budget cap needs the same level of approval. As enabling legislation, voters of each school district can propose or adopt the school district budget cap. It's not forced on anyone. It's not a mandate. School districts can decide for themselves if it's, if it's appropriate for them. School appropriation trajectories are unsustainable from the data I've shown you. Many, including those in the SDGA, recognize that taxpayers do not have the unlimited ability to pay property taxes. This provides a mechanism that can be adopted by a supermajority of school district voters to help shape the planning and budgeting process. Thank you for your support of New Hampshire citizens excellence in education, and please recommend ought to pass out of committee on this bill. Thank you. Thank you. I have a, I have a uh, comment or a question for you. Um, when you're looking at cost per student, I know you're talking about gross cost per student, but I don't want to break that down a little bit. Uh, so when, when, let's use Hollis Brookline. When you're looking at the cost per student, you're looking at all the variable costs, are you adding in the fixed costs for the, the mortgage for the building and and so forth, or, or where, where do those costs reside? Well, the gross cost per student, it's on the slide, this slide here with the bar graph kind of by itself. It's the total appropriations for the school district. So it's fixed, variable, everything, divided by the number of students that you have. Thank you. That answers it. Thank you. Yes, uh, Representative Clee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. That was actually kind of part of my question to um, I, I understand how you calculated the cost per student, but when you're saying that enrollment goes down, um, the the cost per student automatically is going to kind of rise a little bit because of those fixed costs. Is 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 that part of this calculation? I, I don't doubt any of your numbers. This this looks great, and I appreciate that. But my question to you is: fixed costs will remain the same, you know, building costs, fuel costs, et cetera. And if you have less students, you spread that out amongst those less students, that cost per is going to go up automatically. I, I know you're looking at the variable cost, but do you have a way of figuring that in? Because CPI does not always affect um, um, energy costs and, and things like that. So that's just my question to you. Well, depending on wh whatever index you pick, um, employment cost index, CPIU, they, will, they all take into account energy. I hear your point about fixed costs, yes, fixed costs will go up, and that's part of what the legislative body has to take into account when they set the per cost student that they want to set for this adopting this Warren article. I think a wise legislative body would probably pick something that's a little higher just to take that into account, and they would, uh, you know, they, they would do that. If there was a dramatic drop in students, there's going to have to be some tough choices made. And right now, the cho tough choices in general aren't being made. The staffing does not go down proportionally. And that's where you would have to make some of the choices there. So the whole idea of a budget cap is not just to rubber stamp what's being asked for by the administration or even the school board. It's for to force tough choices to be made in times when there's to keep budgets from getting out of control, as they have been. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking uh, my question. It's My question is also based on um, similar. Uh, how would the fixed costs on school infrastructures and personnel can be so agile as you are predicting, you know, proposed or actual, and it's always lagging behind. I did serve on the school board in our uh, uh, city. And um, and we were building two high schools, so that you know, understand that agility is lagging behind, and this won't this limit the local governing body to do the best for the education of the current population. 
because the drop, by the time the population, uh, school population drops and you catch up with the budget, you know, the ebb and flow of that, you can't time it, just like the stock market. So how would you account for that? Well, it's a choice of the legislative body and with how they choose their number. And if you look at any school district budget, the lion's share of the budget, and I would say some place in the neighborhood of 70 to 80 percent, is based on variable costs. And there's probably something in the order of 20 percent at best for fixed costs. So yes, the fixed costs are going to still be there, but they're, they're a minority of what's in there. So I think choosing the number that you use for per student gross stu per student cost is a key to getting the supermajority support of the legislative body to take that into account. It's not the, the goal of the bill to tell people how to make their priorities among different types of spending, but it gives them a tool in order to uh, propose this legislation and adopt this policy locally. Uh, yes, follow up, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, follow up, you know, spending, spending cap, I get it. But education of the future generation is also an investment. Unless we invest today, we don't reap the benefit tomorrow. So that investment, when you look at the um, school funding as investment, how would your approach change, or would it change? The school district budget cap is decided by the legislative body of a, of a school district. They have to decide for their school where, how much they want to invest and at what level they can sustain. As I mentioned, taxpayers don't have the unlimited ability to pay, so there's some limit to what they can pay. I do agree that the education is the future. That's why I served on the school board. It's, it's important to me, but it's also important to be able to do that in a fiscally responsible way. And I think that that can be done. The spending cap provides that mechanism to help make that, bakes it into the budgeting process so that you're making more intelligent decisions earlier on so that you adhere to the budget cap. And if the case is that you really need to make those investments and you can get a super majority of the voters to buy into that, this, this bill lets you do that. And so I think it's flexible in that way. It helps put, it helps put some limits though on spending that the legislative body believes is right for that community in that school district. Thank you, uh, Representative Tripp. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking my question, and I'll try and lean over this way so you can see me. Uh, I'm gonna assume that uh, fixed costs are uh, set and you, the school board really doesn't have a lot of uh, control over them because it's something that happened in the past. But uh, I'm interested in variable costs. Could you give me some examples of what uh, variable costs in the school are? Variable costs will be associated with, um, you know, all the people costs. So how much does how much do you pay your teachers, your administrators, your SAU office? Um, how many students do you have in special education? What are their services? Um, you know, inflation is some of those costs. It's 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 it's, it's what's in the most part of the budget is the people costs. The amount that's spent on buildings, heating, and those sorts of things tends to be lower. And the inflation index will take care of some of those to some extent. But that's why I mentioned 75, 80% of, of school district budgets are variable because they function as a function of the number of students, which should be a function of the number, you know, that should, that should affect how many teachers, administrators, paras, support staff, and SAU office that you have. And that those decisions have to be made appropriately. You can't keep the same number of teachers when your your school population has gone down 15%. Follow up? Uh, yes, I have a follow up. Uh, one of the things that, uh, as you said, drives the, uh, the variable cost is the, the, uh, the personnel cost. Are the personnel cost in your estimation uh, going down with the decrease in uh, students? The personnel costs are the main reason why the school budgets have gone up and up because the, the class sizes have gone down and there hasn't been a scaling of the number of teachers, the number of administrators 
uh, appropriately in a lot of school districts across New Hampshire. If you look at why in that BUDCOM study when we were looking at what was happening with school budgets, you know, 78% of them had costs that were exceeding inflation, and these are recent numbers. And so those are all being driven by personnel costs. They're not being driven by fixed costs. Yes, thank you for taking my question. Um, having served on the, the school board locally where I live in Litchfield, I realize that all students are not the same. And a budget can get blown out of the water with a uh, multiple handicapped person. And, and the cost for one child moving into the school district and requiring buku services can can really hurt immensely above and beyond what the per pupil cost is i'm wondering how this plan would accommodate that sort of thing right so my background is that i'm an engineer and i i I'm going to talk a little about statistics and such, but there's the thing, there's a concept called the law of large numbers. Law of large numbers says you tend to reach an average the more that you have of something. So when you have a large group of students, you are going to have, you're going to have a, an average that's going to be spread out over a larger group and larger group. You are going to have the occasional outlier there with the special education students. And you will have to deal with that. And that would be a case in which the school board would have to go to the community, to the school district, and ask for a, a supermajority override to get the funds to take care of that student if they were that astronomical. So that, that, that's, that would be the mechanism there. But I, I believe if you have a school district of any large size, there's always going to be a few students that are present. So they're always going to be there and that's going to be taken into account when you set your uh, gross cost per student when you pass the Warren article. So that's how I would do it. And if you had the special case come along, that would have to be something that you would have to bring to the legislative body and show that that's needed. And I'm sure if that was the case, I believe that a supermajority would support that to support the students in their community. Representative Mayor Gioli. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question. My question is about Roman 4, parent A, and why you only consider the first year's payment of a bond with the article. And the example I will give you is the town of Northampton has a bond where year two and thereafter is double what year one is. And therefore, year one of the bond is the only one, I'm asking is, is only year one of the bond counting towards the cap? And does that create a problem for the school district if the warrant article is approved? So if, this, if the school district adopts this enabling legislation, they're going to need to plan for that. They can't just look at that year's cost. Sure, they'll get a break on the interest-only payments on the bond the first year. And this is a thing I complain about at every school district meeting where they say the tax impact is going to be a nickel per thousand. But they're telling about the first year because the next year it might be 15 cents per thousand because it has interest in principal, not just interest. So... You would, they have to, the school board and the budget committee, if there is one, would have to plan for that, not in the year that it happened necessarily, but would have to know that they have to have that headroom in their budget when they're putting forth a, uh, a bond. They have to know that it, they might get by the first year, but they have to look ahead a year to see what it's going to do to their budget in the following years. So it puts a little more, makes them think about the budget in more of a, a long-term perspective, which I think is too much lacking today, to think about how a bond would impact them. Because like it or not, the taxpayers are still going to pay it. It's, it. They get a break the first year, but the second year is when it, and, and subsequent years is where it kicks in. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question. Uh, you made a comment that um, one of the needs for this bill is that staffing is not going down proportionally to a decrease in student enrollment. But um, is that presuming that students leave, like if, let's say 100 students are leaving a district, 
that they're all coming from, let's say, four classrooms, so you can lay off four teachers. I mean, you can have, a, in my district, we've seen, you know, several hundred students leave, but it's random throughout the district. They're not, it wouldn't, it might decrease class size by maybe two, but it's certainly not enough to lay off a teacher. So I was wondering how that proportionality, th that logic works in this bill. Well, the, the bill, you know, you would have to look at what's happening across each grade. And so I agree when you have a small number of students per grade that disappear, that's not going to be a big effect. But when you start having, you know, 12, 13, 15 percent of students, there is going to be a point at which you don't need a teacher or you don't need two teachers. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be, I call an engineering quantization. So, you, you, you know, you don't quantize to lose a teacher until you've lost a certain minimum number of students. So you would have to take that into account when you're looking at the, the, um, the staffing levels, you know, in a school of a, of a significant size. So you would, once, once the students drop below a certain level, you're going to have to reduce cost. So, um, you know, in our school district, we keep adding principals and administrators. Our SAU has doubled that isn't going in the right direction with a declining population. So it's not just teachers, but it's also administrators. Why do we need more administrators with less students? So that these are all things that are personnel costs that have to be worked out. Um, but you, at some point, when you lose enough students, you're going to have to reduce staff. Okay. Follow up? Yeah, follow up. No, I, I agree. That's why election of school board members is important, because they will drive the budget. But when we getting getting to those the staffing, isn't a lot of that cost driven by the labor market? Especially, um, you know, if let's say a budget cap holds a average salary, let's say at thirty five thousand um, dollars, but neighboring districts are paying forty thousand dollars, but the budget cap doesn't allow an increase in salary to be competitive. I'm just saying, I think a lot of the labor costs, aren't they driven by the labor market and districts need to be able to participate in that labor market? I'm not sure I understand what the question is there, but you know, when the school district decides to do a budget cap, they, they have to know the pluses and minuses of it. And you know, if there is a budget cap and they're going in to negotiate with a teacher's union or going in to do a support, support staff uh, collective bargaining agreement, they're going to go in there with the backing of this school district budget cap, and they're going to say, look, we can only pay this much because of this budget cap. Otherwise, we're going to have to try to get a supermajority approval to get your collective bargaining agreement passed. And that's a decision that's going to be part of the union negotiations. It's going to cause some challenges. And that's, you know, that's what you're going to be looking for, some fiscal responsibility. Maybe some teachers will decide that the raises aren't big enough in Hollis Brookline, for example, and they're going to go work at Sauhegan or they'll go work in Nashua where the pay is better. That's, that's, that's definitely a risk, but that's something that the school district uh, voters decide on what they're, at the level at which they're willing to support. And it's like something you decide when you're going out to buy goods and services. If, if a steak costs $5 each, you might go buy four of them. But if a steak is $10 each, you might not buy that many. You might get less. It's a little bit of an analogy, but you might not be able to afford quite as many teachers. And that's where you'll have to look at maybe increasing uh, your, your class sizes to make up for it. Maybe you can keep up with the labor market, but you just can't have as many teachers. And that might be, the, that's, a, that's a decision that the school board has to make. Okay. Just okay. one more question, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, one other note I want to make is in the years, uh, the fiscal year 11, around 11, um, and then we saw a big jump after that. Um, that was caused when the state uh, reneged on its commitment to contribute to the state retirement plan. And so that burden fell on local districts and municipalities to cover that, that difference. Um, how would this adjust for things like that might might happen in the future where there is a downshifting of costs that is of no you know it, it has nothing to do with local school spending it's just now they have to pay for things like the retirement system that was a commitment of somebody else 
Well, it kind of gets back to the last answer that, you know, if there's costs that you can't control, and I agree the New Hampshire retirement system seems to be on an unsustainable trajectory. I don't like it myself. Um, but that's what we're inheriting. Hopefully the legislature will work on fixing it. But if, if those costs get so high that you're going to be forced to make some decisions in reducing staffing, you can't afford your school district budget cap, and frankly, the taxpayers don't have the unlimited ability to pay, you're going to have to start having less teachers in order to stay competitive and absorb these so-called um, out of, you know, costs you can't control. So I think that that's, that that's what this does. This forces some tough decisions, potentially, if the budgets um, rise unreasonably. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking another question for me. I'm hoping you can finish the sequence for me. The, the school board proposes a budget under the cap, assuming this is approved. And the budget committee approves the same budget under the cap. All good. Deliberative session in an SB2 town comes in, raises the budget over the cap. By warrant article, whatever the whatever the mechanism was, it's higher than the cap. As I read Roman three, the proposed appropriation is opposed is over the cap, but that appropriation also has to go to the ballot because something has to go to the ballot. What happens? So you're asking. I have a I have experience with both SB two and traditional because our Brookline school district is traditional. Our, our, SB, our Brookline town is SB2 and their co-op is traditional. So what happens at a deliberative session is they're setting up the ballot, just as you said, Representative. So when the ballot is tallied, they're going to go in order. Just like you would do it at a meeting, the ordering of the ballot makes a difference. And so once you reach that article that pushes you over the budget cap, if there is one, whatever article it will it is, will require a three-fifths supermajority of those voting to pass that article and any other articles afterwards that would also uh, break the cap. In the case of a, if the operating budget is the one doing that, which I anticipate was another one of your questions, you will have, you will, you have a proposed budget. I'm not sure everybody here understands SP2. You have a proposed budget and a default budget. If the proposed budget, if you get a majority, you're not going to get the proposed budget. You're going to get the budget that if it's over 50% but less than 60%, you're going to get the budget that's adjusted to meet the tax cap. If it's actually, yes, and if you get below 50%, you are going to get the default budget. If that default budget is also over the cap, that will be truncated to be compliant with the cap. And that's how that would work. Representative Yeoman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for taking my question. I just wondered if you could give me the source of your numbers about the decline in student population since 12, 13, 15. Is that a local number, or is it? Can you can I find it on the Google somewhere? What What are you asking for? You keep talking about the decline in student enrollment as being 13, 15 percent, and I just want to cite. I want to know where you got that number. Well, you can look at the Department of Education has statistics on that. You can see statewide we've been seeing that. Um, I gave you some data for the Hollis Brookline co-op here. You can see the numbers there. And, um, you know, I also had some recent numbers from the Budcom uh, study committee that was sponsored by the select board of Brookline. That was not for that length of time, though. That was a shorter window. But the Department of Education, if you look at any school district, and I believe you also might have received some testimony from Timberlane that also showed another example of a declining enrollment. It's the, 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 what we're experiencing here in New Hampshire is that there's just as not as many students being born to New Hampshire residents for whatever reason, and that's translating to a lower um, student population, and that's what, what we're experiencing now. Sometimes the schools should by, by bad luck, I guess, uh, end up with some really profoundly 
handicapped children. And they can't say, we can't afford you to have to attempt to educate them. And in some, some of those cases, there, the students are outplaced in very expensive uh, uh, institutions. I'm aware of uh, some that are in, in excess of $200,000 a year. And, and so when a school gets hit with those types of costs, how would this plan make an adjustment for that so that if we're going to spend 500000 on these three students, it, does that mean the rest of the students are going to get, get burned by, by being averaged in? Say we have to drop your the cost down. Like we're looking at collective costs. How, how do you how do you uh, de deal with something like that? Well, it depends on the size of your school district. So this is a decision for the local legislative body. If you have a large school district, you can tend to absorb those costs and spread them out over the larger population. In a small school district, you may or may not want the school district budget cap. It might not make sense for you in light of that potential situation. Again, it's sort of the law of large numbers. You, if you see these things periodically, and I think most large school districts have a, a few students in this category, they're going to be, they're going to be kind of baked into the number that you're using, the gross cost per student. And in the other cases I mentioned earlier, you can go to the legislative body and make your case that we have these extreme costs. Do you want this to affect all the other students, or will you do a supermajority override to support this for the four years, six years, whatever the number of years that student? But a tax cap was agreed to exceed it for whatever reason. Does that have to be re-energized or repassed every year, or is it, it become like a default budget that you know you we we had to raise the cap? $4 million for whatever. You start the next year $4 million higher, or are you, are you back down to where you were as like a zero-based budget? It's more along a zero-based budget, um, but it does have the inflation factor. So if you look at this graph here, that um, the colored graph that had the two lines on it, you can see both lines are going up very rapidly because that's using the most recent inflation statistic of CPIU, which under the uh, last year was seven and a half percent. Hate to say it, but that's where we're at. So this takes that into account. And so you you use the same gross student per cost, but it gets it get it's adjusted by either the fixed percentage compounded over time or by the uh, labor statistics metric that you've chosen. So it, it makes you so if you had a student you potentially may need to uh, do an override for a few years until it comes in line with the budget. So that, that yeah, that, that would be the case in that um, extreme, unfortunate financial situation. Thank you. Uh, Rep Representative Rosello. Yes, thank you again for, uh, I would like to follow up on what the chairman said. I think there would be a tendency if a, let's say we had a smaller school district and uh, uh, a new student moved into town that was profoundly, multiply handicapped. Everyone in town would know that this person moved into town. If there was an override to accommodate this one student, don't you think that there would be animosity in the town, possibly, toward this student? My my suggestion, and, and I'm not against the the concept of this, but you you need to somehow accommodate special education into this because if you don't, and I I know it's it's not beyond the realm of possibility that one student could be two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and I know that to be a fact because they outplace these students. And if it takes a, a supermajority to accommodate that, there's going to be a lot of bad feelings in town toward that situation. And that's my question. I, is there any way that you can accommodate that situation? 
I would have to think about that a little bit more if that would be something there. It would make the law more complicated. And, um, you know, I was on the school board. I had seen some of these $200,000 plus placements. I didn't know who they were, but I saw, you know, the, with, there was an ID number with the student essentially. So that's all I knew that they existed. So I, I'm fam I'm, I know they do exist and I'm familiar with that. But the, in, in, a, in a school budget that we have of $26 million, $27 million, that's something that you can adjust. If you have a small school district, maybe this budget cap isn't, isn't something that you want to choose as enabling legislation. It's not one size fits all. It makes sense for some communities, doesn't make sense for others. I would argue that the smallest communities probably wouldn't want that because of the situation. I think in a large you know, school district like the Hollis Brookline Co-op, I think you would see that that would not overly upset the apple cart in terms of the finances. I think it would be absorbed. So this is just an option for school districts. It, the school district doesn't have to adopt it. And I would probably advise them on against it on a, on a small school district for these reasons. Any other questions here? Right, Representative Mancatini. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking my question. Um, you uh, keep referring uh, to the numbers game, right? The larger the number, better. The adjusting and agility in terms of uh, per student spending and fluctuation. Um, Nashua is the second largest city in the state. And when I was on the school board, it was 13,682 students that we were responsible for. And what would you consider for what was the number for s towns that is small or medium or large? What is the uh, numbers game that uh, you're talking about now? You know, in terms of number of students, I would say, you know, ones that are on the ballpark of maybe 500 students in the school district or less, I would say would be on the small side, you know, that then the, the factor of what's being represented by uh, Representative Sells here, um, that's where that might come into play. But in a large school district where you have, you know, thousands of students, you know, I know Nashua is large, Manchester, um, the larger school districts don't, would be able to absorb those outliers more than um, a small school district. So I think it's up to the legislative body to determine if it's right for their community. Giving School districts an option is is what uh, I think is important here. And I didn't mention, but if they adopted this and they saw that it was backfiring, they could rescind it as well. Similarly, like you can rescind other things, you rescind it by a supermajority vote, you adopt by a supermajority vote. So if it didn't work for them, they're not stuck in it forever. If it really boxes them in and they just don't see a way out, they could they could unadopt the uh, budget cap. Additional speakers that want to contribute to the discussion. Thank you, uh, Mr. Power, for your testimony. Uh, Barrett Christina. From the New Hampshire School Boards Association. Feel free to use the uh, sanitizer. Thank you very much, Chairman Dole, and thank you, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Barrett Christina. I'm the Executive Director of the New Hampshire School Boards Association. Um, we're opposed to 1393. I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Um, the concerns and questions that the School Boards Association had with, uh, with the bill, I think, have been brought up sufficiently um, by members of the committee. There are a couple things that I would like to just um, you know, get the committee to, to, to recognize. Um, I haven't been in front of this committee. I don't know if I've been in this front of this committee this session. Um, I'm up here from time to time. My understanding is many of you have experience on local government, local school boards, or select boards. So when you're putting together your budget, what are you trying to do? You've got competing interests, don't you? You're trying to provide from a school context. You're doing, trying to provide the best possible education that you can for what the taxpayers are, are able to tolerate and able to bear. School board members are not just handing out money and, 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 and putting, you know, 
gold, you know, toilet seats on things and, and, and the latest, greatest football fields and, and the latest, greatest facilities. We're trying to manage our obligations to educate children with what the taxpayers can specifically pay. Um, I would take some issue with some of the comments um, that about fixed costs and, and static costs. Um, for those of you that have been on local government and you're going through your line items during budget season, um, where are your fixed costs? If your employees are under a collective bargaining agreement, you can't change that. It still costs the same to heat the building. Gasoline is a lot more expensive today than we probably budgeted, we meaning school district probably budgeted a year and a half ago when we were putting together our budgets. Um, also, the, the, on page line, uh, page one, line nine of the bill, it talks about um, uh, uh, plus an amount for an annual increase in inflation. I think we're all hoping that inflation may decrease at some point over the next couple of years, so we're not spending $10 on a steak. We can spend $7 on a steak, because um, I like steak too, and I'm being priced out of it now and then. Um, you know, the other aspects to, um, that I just sort of wanted to bring up generally, um, you know, uh, about the, 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 the declining en enrollment, Representative Gilman, I believe it was you that asked about declining enrollment. Um, off the top of my head, the numbers are on the Department of Education website. I believe statewide, we're down about 30 to 35,000 students over the last 20 years enrolled in, in public schools in New Hampshire. I think we topped out around the year 2000. We had about 200,000 stu students enrolled, and Representative, I see you sort of nodding along. I believe we're down to about 165,000 students. Um, I will say over the last 20 years, the New Hampshire legislature has downshifted cost after cost after cost after cost on, on, on local school districts. Um, the retirement costs have, have been brought up. Those go up every year. We've had some questions about um, special education costs. The state has underfunded special education ed, education aid to the tune of about $7 million statewide every year. Um, and just running some of the, 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 the quick numbers, Let's say we had a, a, student, a, a school district of 1,000 students, and that's K through 12, so 13 grade levels. That comes out to 76 students per grade level. If we lost 15% of our students over the course of, let's say, 10 or 15 years, um, that's 850 students divided by 13 years, 65 students per class, per grade level, excuse me. Um, some of these are also local decisions. The minimum standards um, for in public education, Department of Education Rule 306, state that the maximum number of students you can have in an elementary school classroom is 25. Some communities, through school board work and through the expectations for, of parents and, 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 and mothers and fathers, want that to be lower. They want that to be 18 students. Um, you know, in an elementary school, maybe even lower for a kindergarten class. So those are local values that are adopted by local school boards and then reflective in the budget. In conclusion, um, I'll say that there are already three mechanisms in law by which voters have the opportunity to limit uh, school district budgets. The first is RSA 32-5-C, as in CAT. That's a local tax cap. This bill is a local budget cap. The preceding provision in RSA 32 5 would be a local tax cap. I don't know how many districts have adopted that. Um, we know many of our cities have, have tax caps, towns and school districts. I don't know how many have adopted that statewide. Um, uh, the second is um, SB2. Many communities have adopted SB2 over the last 25 years in an attempt to go to the deliberative session and have a, a discussion and hopefully increase turnout can make motions from the floor about decreasing, you know, your budget or increasing your budget. And last, it's always been in um, my personal opinion, not necessarily a position of NHSBA, that if the voters want to increase or decrease a budget, they can come out to their annual meeting and do that and convince their neighbors if they make a motion to cut the budget. So we think there are sufficient provisions already in law um, that um, are, 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 are prudent and reasonable um, fiscal constraints um, that school boards may face um, with the voters having complete say over the adopted budget. And then the larger issue is some of the, the costs that we simply, you know, can't, you know, we have to find a way to absorb because they're obligations. We're still trying to do balance, providing an education and trying to provide a balance for what taxpayers can actually afford. So thank you, Mr. Chair. And with that, I'll, I'm happy to answer any questions from the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I didn't know you had a 
eye on your side. <laughs> Peripheral vision. <laughs> Peripheral vision. Thank you. Thank you for taking my question. You, you alluded to a lot of concerns that I have in terms of this uh, bill. How do you account? Do, does this take into account the bubble that we saw, uh, you know, the population bubble when there is a big uh, influx in kindergarten, and you have to accommodate them to go through for the next 12 years? It, it, thank and you for that the, is a big uh, yeah. challenge with this kind of a. Uh, it, it is. Thank you for the question, Representative. I didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at. Um, um, page one, I believe it's line seven, where it talks about the average daily membership of the school district. Currently, our, um, well, yes, we've had numbers of kids um, not, you know, declining enrollment over the last 20 years. Because of COVID, our current enrollment numbers are are not accurate, if, if it, I think is the best way to say it. For example, for the 2020, 20, COVID hit March of, tw of 2020. For the 2021 school district, we saw a significant drop in the number of children enrolled in kindergarten. Why? Because some of the schools were, were doing it virtual. Why am I going to, quote unquote, enroll my five-year-old in a kindergarten program? It might be a half-day kinder program when they're going to be staring at a Zoom. I'll try and get to my local library or find some instructional videos on YouTube. So we didn't, we, we saw those, you know, those numbers artificially declining. We also saw a number of students um, um, during the pandemic, quote unquote, leave the public school for maybe a private school that was open. But then they're coming back into the public school now that our school districts are, are back open. So it was a temporary dip and rise in our, in our en enrollments, at least for the last two years. So, um, and you, you make, again, a, a good point. Um, I don't know the, the kindergarten numbers, but if a district has a half day, kindergarten program right now and then they move to a full day kindergarten program right now I believe I don't think they're getting state aid for that so they may not factor into the um, the average daily membership that I have to go back and check but it still is a fluctuation in our student numbers that may not accurately reflect the number of students that we're trying to educate thank you uh, next we're going to hear from Brian Hawkins from the NEA thank you very much thank you for your Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. For the record, Brian Hawkins uh, here representing uh, NEA New Hampshire. We represent uh, over 17,000 educators across the state of New Hampshire um, here, here in uh, opposition to, to the bill. Um, I'll be very brief because I think the between the questions that were raised in the committee as well as uh, Mr. Christina's testimony, I think a lot of our, uh, we, we share uh, a lot of the same concerns. Um, what I would uh, just emphasize and add is that um, during some of the testimony, the, the, the first testimony, we heard a lot about you know, what, how do we deal with the uh, the things that come up, and that and that the answer to that was we need you know you need to take that into account when you're setting these uh, initial numbers that you're going to be going by for potentially um, in perpetuity. And um, we heard a lot of the questions that I think committee members asked about the various things that uh, can come up and how do you balance those competing um, priorities. It's through your annual budget process that we have. And so we think that that is a, uh, an, an adequate a method by which we should continue to operate by. Uh, an another piece I just wanted to raise is um, the the initial number that um, gets approved uh, when we're when we're putting the question to uh, voters. Um, if that initial dollar amount is not adequate, um, if this is if this comes in because uh, as I read this, it can come in by petition. And it is set at a number that is too low, you, and it is approved. Um, it, is, it is going to be very difficult for the for the school district to uh, to adapt for the students that it, that it has. And so, 
Um, I, I just wanted to add those um, pieces, and, and um, I'll, I'll conclude my testimony there, and happy to take any questions. Any questions for our speaker? Feel free to hold it more to you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be very quick. And um, in how agile can school districts be in terms of their staff? And that's a huge cost of the school budget. And can they be fired and hired on a, uh, how would that impact an education of a school? Well, I, I think that the, the, the biggest impact uh, concern we would have is, is, is for the students. So if you have a, a couple of students who end up, the, the, the enrollment goes down, you still have to have the teacher, you still have to have the paraeducator, you still have to have all of those uh, uh, of things and so, um, I think the biggest concern would be you know what what happens to class sizes and the quality of education that the students would have and um, that uh, can be best determined by a majority of the voters uh, at their annual town meeting and their elected uh, and their elected officials who uh, establish the budget. Well, thank you for your testimony. I appreciate you. Uh making yourself available for this uh, hearing. And for everybody that's in the audience Thank you. that uh, came for uh, HB 1667, and this is kind of a dry topic, uh, and it takes your, all your concentration to, uh, to stay with it and have it make sense to you. So I appreciate those of you who did that and, and were able to, uh, to listen and, uh, and absorb it. We have one more hearing. Well, let me close the hearing. Mr. Chair, for yeah. this one online, uh, 44 support, 108 opposed. 44 support, 108 mm -hmm. opposed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Our next hearing and last hearing is HB 1667. Representative Powell, would you like to introduce the bill? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, fellow committee members. As the prime sponsor, I appreciate the opportunity to introduce to you today House Bill 1667 relative to the standard and optional veterans tax credits and the all veterans tax credit. For the record, I am Representative Diane Power. I represent the towns of Brookline and Mason in Hillsborough County, District 26. This bill clarifies that veterans of the United States Armed Forces who served in any active duty status and those who continue to serve qualify for the veterans property tax credits. This bill comes from a constituent who brought to my attention an inconsistency regarding veterans in current New Hampshire statute. The term veteran is clearly defined in RSA 21,50. Under current New Hampshire law, veteran means any person who served in the armed forces for more than four years and continues to serve, or a person who has been honorably discharged or received an uncharacterized discharge based on a service-connected injury, illness, or disability. The issue that this bill addresses is that the Veterans Tax Credit Statutes in Section 72 do not align with the definition of a veteran under RSA 21,50. Thus, Armed force Forces members who are in fact veterans under New Hampshire law are not considered to be veterans, which is, both, which is a significant discrepancy. 
as a result of this inconsistency, currently serving veterans do not qualify for any of the veterans tax credits, including the all veterans tax credit, which is incongruent with the section title. The remedy that this bill provides is simple and straightforward. This bill amends the language in the standard and optional veterans tax credit and the all veterans tax credit to include those veterans still serving consist consistent with the statutory definition of veteran. Additionally, the current language in these sections only counts Title X training for active duty. Title X is a fe federally funded and federally controlled status. However, since National Guardsmen perform a majority of their duties in Title 32 status, which is a state controlled but federally funded status, this bill removes Title 10 from both sections so that both Title 10 and Title 32 service qualifies for the 90 day requirement. Lastly, under the all veterans tax credit, State active duty is also included as qualifying service in this bill towards the 90 days since the status is commonly used when guardsmen respond to natural disasters, emergencies, and other contingencies, which is one of the missions and functions of the National Guard. In conclusion, this bill clarifies that Title 32 and state active duty by National Guardsmen counts towards the 90-day requirement to qualify for the veterans tax credits. And this bill also addresses the inconsistencies between the term veteran as defined in RSA 21 colon 50, which includes currently serving members as veterans in RSA 72, the veterans tax credit sections, which currently specifies that members have to be separated in order to be eligible for the tax credits. Mr. Chair, that concludes my bill introduction. I'm happy to answer any questions if you allow. Any questions for the representative? Yes, Representative Free. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you uh, for taking my question. Um, there, there's no fiscal note on this, as has been with all the others, so um, mm -hmm. I'm not going to ask for that, but would you know the amount of impact this will have on each of the municipalities? I, I'm not disagreeing that we should have mm -hmm. clarifying language. Um, consistent, consistently, but um, my, my curiosity is, especially once we put in state active um, duty and so on, this could have a, a very large impact on, on the shift. It's not going to cost municipalities, but the shift of a burden of tax. Do you have any idea as to what percentage this could be? Because I assume all our National Guards may not be homeowners, but they, they could, um, they could be. <laughs> Thank you for the question, Representative. I do not have any data or statistics to, to answer your question. However, we do know that less than 1% of the people in our country serve in the armed forces. Therefore, I would say that in total, it would be you know less than 1% in general. Is there a follow-up? Yes, just a quick one. Um, is it, isn't it true that I think New Hampshire um, per, pen, per population has a much higher percentage of veterans. We're, we're a very vet, veteran-friendly um, state, which is, which is a good thing. Um, I'm not, did, the question was, I'm do, do I know or do I agree or no. what I believe? <laughs> no, no either <laughs> one. So I just wanted to know if, um, I guess, yes. Are, are you aware? Are you aware? <coughs> that was my question. I'm not. We uh, are. I'm not specifically aware, but what I would say is, um, you know, it depends on the the town. Um, so therefore, th I mean, that would be that would take a lot of um, research to do. And I would also add that this um, these veterans tax credits are enabling. So the municipality would have to, um, you know, adopt it locally. And additionally. It's not automatic. The service member must apply, and they must, um, you know, have the proper application and all the proper documentation. So it's not an automatic given. There's many steps that that you know 
one would need to, to go through. It's just not, not automatic to say, well, we have X percent of um, uniform service members, therefore it's going to have this impact. We do not know until um, they apply. Just a quick follow-up, uh, sir. One more? Yes. Um, it, j it'll just be quick. Um, mm -hmm. You said that it's enabling, which, which I agree with, but if it's already in, in existence, we would be adding more to the existing group. Is that correct? That is, that is cor correct. The, this bill amends legislation that's already on the books. Representative Keller. Thank you for taking my question. Um, when a person is, is in the service, when they re-enlist or they change status, in many cases they get what's called a DD-214, which in a lot of cases in municipalities, all you have to do is present a DD-214 and you're considered a veteran. Even though I, it, it, my, my, my theory is that the impact of this law is going to be minimized because a lot of towns are not processing it correctly by the law. They're, they're giving people that are in the guard or the reserves the benefit of the doubt and considering them veterans, even though they aren't by law. Would you agree with that? Could you repeat the question? <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Um, I, I, just, I just think that the impact of this change, I agree with the change. I don't have a problem with that. But the, the impact is going to be lessened because a lot of towns aren't following the law now. They're being more liberal than the law allows. Okay, well, thank you for the question, Representative. Uh, towns should be following the law, so that's disappointing that they're being... Um, I guess loosey goosey with it. That's that's improper, and um, I would also ask that you perhaps defer and, and ask the question of um, someone who's going to provide testimony, who is a retired Air Force officer and also a squadron com had been a squadron commander and is more versed in um, the the details and the ins and outs of those forms that you refer to. I know that there are, are a number of forms, it's just not one, so that, that individual can speak better to um, the question that you're posing. Okay. I was not in the military. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Um, again, can't look at everything in a silo. 1375 that we have, which changes honorably discharged to discharged with honor. Always have to assume, you can never assume that, 13, that something is going to happen. Let's say 1375 does not pass. We understood with 1375 that discharged with honor and honorably discharged are different things. I didn't know that. I wasn't in the military. Does your bill need to be amended to say discharged with honor or separated with honor in order to capture all of those people who might benefit from it. Does it make any sense? Because we learned with 1375 there are people who are not benefiting right now. Could you, thank you for the question, Representative. So you're, you're asking with regard to an amendment to this bill, wh which line would you be, would you be so, referencing? Mr. Chair? Yes. Thank you. So, again, I'm, I'm referring back, and I apologize that maybe I, sh I should have prefaced it. 1375 was introduced to us a while back to say honorably discharged and discharged with honor are two very different things. And therefore, I wonder here where in parent A you say, or uh, what, what the, the statute says, was honorably discharged, and where it's honorably separated, it goes on to say that I think a few times. Does that phrase also need to be changed so that we capture the full group of people that could benefit from this bill? So I might refer you, thank you for the question, Representative. Yep. 
So I might refer you to um, section 21 colon 50 that does define veteran. And it also goes on to um, define an honorable discharge or the uncharacterized discharge based on a service-connected injury, illness, or disability that may be encompassing that uh, group of people that you're referencing to put an amendment to. Yes. Thank you. And, and that's actually the question, because 1375 looks to amend 2150. Am I missing that? Thir so House Bill 1375 looks to amend 2150 to change honorably discharge to discharge with honor. I, by the way, I, I, I think this is a good idea. I just want to make sure that we, we're, we're capturing all the right things. And it may just be an administrative thing. We may just have to, you know, do that. I just want to make sure that we're not missing something. Thank you, Representative, for the question. Um, my focus... I, I appreciate the, the question, and my focus is on this bill that I'm prime sponsoring. And, you know, I, to be honest, I have not reflected on the previous bill and to, to for the purposes of this hearing, to, um, to consider how that bill, if it were to be passed, how this bill here in front of us might need to be amended. So I can't, unfortunately can't answer that sitting here right now. I would need to take some time to carefully analyze that and reflect and consider um, how that might be addressed. Thank you. Seeing no further questions, thank you, Representative Powell. Representative Wheeler. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Representative Ken Weiler. Um, the veterans tax credit originated in the Civil War. That is why the standard deduction is only $50. In the late 1860s, that was a substantial amount of money. Substantial changes have been made to this deduction, especially the definition of veteran. This bill tries to clear up some of the confusion between sections and be more inclusive. Previous laws would only give deductions to those who actually were in the service in war times. All who volunteer for service are at risk of being deployed at any time and anywhere. Reservists and National Guards are at, people are at the same risk and should be treated similarly. I'm a retired colonel with 30 years combined service and active in Reserves, yes. Officers are, you note from the language, treated a little differently. When we leave a service, we are considered subject to recall rather than being discharged. And please pass this bill to clear up some inconsistencies. I think it's a good change, and I think it's well needed. Uh, as far as the discharges, in my reading of that section, I think everything's covered, but as you point out, Discharge with honor and, dis and honorable discharge are not quite the same thing. And I have a, a few friends that I've in several different veterans organizations, and some would be like, they're in basic training, Vietnam comes to an end, you're discharged for honorable reasons or administrative reasons. I've even seen those. So there's, there w I couldn't believe the number of different reasons for discharges that I would hear from people, but for when they uh, mailed in to try to get a veteran's plate, Sometimes that would be a confusion. And we, through the years, we've tried to straighten this out by rewriting it. But if, if you think it needs to be for honorable reasons or something like that, then this would be a good time to put it in. But uh, I thought we had everything covered when I first read this bill. But anything, that's, that's why we come to a committee, so our collective ideas can, can come together and make sure we have, have it as good as we hoped it would be. And I, I appreciate what Representative Power has done because this has been confused through the year. It's like I, rem I was here when we first tried to include uh, people from Afghanistan and, and Iraq wars. They weren't in here. There would be a bunch of people that had been veterans and they'd go to get a, they'd be discharged from service and they'd go to get thing. You're not included. You know, it's, it's you got to wait till your war has been over for a few years, but then we stick it in the bill if somebody gets around to it. But that's why you see so many different. Uh, wars that are listed 
than some of the what, what qualifies as a veteran. So this, okay, you walk up, you're on active duty. You show a, an active duty uh, ID card. That should be sufficient. So, um, you know, hopefully we'll get this thing all straightened out because there are some confusions in the town. as was, And one of the things listed in this 2150 was a National Guard uh, ID. Head down here, NGB Form 22 from the National Guard under uh, 2150. So I guess there is, a, there is an intent to uh, include National Guardsmen when, when they're the treatment for veterans. So, Representative Tripp, your question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, earlier, uh, uh, Representative Power was asked if, uh, why there isn't a fiscal note attached to this. Uh, since you're a finance guy, I, I imagine that you would know uh, whether it required a fiscal note or not. Since it's a, a town-only expense, well, actually, it's not a town-only expense, it's just a town-only uh, shift in expense, uh, would it need a fiscal note? We, we have several different uh, notes on it. FN is a fiscal note, which normally means it increases the state budget. Then there's an A, which means that it requires an appropriation. Then there's an L, which... If, if you increase the budget locally. This does not increase a budget. It shifts some money, but it doesn't have the same criteria as FN or L, FN, L, or A. Well, thank you. That was my epiphany for the day. Thank you. Oh, very good. <laughs> Appreciate it. At least I knew the answer. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Colonel. All right. The next uh, <coughs> input we're going to get from is Eric Powell. We're running out here. Also a colonel, come on up. Thank you, honorable members of the committee. I'm up here now as uh, Air Force Colonel Eric Power, retired. I served in the uh, Air National Guard and the Air Force Reserve for over 30 years. And um, you, I was never sir. active duty. Thank you. Uh, just for those who aren't aware, every year I honor graduates at our Hollis Brookline High School that are joining the military. And so every year I do the statistic of how many M Americans are actually serving in the military, including National Guard and Reserve. And that number has been going down and down and down. And right now we're at about half a percent of Americans are actively serving. So that kind of gives you a little bit of a metric of how much this would impact to include the currently serving members. It's not going to be more than half a percent of New Hampshire residents. So that, just to say, so there's, when you see a young person signing up today, they are doing an honorable thing because it's, there's not many of us serving anymore. Um, the representative here talked about a DD-214. Everybody thinks a DD-214 is what you get when you retire, but you can get it for a lot of reasons. Guardsmen and reservists can get it after they do a deployment. So some towns may mistakenly be using that, and they shouldn't be, um, because the law is clear right now without this bill that you have to be separated in order to get the um, veterans tax credits, which I think is wrong. I'm here to support the bill. As I mentioned, I was, in the Air, I was in the Air National Guard for my first 28 years in the Air Force. And almost, I think all of my time was done in Title 32 status. So when I went to get the veterans tax credit, none of that time counted because it's Title 32 and the law says Title 10. I only got it because of my last two years in the Air Force Reserve which is a Title X status. And I'd be glad to answer any questions about titles if people have questions about that. Um, the other thing about people think that veterans are retired people that are on fixed incomes and have, don't have a lot of financial means. And certainly there are veterans in that category. But an active duty member who's serving, if you've ever looked at military pay compared to civilian pay, is a lot lower than what you get in the civilian sector. Military pay is less. So, to exclude currently serving veterans is probably the wrong thing because they're going to make a more money when they get out of the military. They're making a sacrifice when they're serving in more than one way, including financially. So today, the 
you know, we have the so-called all veterans tax credit. I would rather, it should be, it's really more the some veterans tax credit because we're leaving out a lot of veterans, especially when you look at the conflict between how we define it in 2150 and how we do it in RSA section 72. Um, the NGB form 22 should be counted and it does count. It recognizes it, but when you do guards duty, unless you're doing overseas war duty, all that duty is, t is Title 32, which I think is a good uh, piece. Another, another bit that I would bring forward is that in my last job in the Air Force Reserve, I served with all services, including the Coast Guard. And uh, the Coast Guard actually serves in another title, Title 14. So you're actually taking care of our Coast Guardsmen by deleting Title 10. So you're letting Title 32, Title 14, and Title 10 all count to qualify as it should. So I think that's an important fix in the law. And, you know, as you mentioned, officers that get out, I can still be recalled. I'm in the retired reserve. So I had to wait until I was done my 30 years until I could actually apply for the veterans tax credit and finally get it just a couple of years ago, finally. So I think we need to do the right thing and take care of our servicemen and women who are currently serving, have been in more than four years and, and passed this bill to take care of all veterans in New Hampshire. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, you, you mentioned something that kind of uh, <coughs> reminded me of something. When I was in the service, I had troops that were on food stamps. That's how, that's how poorly we were paying them. And it was a real, real crime to see that going on. So thank you for your testimony. Okay. Uh, Jim Michaud. We, we don't have Jim Michaud here. All right, so that's going to conclude our... Chairman, we met in 1978. Yeah. <laughs> Funny guy. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, I want to uh, close the hearing. And uh, I want to congratulate my uh, committee members. You have now finished work on all your bills. That's done. So uh, we're going to be going into uh, executive session next week, and we're going to we're going to work it hard. We're going to be looking at uh, up to a dozen, fifteen bills a day. But this should go pretty fast. Okay. Anybody else have any questions before we adjourn? Okay. We are adjourned. Thank you.